Thank you all uh, for coming and uh, welcome um, to the additional public hearing uh, for the inquiry into budget estimates 2021-2022. Uh, 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 before I commence, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, Gadigal people who are the traditional custodians of this land. Um, and I'd also like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging uh, of the Euro nation and extend uh, that respect to other Aboriginals present or who may be joining us uh, on the internet. Um, before proceeding any further, can I just acknowledge the, the most difficult circumstances uh, and in some cases fatal circumstances that have befallen the people of New South Wales presently. The current rain and water event is uh, extraordinary uh, in its size and its full impact uh, is yet to be fully played out. Uh, we offer our thoughts and prayers uh, for those who have lost their life and offer our condolences uh, to their family and friends who now mourn the loss of their loved ones. Uh, we thank uh, all the brave emergency services workers, uh, police, ADF, and countless numbers of community groups and volunteers who have all come together to help people across the state get through this natural disaster. Can I acknowledge and thank uh, both the Health Minister, uh, Brad Hazard, uh, and uh, our Regional Health Minister, Bonnie Taylor, along uh, with everybody from New South Wales Health uh, who are doing all they can to provide care and support uh, at this time of great need. I strongly encourage everybody uh, to closely follow all the emergency advice uh, that's being provided regarding the rain and flooding events. Uh, and do not take any risks. The consequences could be fatal to you and your family. Uh, property and lost possessions can be attended to after. The rain and flooding, uh, a lost life uh, can never be replaced. Thank you. Um, I welcome uh, Minister uh, Bronnie Taylor uh, and all the accompanying officials uh, to this hearing today. Uh, uh, today the committee is examining the uh, proposed expenditure for the portfolio as of uh, women, uh, our original health and mental health. Before we commence, I'd like to make some uh, brief comments about today's uh, proceedings. Today's proceedings are being broadcast live from the Parliament's website and transcript will be placed uh, on the committee's website once it becomes available. In accordance with the broadcasting guidelines, media representatives uh, are reminded that they must take responsibility for what they publish about the committee's proceedings and all witnesses in budget estimates have a right to procedural fairness, of course, according to the procedural fairness resolution of the House adopted in 2018. Uh, there may be some questions uh, that a witness can only answer if they had more time or with certain documents to hand. In these circumstances, witnesses are advised that they can take a question on notice and provide an answer within 21 days. If witnesses wish to hand up documents, they should do so through the committee uh, staff. And Mr. remind you and the officers accompany you that you are free, of course, to pass notes and refer directly to your advisors seated at the table behind you. And finally, uh, could everyone please turn their mobile phones uh, to silent for the duration of the hearing? Um, all witnesses will be sworn prior to giving evidence. Uh, uh, Minister, I, I remind you, you do not need to be sworn as you've already sworn an oath to your office <coughs> as a member of parliament. I'd also like to remind the following witnesses uh, that you do not need to be sworn as you have uh, been sworn at an earlier budget estimates hearing uh, before the committee. So uh, just going through this list, um, so there's uh, Ms Coff, uh, Dr Wright, uh, Dr Lyons, uh, Mr Minns, um, Ms Smythe and uh, Ms Lowry. So uh, all of you are not required to uh, uh, swear or affirm again. But for our other witnesses, um, I ask uh, that each of you in turn state your uh, full name, position, uh, title and agency, uh, if you're associated with the agency specifically. Swear either an oath or an affirmation, uh, whichever you prefer, the words of which uh, should be before you. If not, for some reason, uh, just put your hand up and we'll provide them to you. So commencing from my left, working across, uh, who have we got? We've just got two we need sworn. So there's uh, Miss uh, Van der um, Zandt, if I pronounced that correctly. Could you please ask where either or no for an affirmation, please? Thank you. Hello, Pia Van der Zandt, Acting Executive Director of Strategies and Programs in the Department of Communities and Justice. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm 
that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. And we now move to uh, Ms Lewis, who is joining us via WebEx. Uh, Ms Lewis, can you, can you hear us? I can, thank you. Would you please proceed? Hi, my name is Maureen Lewis, I'm Acting Executive Director for the Mental Health Branch, Ministry of Health. Um, I swear that the evidence now that given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you very much. Now, before we uh, commence the questioning, um, in terms of the, uh, the program today, so thank you for all the witnesses and the other support staff who join us, it's much appreciated. Uh, we go through uh, with, with breaks over the course of the day. I think people probably are aware of, of what the breaks are. I won't go through that again. Um, with respect to uh, uh, the Minister uh, and uh, Ms Coff, you'll be with us through till the lunch adjournment and then be, be relieved. So um, understand the circumstances and appreciate the fact that you've got some important work to be done uh, with the Minister arising from uh, the matter I commented in my opening statement. Um, and with respect to the other witnesses, uh, you've got the great pleasure uh, of being with us over the course of the day till 5.30. So uh, we look forward to uh, the opportunity to ask you questions. Uh, so we'll get things underway. We'll uh, proceed on the basis of um, opposition uh, and uh, crossbench in 15 minute tranches. Um, the government has reserved, got a reserved position of 15 minutes at the end of the day if, if they wish to do so to, oh, to, to pick up uh, yeah. matters that, that they think may, may, may be required for clarification or, or, or to revisit for a particular reason. But we'll, we'll simply move between the two groups. With respect to the, uh, the opposition, there'll be an oral second order myself, uh, with a crossbench, uh, we've got the Deputy Chair uh, and Ms Kate Fairman, uh, and there'll be others uh, joining us over the course of the day. So there will be uh, members joining us at the table, some of whom uh, names are, are uh, on the table, some of whom will be placed on the table at the time they arrive. So uh, uh, with uh, that, can I just commence by providing the Minister with an opportunity um, to provide uh, just a, a, for us a, a, an update on, on matters uh, flooding and the water emergency? Uh, and its impact on, obviously, uh, New South Wales Health, and particularly with respect to the rural part of New South Wales Health that you now have responsibility for, just to give us a, a snapshot of where things are and, and, and any insights you may be able to provide in regards to the, the immediate future next day or two. Well, thank you very much, Mr Chair. And obviously, you know, the, what we're seeing across New South Wales is just devastating. Uh, as you would be aware, we had to evacuate Ballina Hospital um, yesterday, or the, <laughs> it's all gelling into one at the moment. Um, and that was a Herculean effort on behalf of all of the staff and doing that and moving patients into a facility at, a, at Xavier Catholic College in, in Ballina. Um, we're just trying at the moment, obviously, we're very, very focused on saving lives and preserving lives and, and the way that that's going. In terms of healthcare, we're ensuring as best as we can that healthcare is available to those that need it, where they need it and when they need it. But as you would appreciate, Mr Chair, it's an evolving situation. Uh, it's a difficult situation. These are communities that have been affected by floods quite recently. They're communities that have been affected by the trauma of fire in terms of a mental health response as well. That's something that we are, um, are gathering and are ready to execute when needed. We've reached out to, Dr Wright has reached out to all of the mental health directors in the flood affected areas to offer our help and assistance. I, I'm envisaging that will be similar to what we did in the fires where we asked our colleagues and friends in Sydney to be able to provide, um, you know, assistance to that. But it's an evolving situation. If you'd like the secretary to comment or if you prefer to do uh, that in your questioning. Just provide opportunity for, for you. Yeah. 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 So we'll move now then to formal questions. So then we'll second. Mr. Chair, on that note, um, thank you, Minister, and thank you for your time. Uh, and thank you for the health officials. We do understand it's a busy time. Can I get an indication of what is actually happening in Ballina and uh, what is happening at Ballina and Lismore hospitals at the moment involving emergency situations and if a young mum goes into labour and is giving birth. So what happens to families at Ballina and Lismore in those situations, as well as emergency cases involving, I guess, heart attack, stroke, 
or any major inju injuries that would occur. So what's happening in those areas in the flood affected hospitals? Sure, I'll, I'll start Mr. Sequoia and then I'll pass on to uh, probably Dr. Knott Lyons or other secretary to discuss those operational issues that you mentioned. But to answer the first part of your question, um, I was notified immediately when the decision had been made to evacuate Ballina Hospital. That decision was made on advice that we had at the time and of course followed that advice. The majority of the patients that were inpatients at the time at Ballina were medical patients and rehab patients. They were moved to what was felt the safest place was to Xavier Catholic College in Ballina. They were supported by extra medical staff, by staff on the ground. Obviously, it's a difficult situation when you're not in a hospital setting and you're caring for patients that require hospital care. But those decisions had to be made with, as you would appreciate, with the most paramount of safety at, at hand. And we are continuing to run services out of Xavier Catholic the college in Ballina. If there was a patient who needed to receive a higher acuity of care, which you would be very well aware of with your previous roles in, in the opposition, they will be transferred out. But if I may ask uh, either Dr Lyons or the Secretary to elaborate on that in terms of key operational issues that were indicated in your question. Thanks, Minister. Uh, just to add to the comments the Minister made, uh, the operations are maintained uh, through the crisis response that each of the local health districts has in place. So they have well uh, arranged processes when there is a crisis like this of the uh, things that swing into place and how they manage. They have set up, uh, I was talking to the acting chief executive uh, of Northern New South Wales yesterday evening, uh, they have set up a temporary emergency department uh, in the school uh, when they've re relocated uh, some of the uh, patients from the Ballina Hospital too, those that were appropriate to be cared for in that environment. And they are assessing patients on arrival there with the clinical staff uh, and then making decisions about if they need definitive care, how that can be arranged. And they are transferring people to Lismore and to other hospitals as required. So uh, those are in, are, are in place. Lismore has been you know, severely affected, as you know, and the hospital has maintained all critical operations. There are a few days there where electricity supply was an issue and the generators were on, but they've managed to I get that uh, back up and going. They've got uh, impact on their electronic medical record system. It was impacted for a while with uh, the uh, uh, issues around telecommunications, but uh, basic functions are back up and operating. So uh, everything is thrown at ensuring that we can maintain services, maintain that support, those particularly the critical care to those communities that need it. Are there, uh, more with your, your indulgence, are there any other medical facilities that are affected on the North Coast? I know there are a number of smaller district hospitals and MPSs and that too. Are, they, um, are there others other than Lismore and Ballina affected? Uh, uh, my understanding is there are many of the, the uh, smaller facilities in that district have been impacted as well, but I haven't got all of the details of every, everyone and how, how they've been affected at this point in time. Do you, do you think there'll be a significant cost to the public health system to repair and restore the various hospitals affected by the floods and has any work been undertaken in the area? I do know that it's only a day. Uh, I think it's too early, Mr. Sukor, Mr. Sukor, to actually say what uh, that's likely to be and we haven't been able to assess impact and until the flood waters are received, that those uh, assessments really can't be made, so it's really too early to say. Um, Minister, with your, your indulgence, could I also ask Dr. Murray, Dr. Murray Wright to update the members on what's happening involving support for mental health in on the North Coast particularly? Certainly, Mr. Sukord. Dr. Wright? Thank, thank you. Um, so there's a, um, we've had a number of conversations between um, the ministry, the local district um, and the other directors of mental health. And so, um, as the minister said, it's a similar arrangement to what we um, did after, um, during the bushfires. Um, so initially it was about um, me having a conversation with the director of mental health and um, trying to understand what the what the particular challenges were. And, um, and, and really there, there are two absolute priorities. And the number one priority is about maintaining the core acute services, both in the hospitals and in the community. We have, a, um, as you know, in mental health, we try and manage people in the least restrictive environment. And that means we've got a lot of people who have relatively high needs managed in the community. Um, and the difficulty with that is not just the impact on the, on the hospital facilities themselves, but the staff. 
Um, the staff have been dramatically affected um, throughout northern New South Wales. Many of the staff working in those areas um, live on acreages um, outside of uh, outside of the um, um, the main town, and many of them, um, although they've not been um, inundated, um, are cut off from being able to access work. So the staff that remain have been, um, in many cases, working double shifts, and in some cases, um, sleeping over um, because in, in order to keep um, um, maintain the services. Um, as of yesterday, the Director of Mental Health had um, changed their, the, a, um, one of their, I, I think it's a, um, a, 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 an addiction um, service with a, with a small number of beds into staff accommodation so that those staff could remain. This is really important in the immediate term, but it's not a long-term arrangement. And so what we then have done is tried to um, reach out to the other districts <laughs> and see if there's um, suitably trained and available staff who can be redeployed um, and um, as of yesterday we had a meeting with all of the directors of mental health and clinical directors across the state. Um, we've identified um, two districts that may be able to send staff once um, once the um, transport logistics have been managed and that's principally once Ballina Airport is open um, and um, and those, those arrangements are um, being um, discussed and worked through today. Um, we will then look at um, being able to then um, see whether there's a need to supplement those staff. It's still, as Dr Lyons said, it's still early days in trying to understand what the size of the problem is. Um, backfilling the, the existing staff and supporting them, um, and particularly those who can't get to the facilities, is really crucial. Mm. Um, and then down the track, there's the second phase, which is about um, supporting the recovery process. On, on that point, um, Dr Ray, the recovery process and the wider community, people that are not in acute care at the moment. So I understand that there'd be vase, various phases of reaction. So the very first reaction would be, thank God I'm alive. Mm -hmm. So wh what would be the next step? And what are the, and I guess as a, a mental health official, how would you, what, what are the next phases that people on the North Coast will be going through? It's an important issue, Mr. Sikord. Um I, I think that the first phase is 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 actually something. Yes, thank God I'm alive, and and doing everything I can to protect myself and my possessions and my family and my community. Um, and that's that's um, that, that's a basically a crisis mode, and it's dominated by a, a really strong adrenaline response. And, and at that point, you are in survival mode. Most, not many people are reflecting on how they feel about it. They're just reflecting on um, getting through and, 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 and um, staying safe. The priorities, and we've, we've learned this over many, many decades of studying um, the responses to um, disasters, the priorities are food, shelter, warmth, um, being close to family and community um, and reliable and regular information. Um, those are the priorities and we know that um, those priorities, if they're addressed sufficiently, and that's what's happening in our evacuation centres, if those are, are being addressed sufficiently, that will minimise um, the, um, the mental health impact which people will gradually come to grips with once the crisis passes um, and then and that's um, the, the the recovery phase which is you know, some point after that um, it, and it's really when people uh, fully appreciate what the what the losses and what the damage is um, and then um, then it's about how do you support not just the individuals but the communities in recovery okay. minister you, you may want to direct this to the appropriate official um, I know down the track we'll be looking at public health responses. So there'll be large pools of stagnant water, which will attract attract and create the multiplication of mosquitoes. So I guess what will be the public health response from New South Wales Health in the regard to, I guess, mosquito-borne diseases, as well as water contamination, sewage overflow. So there'll be gastro, there'll be Ross River fever, things like that. So uh, what stages and what steps has New South Wales Health taken in regard to that, because that'll be the next stage. 
Yeah, and, and I thank you very much for your question, Mr. Saccord, and I will I will pass that on because again, those will be um, plans that we have in place that are long term plans where we have seen these um, situations before, and, and you're exactly right about you know the the issues that come afterwards. And as Dr. Wright said as well, it is it is about dealing with what is immediate now, but also being prepared for what is to come, and those large pools of water and cleaning up and and all of those issues that will be ahead of us. Yeah. Um, in terms of our public health response that will be um dr lines do you or, or Ms. Um, Elizabeth? Yep. Look, uh, as much as i hate to say the the benefit of precedent and having had floods before um really makes the the public health and environmental health units well well oiled machines in responding to these initiatives as you identified the major issues of um waterborne vectors with mosquitoes um, sewerage fresh water supply our environmental health unit um, is very well trained and as soon as, as physically possible we'll be giving advice um, you know as basic as boiling water when we get back to, to the situation but uh, they're, they're well versed in how to respond to these things and we'll be on the ground uh, in yeah, yeah, I guess I was asking like, are, are we in fact flying up pallets and pallets of bottled water and things like that um, we, have, we haven't to date, but we have historically, um, when we've had water supply shortages via Health Share, distributed uh, water supplies to the local community um, because it's far preferable they have a safe, reliable source of water for consumption rather than to risk um, yeah. contaminated water supplies. And, and how do you respond to mosquito-borne diseases? How, how do you... Is how do you combat that from, uh, a, public, from a public health Look, it, it's an increasing problem even, even across the whole of the country and um, even now with, we've had more recently, and I'm not a public health expert, but we've had uh, Japanese encephalitis, um, which has been spreading in rural and regional areas, um, which is a mosquito-borne disease, and, and Ross River fever, as you indicated, is something else that's um, um, quite uh, prevalent up in that region. Um, and the advice will be specifically tailored to those communities um, on the best evidence of our public health and environmental physicians. And, and also, Mr. Sukord, if, if I may just add to yep. that, that, that's why we have, you know, set up SEOC as well, that that will be a whole of government response in terms of all of the things that you've mentioned that are right across, uh, you know, a multitude of departments, and that's why we set up that in any disaster response. Now, um, Ms. Ms. Koff, you actually mentioned Japanese um, encephalitis, and I understand that on Saturday, which is February the 26th, um, New South Wales took New South Wales Health took the extraordinary step of issuing a public health warning, and we thought that Australia was actually Japanese encephalitis free. Mm -hmm. um, so, what steps? Okay, wh where has the appearance of the of this disease occurred? I understand southern New South Wales, and what steps? And is New South Wales Health taking this seriously? Because we actually thought that Australia was Japanese encephalitis free. Um, of course, we're taking it seriously. Um um, the concerns and as a, the update I received. Um, yeah, can you update us, please? Because this from, is a very from serious public one. health on Monday morning. It started in the piggeries, oh. um, so it was uh, identified first, and I think agriculture had some line of sight uh, because it was um, identified in in stillbirths in piggeries and um, mummified births, um, and that's when I think started the exploratory um, investigations because. It, it is, it had been unrecognised uh, yeah. to date. Um, the public health update that I received, um, the, it's most concerning actually in the under five age group um, if it's transmitted through chains of transmission, as we understand. Um, we have uh, secured plentiful supplies of the vaccine, mm -hmm. um, which uh, does make a significant difference, and there will be an active campaign for vaccination down there. So I understand that it was um, southern and western New South Wales near the Victorian border. Um, yes. So, well, so this is quite, it's quite extraordinary. So the concern is that, that it's a mosquito-borne disease and it's appeared in pigs in southern New South Wales. But the concern is that you want to prevent it getting into the human population. Yes, correct. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Minister, I'd like to take you to, um, to your, your role as regional health minister. That's what you do. In that, in that position, do you... Okay, I, I guess 
there's been, it was announced in, in December, mm -hmm. and um, what is your role in relation to responsibilities? Actual responsibilities. Well, I've, I've downloaded the New South Wales Ministry of Health responsibility chart, and it hasn't been updated since Minister Skinner. So I think that it's a bit. Old. So can you please? What are what are your actual practical responsibilities? So, Mr. Scott, I thank you very much for your question. And um, I, I am the Minister for Regional Health, the first ever Minister for Regional Health in New South Wales. And my responsibility will lie across the across regional health, so across all of the regional and rural health districts. Obviously, New South Wales Health and the New South sorry the New South Wales Government sits in the process of government in clusters, and in that cluster. You have a cluster lead minister, which is Mr. Hazard, which is Minister Hazard, and then now there is another minister in that. So if you look at other clusters, say in the Department of Community Justice, there are multiple ministers. In the cluster of health, there was previously one minister, there are two. So I work very closely with Minister Hazard. He is the senior minister in the health cluster, and my remit is to focus on rural and regional health. Okay. I'll, I'll come back to this. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Chair. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, in regards to oh, morning, Minister, sorry. Um, in regards to uh, Ballina Hospital um, that was evacuated, I wonder if they <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, in regards to uh, the evacuation at Ballina Hospital, um, were any of the patients um, evacuated suffering with COVID, if you're aware? That, that's an operational issue in terms of I haven't been notified, Nigel, no, Dr Lyons. I don't have any um, I don't have any information on that either. We'd have to uh, take that on notice because we haven't got that detail in front of us. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just sort of also wondering, I suppose, um, how the regional health system is coping, um, obviously, with people who are evacuating, who have COVID-19 who are in isolation um, and how much stress that that's actually putting on the regional health system and if anything's being put into place or measures are being put into place um, for the stresses that that could potentially cause onto the health system with injuries from water, with diseases coming from water and with potential further spreading of COVID because of evacuations. Um, what sort of measures um, are we looking at in, in this urgent stage? Sure. So two parts to your question. Um, in terms of people that are COVID positive and your question asking about, you know, what about them, how are they supported and where will they go? There was a public health announcement as well um, on the radio that, uh, that actually said, you know, if you have COVID, your isolation requirements are not valid in terms of please don't stay at home if your house is flooding, we need you to get out. And the advice was if you could go and seek shelter with family or friends who were fully immunised, that would be the ideal situation. But whatever you need, you need to keep your safe. In terms of going forward with COVID, there will be plans as part of all of our recovery plans and, and what to do with that. But look, we have seen an incredible response and in our data in terms of COVID and in terms of where we are sitting and because of our high vaccination rates, which you would all know, so I don't, but I think that, you know, we're definitely entering a new and different phase in that. The risk, of course, is to anyone that is a part of those vulnerable populations that would be more at risk to COVID, but then also subsequently more at risk of, of things that will follow after the floods in terms of a direct reference to that. So all of these systems that we have in place, all of these plans, all of these emergency plans, and COVID will absolutely be factored into all of those. Um, uh, uh, did you, did you, I can add some more. Yeah, so, so in terms of uh, the COVID response, <laughs> the, the fortunate position we're in in New South Wales now is that the predominant strain is Omicron, uh, which of course has been a much, while, it, while it's spread much more readily, has actually been less severe clinically. So the vast bulk of people who've been COVID positive have been able to be cared for in the community setting uh, with uh, primary care and with support from our specialist teams in the, in the local health districts. The conversion into uh, hospital admission has been very low and then a, a conversion to somebody who needs intensive care even lower. So our hospitals at the moment are, are coping very well uh, with, uh, and the, and the re numbers are reducing in both ICU and the wards. Uh, so the vast bulk of people have been able to be cared for in the community. In addition uh, to the measures that have been talked about by the Minister, we're actually at the stage now where we're, we're really working hard on plans with our colleagues who deliver care in the community, predominantly our general practitioner colleagues, about how we continue to support care, but we've now got the oral antivirals so there is a treatment that's now starting to roll out 
that is available for people who are at high risk of deterioration uh, if they're unvaccinated or if they've got cl clinical conditions which make them more at risk. So we're ensuring that we're making the, those treatments available and they will expand over the coming weeks as and weeks and months as well as more oral antivirals become available more readily. Thank you. Um, Minister, are we sending additional healthcare workers um, to Northern New South Wales generally to, to assist with this emergency? Look, if there are health workers that are required, then they will be deployed. Um, you know, look, one thing, if I may, and, and I'm sorry if I, I bring this back to mental health, but one thing that we saw so successfully, and, and I saw it firsthand in southern New South Wales with the bushfire response, was the fact that we were able to mobilise our teams from the city, from the Sid Sydney LHDs. And not only was that incredible for the help and support that it did, because our health staff are part of our communities, so they're really affected by this as well. They know so many of the people, they know so many of the issues, that they need the support as well. What we saw work so effectively after the fires was I remember going down to Bega Hospital and I remember that we had deployed um, a specialist mental health team from one of the Sydney LHDs and they were actually running the ward, the, the mental health ward at Bega, the acute unit, so that the, the staff could go out and do what they needed to do and it also provided incredible education opportunities. It also provided this amazing camaraderie that still exists to this day, which I like to see as an ex-clinician because I think it's really important. So what we have done, to answer your question specifically, is that we have reached out to those Sydney LHDs and said when and if we need to deploy and I don't think it's an if I think it's a when to help and just the fatigue um, the latest message that I had from um, one of our acting deputy secretaries that's been managing um, up in, in northern New South Wales is that staff are getting fatigued and they, they are tired and they will absolutely step up and do what's required but they will need to be relieved and we will look at, at, at changing that deployment and I think one of the incredible things that happened in the fires and I presume that it will happen again is how many people put up their hand to go and help their colleagues and I think it really you know there's been a lot of challenges and a lot of difficulties over the last two years but one of the shining lights I think is people and community and in terms of New South Wales health is the way that everybody across this entire enormous system steps up to help each other and that's exactly what I presume I'll see again here. Thank you. Um, studies have shown, and, and this is sort of go, carrying on from, from comments that were made earlier by Dr Wright, um, that flooding disasters, um, people who experience flooding disasters are nine times more likely to experience long-term mental health concerns such as depression and PTSD. Um, and, and so we're really looking at those long-term mental health impacts for the community. Um, I'm just wondering, Minister, um, how the government um, plans to address this um, and, and what is being put in place to deal with that very long-term mental health concern, you know, when, and, and it's similar to the fires, um, you know, a lot of the community not forgot about the fires, but suddenly we were hit with COVID mm -hmm. and um, people's attention is turned. How do we deal with those long-term effects mm -hmm. um, when, when it's no longer being reported in the media? Yeah. I think, you know, what what we did as a policy outcome over the last two years is that we changed our recovery clinicians to, you know, they were either drought clinicians or they were bushfire or they were flood recovery officers. We've turned them into resilience recovery um, clinicians on the ground so that exactly what you said, so that things aren't forgotten, but more so that these people who are embedded in these communities know the strengths, know the weaknesses, know how to, how to target things. Because what we know as well in terms of mental health issues is that, you know, often those people, and we see this in, in suicide data, we know that often those people aren't going to reach out for help. But if you're part of the local netball team in Cabago, and you are playing netball regularly, and you're teammates know you really well they're going to know when you're just not quite right they may not be able to explain it or be able to talk about that clinical presentation but they're going to say you know I just don't think that Jane's right today and I need to get that help to her so that's why by embedding these recovery clinicians into our areas this was our intent and what we did as well was we we confirmed that funding for them so it wasn't just this one two-year funding after a disaster it's long-term recovery funding 
I think one thing that COVID has given us and has supported us, and particularly in the mental health space, is this ability where we were able to implement and we were able to try new models of care and trial new and different things. And some of those have been extremely successful. Um, and so I think that we will have to continue with that and continue looking at those models of care and making sure that we're on alert and making sure that we have all of those systems in place that people have somewhere to go. And not just one thing, that's what's so important in mental health. It's not just, it's not one size fits all. We have to have a myriad of, of services, of models of care, of different ways for people to contact and what they feel comfortable in. Hey, Femi. Thank you, Chair. Oh, Morning, I'm Minister. Mm. Happy birthday. Thank you very much. <laughs> if you could remember that for the next four and a half hours, that'd be really generous. <laughs> I'll get those cakes in. Yeah. Yeah. Feed me. Oh, please. Minister, <laughs> I uh, just wanted to, to turn to the regional health portfolio. Mm. Um, as a portfolio, as you mm. said, it's the first time mm. um, that it's been split from health. Whose idea was it to split it? So in terms of when you say splitting the portfolio, it, it's, it's an addition to the health portfolio. So we haven't split anything within the ministry and, and we can elaborate on that further and we've had lots of discussions about that. But I think, you know, to be very honest with you, Ms Femin, I think you probably know the answer. I think that with the Rural and Regional Health Inquiry and the issues that that brought to the fore um, and definitely for the New South Wales National Party, there was a real uh, push from us us to say that we need to have a real focus on rural and regional health issues. And although there are some really incredible stories to tell and there's been incredible investment, there's also areas where we need to do better. So really this was about making sure that we had that focus on rural and regional health and that's exactly what we're going to get. Okay. All right. Thank you. So the how it works... <laughs> Do, do you have responsibility for all the regional LHDs, for mm -hmm. example, that they fall within you and their budget process? So just explain a little bit for the committee how, how that works with the differentiation between you and Minister Hazard. Sure. So what we have done, and, and to be completely transparent about this, we haven't finalised how that's going to work because obviously the regional health portfolio was announced, I think, 11 weeks ago, and we've been working through those internal mechanisms. But how we work in government, as I said before, is in clusters. And obviously the responsibility for rural local health districts, and there are nine of them, will come under my, you know, my remit. But Minister Hazard remains the senior cluster minister in the health cluster, and I'm very respectful of that. He's been here a long time. He's very experienced. He's been a warrior for New South Wales Health and we will continue to work together on these issues like we have done in the past in terms of mental health. Okay, so... But in terms of budgets and splitting budgets, what... When you talk to regional health chief executives, one of the things that they said very strongly at the formation of this new portfolio is that they receive a huge benefit from working right across the local health district system. So when you look at things like telestroke and you look at the fact that that's run out of Randwick but we have lots of rural and regional sites, that continuity of the system working together is really important. So I'm very cognizant of that and I'm not going to come in and say, right, we have to split this in and this is one silo and that's another, because we know that's when we don't perform at our best, but it is about capitalising on that. It is about having an extra focus on rural and regional health and that's what I'm very determined to do. So so you've come in as a result in, in some ways of the... Uh, some of the, the crises that have been highlighted during the regional health inquiry, some of the failings, if you like, um, of the regional health system and the fact that a fair bit needs to be, be fixed, you've come in as, as uh, is fix it. Is that right? Well, I hope so, Ms Feminine. I think that'll be for you to judge uh, when, I've had a, when I've had a bit more time in the job. OK, so, so you do see it as your, as your challenge to fix the regional health system. That's what you've been brought in to do. Uh -huh. I, think, I think anything in health is, is a challenge. It's a big system. It's a, it's a $30 billion a year you know, portfolio. It's, it's massive. Is that regional health, all... sorry? Or no, that's health. the entire okay. health system. What is it for regional health, just out of curiosity? For regional health in terms of splitting that... I couldn't tell you exactly, and I'd have to take that on notice. That but again, to... again, too, you know, when you're looking at procurement, you're looking at all of those things, we do that on a very general level. If we did that on separate levels, we wouldn't be getting the best, um, you know, the best outcomes for people in, in New South Wales. But 
I also will say that, yes, my focus will be on all regional LHDs. I, I'm going to have a real focus on workforce and on those issues that are raised and also as a response to the inquiry. The inquiry deserves that response. People have, you know, you, look, you've right. been on the inquiry, not me. So Excellent. Yeah. So, so one of the, the, let's go into the issues then, one of the issues that has come up time and time again has been the closure of maternity units at regional hospitals, the mm. lack of midwives. It kind of uh, comes into your portfolio of obviously for women as well as regional health. What's your plan to have a look at whether maternity units indeed uh, should they have been closed in the first place, birthing surfaces, services and uh, midwifery services in regional areas for, for women? Mm. Because that, that we've heard a lot of mm. shocking stories. Yeah, yeah. And look, you have, you have heard a lot of stories that have been very confronting and I don't walk away from that. Um, what I will say in response to your question specifically about maternity units... Obviously, safety is paramount. Safety is the absolute first thing that has to be thought of. And in saying that, um, our rural and regional maternity services are so important. You know, I had I had one child in the city. I had one child in the country. I, I preferred I preferred my rural and regional maternity experience. No offence to you know the great specialists in Sydney, but I think that as well when we look at things like this, we have to ensure the safety of patients. What we have seen previously, and that does not stand currently, has been a deep decrease of population in rural and regional New South Wales towns. When you get that decrease in population, you get those decrease in births. It's really important that we're able to maintain the services that we have to maintain. And by doing that in so many things, it's about the volume and the frequency of what you're able to perform the, the, perf perform the procedure. One example. So can I just finish, so Ms. Fair Member? Sure, before? just... Sorry. Because I really do too. Because you're asking me a very clinical operational question, I'm going to give you a high level answer to that about how I feel and yes I want to see maternity services stay open in in country in rural and regional hospitals but the caveat of that is absolutely that they must be safe Sure. You just you you did say in terms of smaller um, areas. I think that there are just um, in terms of the need for the service but for example um, Bathurst for example, 45,000 uh, population, there is no um, neonatal uh, unit, there's no neonatal services, sorry, in, in, in Bathurst. That was evidence before the inquiry. Is that, is that good enough? I think that Bathurst is a, is a big regional centre that provides very excellent services through that hospital. If you want, did you want to comment directly on Bathurst from an option? Certainly happy to, Minister. So, so as an example, I mean, I think when we say neonatal services, we need to understand what neonatal mm. services are. Uh, for our neonatal intensive care units, they look after the smallest and <coughs> sickest and most vulnerable babies that are born. Uh, and they rely on highly <coughs> specialised teams of uh, specialists around the clock to provide that care. So you need a certain level of activity and a number of cots that are available to sustain a service with that level of, of specialist involvement. So we have a statewide service for our neonatal intensive cares and they're, and they're consolidated in the sites where we're able to have enough of those babies in one site that we can and continue to support with all the specialist clinicians and nurses as well as doctors around the clock to provide their care with all the backup that's required as well. So for a service the size of Bathurst, it wouldn't be appropriate to have a neonatal intensive care unit in a hospital the size of Bathurst. Those services are consolidated in services where we have the highest level of maternity care and we have arrangements in place to ensure that we retrieve babies uh, that are critically ill and they're transferred to where that, that care can be provided. And that's a statewide service that's been in place now for many years. Um, yes, um, uh, Dr. L Dr. Lyons, I'd actually like to pick up on this. You'd be familiar with the community-based campaign in YAS for maternity services down there. In fact, I think over the last eight to ten years, I've actually met some of the mums, and one of the mothers actually has on the child's birth certificate Barton Highway because the baby was born on the highway because of no maternity services down there. Has New South Wales Health done any work to restore maternity services at YES, at the community of YES? So the work, work to look at maternity services in YES has been going on for uh, uh, many, many years, as you know, Mr. Yep. Sir Gordon. So yes. there's been many attempts to look at how that service could be provided. And I think all of the issues that the minister outlined around the challenges of providing maternity services in rural settings apply to that setting. The challenges for us, and we heard through the rural and regional health inquiry, 
The changes in care over many years and the requirements of doctors and nurses to have skills that are maintained at an appropriate level and the requirement now, as we've seen with maternity care, the shift towards more caesarean sections being undertaken, the higher risk deliveries that uh, are now designated as being appropriate for a caesarean section to be available within 30 minutes of somebody who might be in the process of delivering. All of these things, the fact you needed an anaesthetist, you need someone to resuscitate the baby if there's a problem with the baby, as well as the person who's involved in providing the delivery to, uh, and, and delivering the baby. Those things have compounded over the last few years to mean that it's very difficult in some sites to maintain those services safely, particularly where the delivery numbers were decreasing. It meant the point that uh, many clinicians decided they were no longer able to maintain their skills and decided to come out of doing that sort of clinical care. So those factors have compounded in so many sites across a rural environments. And this is not just an issue for New South Wales, as we heard in the inquiry as well. It's an issue nationwide and internationally this intersection between quality and safety, the most recent requirements for maintenance, maintenance of skills, the requirements of a certain level of care to be available yep. to provide that care safely, and the consequences if the clinicians provide that care in a setting where those things are not available mean that there have been very big changes in the dynamics of service delivery. Minister, given um, Dr. Lyons's answer that Yass is one of the fastest growing communities because of its location near Canberra, mm -hmm. it's become a bit of a dormitory community, mm -hmm. but far enough away where there's concern that with the young mums giving birth, will you give a, give a commitment today to look at maternity services at Yass as part of your new portfolio? I know that you've been for 11 weeks, but will you give a commitment today? Mr. Sakord, I'm not into, you know, in, in budget estimates, giving commitments and giving, you know, guarantees. I understand what you're asking, and I understand that you're asking that we relook at that service. Yes. Mr. Sakord, I would hope through my entire time that I'm lucky enough to hold this portfolio, that I'm constantly looking and looking at ways of evolving the service and making sure that we get services. I, I came into this parliament on absolutely fighting for local services in a, in a community in Cooma, but what I will always, always always encourage and always want to see happening is that we do as many services as we possibly can as close to people as they are allowed to do safely to ensure the best health outcomes. Because the reality is, if we look at things and we want to deliver every type of service in every single centre in rural and regional New South Wales, then we are going to expose our communities to a very high and unacceptable level of risk. And our clinicians and our doctors and, and everyone will also look at that. The really important important thing here when we look at areas like Yass, of course the community would prefer that they could birth at that hospital and if there comes a time when that can be done safely and effectively and staffed appropriately, then we're able to look at those things. But the really important thing here is the wraparound maternity services that exist in that area. The fact that if you do need to go away to have your baby, that you are able to come back as soon as that is, as, as mum and bub are well and you can have all of those backup services in the community, all of that primary health care in the community, all of that support for you and your new baby that allows you, your family and your community to thrive. And we're very focused on that. I think the, I think the community would be disappointed by that answer. But I'll return, I'll return to the area of being um, regional health minister. So, Minister, as Minister for Regional Health, do you have any responsibility on appointments to the nine local health districts? I will be doing so, Mr. Sikord, yes. You'll be doing those appointments. Will you also be reviewing uh, previous appointments in that? Uh, Mr. Sikord, uh, uh, nothing has been brought to my attention where I have to review a previous appointment. People are appointed for a certain length of time. If the minister has to intervene because there was a complaint, if you're alleging that there's some complaint well, or some uh, issue, I, I'd then I'd like to take you I'd to the you to outlandish share. offensive comments made by Prue Goward on the southern New South Wales local health district, and there were calls for her removal, where her comments in the Australian Financial Review, they were highly offensive. And, and your question to me? Well, will you be looking at her, her, her position, her appointment? Look, Mr. Sikord, I think that I, I found those comments uh, unacceptable on, on my own level. Okay, I, thank I did. you. Minister, I want to return to rural health. So the rural health plan towards 2021 mm -hmm. has now expired. So is a, re a review being undertaken? And what briefings have you had in relation to that? I've had multiple briefings, Mr. Sikord. We are looking at the rural health plan and, and making sure that we land that and we do it um, do it appropriately. I've been working with both Dr. Lyons and the secretary on that. And 
we look forward to having that um, finalised in the very near future. But I do want to look right through that and I do want to make sure that, you know, I, I'm completely um, across and involved in that plan. One thing that I do want to do as well, um, and as it, I, I think too, it is nearing completion and it will be published on the, on the website and it's the third and final review. I understand there's a lot of reviews and it's been a time in coming. But one thing also that I am looking at um, that oh, I will... So it's a third review of what? Of the plan. Uh, it is the third and final review of the plan it commenced, that commenced and it's pre the previous reviews were undertaken in 2015 and 2018 and those so are both... So when is it due? Sorry? When is it due? It's due this year, 2021. So it started in 2015. No, no, I understand. No, no, no. no. When's the third... Yeah. When's the third review due? This year, Mr Chair, as I said. So, so the 31st of December, perhaps? Sorry? The 31st of December? It's due this year, Mr Chair. What are we looking at? So, if I can clarify, um, so we've got the current rural health plan that finished in 2021. And I, I think the Minister's that, yes. talking about the reviews of that previous rural health plan. Correct. And the Minister's also committed to a, a new rural health plan to replace the previous one, which we will be undertaking the process of development of that rural health plan this calendar year, with an aim that will be finalised in December of this year. So I'm talking about the review of the one that's expired Inspired, when uh, will that be published and made available? So that review is the third review that I think the Minister that's was talking right, about, and right. that's the one that is available, I think, on the website now. It's been completed, the review, the third of, review the pro available. of the progress in the 10 years of the Rural Health Plan that we previously had. We've uh, assessed the impact of that plan and what it's achieved and what things still need to be done. And also, Mr Chair, I'll be Sorry, looking just very... That, just to <laughs> clarify, so the plan expired in 2021. Mm -hmm. You're saying there is a third review and that that review now is available on the website? That's my understanding. I'll just... Okay, I, well, we'll, we'll, we'll yep. clarify for sure, that's but that's fine. my understanding. And, and the, the process is very clearly been uh, thought through in the context of the Rural and Regional Sorry. Health Inquiry that was underway and the need for us to ensure that whatever we put into the Rural Health Plan is informed by any recommendations that might come out of that review process, in addition to the need to consult very extensively with our rural communities to make sure uh, that there's a lot of input into the next phase of rural health investment, uh, particularly given the sorts of, uh, of things that we've been hearing through the, the, the uh, inquiry. But Minister, could you understand the frustration? So. It's been reviewed three times 2015, and I actually looked on the web yesterday afternoon with my colleague Greg, Greg Donnelly, and it was signed by Minister Gillian Skinner. That's, that's a long time ago. So you could understand the frustration in the community. Can I, can I take you back to, can I take you back to your appointment? So are you familiar with um, a community-based campaign by Wagga MP, Dr. Joe McGurr. I am. Yes, and he and local clinicians, including um, Professor Gerard Carroll, who's had more than 30 years Jared, experience. Jared Carroll. Sorry, oh. Jared. Jared, okay, it's my pronunciation. Sorry about that. No, no. Jared Carroll, Professor Jared Carroll, and he's supporting it. He's got 30 years experience in Wagga, and he thinks that one of the one of the first things that you should do as minister is create a dedicated department of rural health. And Dr. McGurr has begun a community-based campaign in the last 48 hours on this. What is your response to, to that? It's one of the first things he thinks that you should do as the new minister. Yeah, and look, I, I speak with Dr. McGurr regularly. I've known him for a very long time. He was my medical director when I worked at Southern, New South Wales Local Health District. I'm aware of his views on that, and we've had extensive discussions about it. Uh, one thing I will be doing is I will be re implementing the Minister's Advisory Rural and Regional Task Force because I think that that is very important and I look forward to being able to inform you more of that uh, when, when that process takes place. It's, it, well, it's underway and when that's finalised. Um, and in terms of, of, you know, splitting into a regional health portfolio, look, everything's on the table in terms of, of how we look at things. But at the moment, we want to hit the ground running. So we are looking at doing that within, within the Ministry at the moment. We have a couple of options on the table that we are discussing with senior health executives and the senior health teams and just taking on board all of the issues that they raise and what they were doing. But in terms of splitting the portfolio, that would be an extensive and a, and a very different way of doing things. So you're saying no to his proposal then? No, no, I'm not, Mr Secord, at all. I didn't say that at all. I'm saying that...
that I'm willing to look at everything that's on the table. We're working through those processes at the moment in terms of, um, you know, the, the response from a ministry level at that. But in terms of splitting that tomorrow or next week, no, that's not on the table at the moment. Now, you mentioned in your answer a task force. Excuse mm -hmm. my ignorance. What was the task force? You so previously, Mr. Saccord, there was a rural and regional advisory uh, group to the Minister for Health that was comprised of clinicians, of chief executives, of people that were, you know, um, influential people in rural and regional health. I'm going to reinstigate that. That was in under, when Minister Skinner was in. And I'm going to be reinstigating that task force to be able to advise me. I'm one of those people that I like to hear from people on the ground, and I think it's really important, and I'm going to be implementing that. Well, you, you just said on the ground, so you mentioned, who did you mention would be on it? You said... Um, health, so I haven't health. decided who's going to be on it yet, but I will be looking to introduce someone who is a clinician on the ground onto that task force, as well as, I presume, the Rural Doctors Association. I would like to probably see uh, a rural CE on that, but I haven't finalised it, but I'm working through it. Okay. Now, I want to take you back to your role as as Minister for Regional Health. Mm -hmm. Do you have the power or responsibility that the senior minister has? So I know that many of government, crossbench, and non-government labor labor people can make representations to minister to the minister on the allocation of resources. For example, there's something in their community they want an MRI, they want cancer services, they want palliative care that they can make direct representations to the minister and if the minister feels that there's merit to it he can ask the local health district or new south wales health to reallocate resources do you have the ability and responsibility to do that for example um Goulburn Hospital requested something, Yass Hospital requests something, Lismore Hospital requests something. Do you have the ability to direct them or ask them to do that? So, Mr. Scott, what I would say in answer to that is that each, when you're talking about, say, equipment, you mentioned a CT scanner, I believe. If you, all of the local health districts will have a list of priorities for them that are on that list to say what are the most needs of priority in terms of whether that's equipment, whether that's a refurbishment, whether that's something that has to exist within yep. that local health district. Mm -hmm. yep. Those things are looked at in an appropriate fashion. They are not just decisions that are, that are made. They are looked at on a needs basis. Then advice is sought from that local health district, from the ministry, and those decisions are made in the appropriate budget process. So the answer is no, you are just a figurehead. No, Mr. Saccord, I think you know me well enough to know that I would never yeah. just be a figurehead. Chair, I think I might have to take a, a point of order on that one. I think that um, uh, the, the minister um, was clearly uh, articulating her response. Uh, I, I think that uh, making uh, Statements of that nature are probably unhelpful at this stage. And Mr. Saccord, I would also draw your attention, if I may, that I've been the Minister for Mental Health for close on three years now that also sits within the cluster position of, uh, of a cluster of health with Mr. Minister Hazard as the Senior Minister. I think we've seen an, a, a record number of funding invested into mental health. So. I am no figurehead. Thank you, Mr. Sakord. I was I was just getting to the that you weren't um, that you weren't able to clearly de delineate or direct to show what your responsibilities were. You said that you were very early in the procedure. You did confirm that you're involved in the appointment of LHDs. I understand that those are symbolic appointments. That's that's fine. You'd be involved in. It. But I wanted to know if you could pick up the phone and say we need maternity services in Yas, and that would happen. And it's quite clear from today's evidence that you don't have the power to do that. Mr. Saccord, that is absolutely inaccurate and, and quite, actually, I'll be very careful, Mr. Chair, and not to, but I think, you know, what is always a, the best thing to do is look at someone's track record, and I invite you to look at my track record in mental health. Well, can I just say this before I pass on, Minister? This, this is the glossy brochure produced by New South Wales Health mm -hmm. with respect to the 2021 plan. Okay, the one that we're looking for the third review. And can I just say, the first priority is listed at the top, strategy. Strategy one, enhance the rural health workforce. So it's interesting that that's the same priority that you're bringing forward as your priority. We've had a, an utter failure of a plan in terms of rural workforce 
that has not delivered and been manifested across a whole range of examples given in the health inquiry, and you're picking that up as the first inquiry. I mean, the proper question to be asked is what's happened over the course of this plan if you are picking up the priority which was identified as the first one that obviously hasn't been addressed? Mr Donnelly, may I address that in multiple parts with your, with your response just then? And of course workforce is a priority for me and workforce continues to be a priority and so it should be. And the fact that it was, has been a priority on that plan is saying that we have been working towards solutions. And when you look at the fact that the workforce... Solutions that haven't Mr. been Mr Donnelly, may I finish please? Solutions that haven't been May delivered. I finish please? You've asked me the question. I'd like the opportunity to answer it. I didn't actually ask a question. I actually made uh, a statement. Chair, uh, yeah. Put on the chair, but I think you should allow the minister there. When we look at the rural health workforce and we look at the last 10 years, we've had an increase of 10,123 FTE. That's a 25.3% increase. So if we weren't doing our job, we wouldn't have seen that increase in the workforce. Now, are there still issues? Yes, there absolutely are. Multiple but issues, we have Minister. Point of order, Chair, and, and I'm going to make the same point that Mr Mallard made. It's really difficult to make a point of order on somebody who is the Chair, but um, it's incumbent upon all of us, I think, to uh, allow uh, the Minister to provide a full response when uh, they're asked a question. And um, I think in this instance, um, it would be helpful if the Minister was able to finish her answer before there was interjections from any of us, but I think particularly the Chair. Thank you. Move along. Deputy Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have some questions, uh, Minister, in regards to women's health and, and women's mental health. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a bit of a cross of those two portfolios. Um, research has shown that one in three Australian women experience birth trauma and one in ten women experience PTSD after childbirth mm -hmm. and that these statistics are actually getting worse over time rather than better. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think that we have such a high number of women particularly suffering with PTSD after childbirth? Well, um, I, in terms of the actual reasons and things, I would have to ask Dr Wright, but I will, I will answer your question. It's a very important question and it's a really important point. And in terms of also then what happens as well is that we see an increase in perinatal depression and anxiety and that is extremely concerning. Um, I've actually got some really great news in that respect, in that um, during our COVID response, we looked at increasing funding to the Gidget Foundation, which deal directly with perinatal anxiety and depression. When we started before that, our wait lists in that area had blown out exponentially to numbers of months. I just received notification last week that that wait list is now down to two weeks. So I believe we've gone from five months to two weeks, which I think is a phenomenal response. And I think that it goes to show that that, that absolute focus on that area was something that we, um, that we were really, really keen on doing. And we've actually seen the results in that because what we know is that if we can get to, we, if we can get the help to people in a timely fashion that we can decrease the um, the situation of becoming more serious and more long term um, so and we also will have the first um, mother and baby unit at Royal Prince Alfred that should be opening hopefully very very soon uh, that I am I was absolutely determined when I became the Minister for Mental Health to see that event because I think it's really important to have somewhere where a mother can be with her baby when she is suffering that acute level of a mental ill health. But in terms of why it's happening and if it's increasing, I'll, I'll have to pass to Dr Wright. Thank you, Minister. Uh, look, I, I'm not sure that we could say that the actual incidence is increasing. I think it's it's actually more a case of um, better recognition. Um, I, I think the um, the issues of um, um, perinatal mental health um, for um, particularly um, issues around depression, anxiety um, and PTSD have probably been historically under-recognised um, and, um, and, and so I think that in some ways it's um, a product of, I think, the, the sort of societal changes that people are much more prepared to um, acknowledge um, vulnerability and to seek help um, and mental health is much more commonly part of a conversation at times of significant change in people's lives. 
and um, pregnancy and childbirth and parenting is a massive change. It's one most of us look forward to, but it still comes um, with its stresses. Um, so I, I think the other thing that I would say is that, that you know the kind of changes that are happening across the whole of the community and the whole of society, which probably contribute to some of the um, apparent increases in um, mental health vulnerability amongst that we're seeing amongst young people, might contribute to some some increases. So, so again. Um, New parenting is very dependent on cohesive families, um, cohesive communities, lots of supports, and I think the kind of changes that have occurred over the last 50 years in, um, in, in that area may have contributed. But my main comment would be, I think it's something that we've probably under-recognised over time, and I think that we're um, empowering people to understand that, that they're not necessarily meant to feel the way they might be feeling and that there is help available. And, um, and, and that's what we're trying to do with the sorts of initiatives that the Minister has just talked about. Can I Thank also you, just add one quick thing to that, if that's all right with you, is that we're going to have our first ever Women's Health Expo on um, Monday as part of Women's Week. So I'd really encourage everyone, we're offering that virtually as well because it's a weekday. It's the first time we've ever done it. It's actually a... Um, a very important thing to me personally, women's health, and it's something that I, I really want, intend on taking forward and into with my portfolio and regional health as well, because I think it's so important. And you talk about um, you know PTSD, post childbirth, and things, which means that you know those those prenatal classes are just so important to prepare women, prepare families. And um, and I'm I'm really we're very excited about the Women's Health Expo. It's had a great response. So if anyone would like to give that a shout out on their um, platforms, we'd really appreciate it. Thanks, Minister. Um, I've been. A approached by uh, maternity advocacy groups um, who are concerned about obstetric violence um, and they're concerned that, that OV might actually be associated with the increases that we're potentially seeing um, in PTSD and birth trauma. Um, are you aware of um, obstetric violence and um, whether there is an association with those rises in PTSD and birth trauma? I mean, first, I am not, no one has raised obstetric violence with me. Um, I am aware of cases where we've had uh, clinicians where that process has been investigated and the, you know, uh, execution of, of um, consequences to that. But in terms of obstetric violence, no, I, I actually haven't uh, come across that in terms of being raised with me. Um, some countries have actually specifically criminalised obstetric violence um, in different places around the world. Is that something that you would consider looking into or is it something that you'd be open to being briefed on further on the issue um, by the maternity groups that are working in that space? Always open to be briefed, Ms Hurst, on anything like that. Thank you. Um, one solution, and, and, I, and I do appreciate, you know, the, the answer you gave before about um, early intervention funding, funding and support services um, in those early stages. Um, but I, I guess what these groups are really looking at is avoiding the trauma, you know, in, in, in the much, much um, before it even happens, rather than the early stages um, of the illness. Um, and one solution that they're also proposing is better empowerment and support for women through um, pre- and postnatal period. Um, and, and through that, um, the continuity, continuity of midwife care so that women have a midwife that they know throughout the birth process to advocate for them. Um, at the moment, only about 10% of women can access a known midwife at birth, while in other countries in New Zealand, it's um, such as New Zealand, it's over 90%. Um, is that something that is being looked into um, for those early stages to avoid um, birth trauma and PTSD? Ms Hurst, are you referring to sort of private midwives and home birthing or are you referring to hospital birthing or broadly across across the entire spectrum. So we're talking about continuity of care of being able to access a known midwife. Um, so only 10% of women can actually access the same midwife so that they're working with one midwife right across their pregnancy. Look, I am, I'm happy to look at that, but at the moment what, what happens is that you go and you birth and you have the midwife who's on that, that births you, that is there on that shift on that day. 
and then you are followed up by community mental uh, community community health teams that consist of community midwives who specialize in those different things midwifery is an incredible profession and it's highly specialized but the the part of actually birthing and then looking after people after they've had their baby and those issues that they might find are sometimes different but my my absolute understanding of the system and it was certainly my own experience although many years ago uh, is that those those things are followed through and that you are supported by those teams and those people and whether it's at your GP or whether it's at through your primary health care initiative or whether it's about going back to your hospital I think we have incredible maternity systems in place if there are specific issues at specific sites I, I would welcome hearing about that. Thank you, Chair. Minister, I just want to turn to the issue of mental health peer workers, particularly their, um, their pay and conditions. Mm. Are you aware of the um, average wage of a mental health peer worker? Uh, Ms. No, what it is, sorry. I no, I, I don't. I, I'm not aware of that. Is it so? I'm told that the minimum rate is $27.97, and quite a lot of peer mental health peer workers are employed part time. So, are you firstly, maybe if anybody else, any of your um, officials know the turnover rate of mental health peer workers or the average wage, the average hourly rate of mental health peer workers? Does anybody have that information? It would be according to an award, Ms. Fairman. But look, I will say too that, you know, mental health use peer support workers quite extensively and I think extremely effectively. It's something that the Mental Health Commissioner and I have discussed on many occasions and we actually have looked at making sure that we care for our peer workforce. And I think I might ask the Commissioner to speak on this if that's okay. But one of the things I think that's happened as well, Ms. Fairman, just to be completely honest and transparent, is that I think with the success of the peer support workforce in mental health, it's actually actually grown a lot faster and a lot quicker than we probably anticipated because it's been so successful. So I think absolutely it's been on my remit to make sure that we're looking after that peer workforce that they are cared for. But uh, what, may I ask the Mental Health Commissioner just to elaborate because her and I've had many... specifically after the pain conditions, not the broad. I'm aware of this. I'm aware of the program. Yeah. But no, I don't have the pain conditions um information at hand but you are absolutely right that a lot of the positions are um, part-time but we have seen an increase and we have seen in the numbers and we have seen an, um, an increase pardon my voice um, in the um, <coughs> In the um, training um, through the development of um, the provision of um, scholarships, so we are also increasing our, our workforce, and especially at this time when peer workers um, can work in so many different settings when the community has been impacted you know, so upon their wellbeing. Thank you. I have had somebody uh, contact me who was employed as a, um, as a mental health peer worker at Mudgee Hospital, uh, who unfortunately is, is no longer in that position due to what they have um, termed as the abysmal pay. They are earning only $26,000 a year, working, I understand, um, around 24 hours a... 24 hours a week that um, that position has been empty for over a year because no one's interested in the role because of the, the terrible pay. Um, they've also... Um, Spoke, they've also told me about the fact that salary progression pro, um, requires a three-year degree, such as nursing or social work, but the whole point of peer, peer workers is, of course, their lived experience with mental health. Minister, are you aware of any of these issues with the program? Ms Fimmon, did you make representations to my office about this particular person? No, the I issues? haven't. No. Yeah, so because I haven't heard about that and I, I don't know, um, but it's and you haven't made those representations, I can't comment on that I particular case. About, I would welcome you, you any time when you have an issue with, with anything as you've done in the past that you come and you bring it to us and we can absolutely look at that. Thanks Minister, I'm bringing it to you now, it's budget estimates and I'm talking about the peer worker, mental health peer worker program broadly. I've just said that the minimum wage is $27.97 an hour, which is below the poverty line. Most mental health peer workers are paid that amount. Most are paid part time, as I understand, and there are um, what I, I would like to know the uh, turnover as a result of that and how many mental peer um, 
mental health peer workers are employed and how many vacancies there are, because it is a great program, but surely they should be paid more for the great work that they do. Ms Femin, I've met with a lot of peer workers since I've been the Minister for Mental Health. I'm absolutely in awe of them and the work that they do. When I look at the new safe haven model and I see how that's built on peer workers and the incredible success that's coming out of those programs, uh, every single time I've spoken with peer support workers, and I, I speak with people a lot, I haven't had this issue raised with me. In terms of someone working part-time or full-time, that, that's often a personal choice. But if you'd like to raise those issues, give that particular detail to me, I'm really happy to look into it. Okay, I will do that. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to turn to um, COVID vaccinations and just to check what the, how the booster rollout is going in regional New South Wales compared to Greater Sydney. In, um, is cough or? We were very okay. strong all right. in the rural and regional The men's area. might have some yeah. response. Okay, yeah. great. Well, uh, Chair, if we're while waiting, I can clarify the question about the COVID patients in Ballina. There were no COVID patients in Ballina Hospital at the time that the transfer was occurred. We've had that clarified. And uh, so we can take that one off notice. Uh, and the other one I've just had clarified is that the third progress report on the Rural Health Plan is not yet on the website. It is going through the final appro approval processes and will be on the website shortly. So I just wanted to make clarify. Thank you very much. Chair, I can Thank clarify you, that Mr. issue. Uh, the first point I have to make is that our, our um, system-wide data with respect to dose three, um, we know is, is not complete in the sense that if staff choose to be vaccinated with the third dose privately, not through one of our New South Wales health clinics, there's then a subsequent process where they have to um, go through some steps to upload their VAX record so that it hits um, our Starflink employee system. And we know that there's a lag in that and uh, we've been asking the chief execs in all the districts to encourage their staff to go through that extra step. So these numbers <coughs> very likely underestimate the current status of dose three. Overall in New South Wales Health, uh, in a report to Monday the 21st of Feb, we were at 41% um, dose three. Metro was 43%, regional and rural was 40%. Um, how, how, what's the average um, when you're saying that, that, that people are needing to apply? There's a different process for if they get their booster, and I'm assuming you're saying, say, via a pharmacy or what have you. Yeah, pharmacy what's, GP. Yeah. Okay, so do you know what the average um, time, for example, it's taking to update that, what the lag is? Is there a lag, for example, do you expect that to be a little bit more? Do you expect it to be 5% more? Um, I don't, I'm not asking Very you hard. to. To, to, to actually but what's the lag generally, Mr Minns? It's very hard to estimate with any confidence, but we do believe our, our workforce um, who've received the first two doses are very likely to have received the third because of all the messaging that we've done to them about um, the roles they play and the risks they're exposed to. Um, I think particularly when you look at the context of the Omicron wave through December and January, um, we probably have had a sentiment from staff of uh, just please don't ask me to do something else right at the moment. So we're hopeful that as um, the situation is recovering, as Dr Lyons pointed out earlier, that we'll be able to go back to staff and ask them to complete that. Um, it's, it's an administrative process, really. OK. Uh, but you, you, would, you would surmise that our workforce um, who, who are with us now, who got their first two doses, are very likely believers in um, the importance of vaccination. So I think the numbers, if I had to punt, are a pretty significant underestimation of current status. But, but we won't know until we clean up that administrative process. Thank you. Uh, with the remaining time, we'll split between the two groups. So, our what's that one? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, let's still let him. I am. Yeah. Okay. Minister, I'd like to turn your attention as Minister for Mental Health to the um, tragic case that's been reported for the last several days by the Daily Telegraph. And I wish to congratulate the Daily Telegraph on their campaign to highlight the impact of cyberbullying, particularly on the mental health of young people. It's tragic, heart-wrenching, every parent's nightmare. And our thoughts and prayers go out to the, her family grieving in Bathurst. 
um, you'd be aware of this coverage the last few days. So what is your response to the tragic case involving Ms. Matilda Tilly Rose Warren? And what steps and what advice could you give in the area of cyberbullying and the impact on mental health on young people? Mr. Sukod, I actually find myself echoing your original sentiments when you spoke just then. It is an absolute tragedy and uh, for that family, for the community, for everybody, just a, uh, a, a terrible and horrific situation. Any life lost by suicide is an absolute and utter tragedy on the family, on the community. In the case of this particular case, I can't comment, as you would know, on, on personal considerations within the case, because I presume that will be with the coroner. What I will say is that I have really been very determined to make sure that we improve the mental health for our young people in New South Wales. And we've done that by a number of measures that we've introduced uh, over the last three years. I point to things like our safeguards teams that are specifically child and adolescent mental health teams that are focused on child and adolescent mental health. For the first time ever as a state government, we are going into headspace to look at reducing that wait list that we see in terms of putting master's students into headspace to try and reduce those wait lists. I truly and sincerely hope we have the same success that we've had with Gidget in doing that so that we make sure that we have more services that are accessible. Minister, mm -hmm. um, if I, with your indulgence, could I ask the chief psychiatrist, the chief psychiatrist of New South Wales, what is his response to you? What should young, young people do when confronted with cyberbullying? Like, how, how does a young person who's 15 years old respond to that. As a chief psychiatrist, what advice, what do you say to young people, but what else do you say to parents who find their, find their children in situations like this? Uh, thanks, Mr. Saccord. Well, I, I, again, I, I, I haven't got any, any different sentiments to those that you've already expressed. Um, it, it is tragic. It is um, really distressing, even just to read about it. So one can only imagine what it's like for those people in the immediate family and community. I, I think it's. It, I think um, the minister's comments about making sure that from our end that we've got visible, well-skilled and well-promoted um, accessible mental health services is crucial because um, when the, because the message to families, to schools and to young people is that this is completely unacceptable. And when it happens, you've got to, both in schools and in families, we all need to strive to create an environment where someone will speak up about these things because they're not always spoken about. Um, and, and so make it a, a place of safety where individual um, kids, um, and sometimes it's not the person who's being bullied, it's the people around them. Um, sometimes it's other family members um, can identify that this is something that might be going on. Um, we need to provide the services to support those people. Um, we need to work closely with our education colleagues, which we do, um, and to support them to create an environment where there's a, 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 a capability to respond to the actual cause, um, and the causes are complex, um, and to provide support for everyone who's involved, because the, it's, it's not just the person being bullied. It's the person around them, and sometimes it's the bullies themselves. So, on, on the subject of bullies, so if you're a parent and you discover that your child is a cyber bully, what advice do you provide to that parent? It would be quite similar, Mr. Saccord. It, it would be to, um, obviously, as a, as a, as a parent, you, you'd want to have the opportunity to understand what your child's perception is of what they're doing and why, um, and how it's affecting them. There's, there, there are always antecedents to these things. There's always a context. Um, then it's, a, it's about engaging with the school environment and trying to understand from their perspective. Um, and almost invariably, it's about getting, um, getting um, assistance for 
the perpetrator, um, that they are very often just as um, just as fragile and just as damaged as the people that they are attacking. It's not a there are no winners in in, in this sort of environment. It's a, it's a it, you know it's a it, and that's why the school environment and the family environment, and the local community, are all part of, I guess, the jigsaw of you know, what contributes to this this sort of thing. And and it, and the res the response to it is not about a an individual piece of support or therapy. It's about trying to address the problem on a on a um, on a on a sort of a uh, community scale. Whether it's the community of the school or whether it's the local community within which they live, it's it, it is complex. It's absolutely you know, a high priority for anybody who's interested in, in working towards improving child and adolescent mental health um, because it's because it's just so, so damaging. Thank you. Minister. I think that's why too, Mr. Sukord, if I could just add to that, we've been really um, focused on creating collaboratives across across New South Wales and what that means, it's, you know, it's not an easy thing to explain, but it's about making sure that we have all the services at the table when we're talking about young people and when we actually, uh, you know, Headspace actually spear up that for us. But it's about bringing community, it's about bringing, you know, education, it's about bringing health all around the table so that we can discuss these issues as they're presenting, as you know, and, and look at that whole of community response to these issues around things like, as you said, like bullying, which is just unacceptable. And we provide support to any child that should be experiencing Deputy bullying. Chair. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to say very quickly that the um, continuity care model that I was discussing in our last session um, was actually brought to me by uh, midwives that work in the space, but maybe that's something we can take outside of budget estimates and talk further. It's certainly not a criticism at all of the work that midwives do um, in any way. Um, but I do want to just quickly talk to you about uh, women's workforce participation. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware um, of research that was done recently by endometriosis Australia that found that nearly two-thirds of women um, had to take unpaid time off work to manage their endometriosis symptoms, and one in three women in Australia with endometriosis report being passed over for promotion because they're trying to manage their symptoms. Um, clearly, this is a major issue both for women's health and also women's workplace participation and equal opportunity. Um, is the New South Wales government doing anything to support women with these conditions, um, and is it something that you'd be willing to investigate further? I know that the um, the Women's Strategy Action Plan looked at um, miscarriage um, and IVF on women's workplace participation, mm -hmm. but I wondered if the government would be willing to investigate the impact of endometriosis on the workplace as well going forward. Mm, absolutely, and it is Endometriosis Awareness Month as well, this month as well. Um, and we're also we funded uh, Endometriosis Australia in our Investing in Women program, and that was actually for their employment program so we actually have have done that recently and yes will I continue to look at that absolutely please bring it forward but as I said that was uh, they were one of the successful uh, people in one of our investing in women grants I'm just trying to find here it is the endometriosis friendly workplace programs may, may I elaborate on that Miss Hurst for you now um, so as you said 260,000 women and those that identify um, are affected by endometriosis and it places a significant Significant burden. Endometriosis, Endometriosis Australia will design an endometriosis friendly employer program to facilitate employers to be able to provide flexible opportunities for those with endometriosis. So I'm really proud to say that uh, we've, we've done that. Thank you. Um, just one last quick question in regards to your role um, within regional health. Um, your National Party colleague, uh, the former Minister Adam Marshall, um, has called out the current state of rural and regional health care. Um, and I quote him when he says, my constituents keep asking me, what is the point of shiny new facilities when there's no one to work in them? Um, it's time New South Wales Health stops the Band-Aid fixes and finds cure for this medical staff shortages. Um, what is your response to your colleague? Um, do you agree with his criticisms? Um, and what is your plan as a new Minister for Regional Health to address to address the, the Sure. Just before I start on that, Endometriosis Australia will also be at the Women's Health Expo, so it'd be great to plug that again. Um, sorry. Um, yes, I'm very well aware of Adam Marshall's comments. And look, Adam um, Adam is a very, very strong advocate for his community. It's probably why he has one of the seats 
the safest margins in New South Wales. He's a very strong, strong advocate and he certainly uh, says what he thinks that are reflective of the views of his community. The workforce issues that are facing rural and regional New South Wales are, are issues that are facing not only Australia-wide but internationally and particularly in countries that share our geography and Canada's the same. The recent SACS report highlighted a lot of that as New South Wales Health is one of our parts of our response to the rural and regional health inquiry. Look, I think that, as I said, there have been many programs that have been initiated already. We have seen an increase in the rural and regional health workforce, but we definitely need to do more. I am speaking regularly with the Federal Minister, Minister Gillespie, for Rural and Regional Health. We actually had another conversation yesterday about some programs that we can do better to better align with, um, with getting the outcomes that we need. Obviously, your nursing workforce to your allied workforce to your GP workforce all have different challenges and different issues, and I think what we have to do is look at them all uniquely and look at it all really differently. That's something that I'm really, that I'm absolutely prepared and committed to do. Um, I wish that I had, you know, if we'd had a simple solution to this issue, then we would have solved it by now. But it is complex. It is complicated. But that doesn't mean that it's not able to be fixed and addressed. And so I, I intend to work extremely hard in doing that and bringing all players to the table. Thank you, Chair. My Minister... I just wanted to um, turn to the latest intergovernmental panel on climate change's report. It was released this week, and there's a reason I'm asking you as Mental Health Minister about this, because it's the sixth assessment report, but for the first time it, it details the impacts of climate change on mental health for the first time. That report, um, I'm sure you're aware, is peer-reviewed by thousands of scientists around the globe, mm -hmm. and it has an extensive uh, chapter this time on health, but particularly uh, also mental health. So are you aware of, of that report and the fact that, that that's in there this year? Uh, Ms Fairman, to be completely honest with you, I, I have been uh, quite diverted in the last two weeks with issues that have been going on. I haven't read the intergovernmental uh, report on climate change. And Can I check with Dr, whether Dr Wright is aware that it includes mental health for the first time? Sure, of course. I haven't read the report, but I'm quite aware of the um, the, the research, which tells us that the, the, there's an association between climate change um, and increasing challenges for mental health across the community. Yes, I think th this time, so this time, because it, it, it comes out every six years and the research is um, very much in now that the trauma of increasing natural disasters, which you've talked about today as well, Minister, leads to PTSD, anxiety, depression in the short term and potentially suicide and, and suicide in the, the long term. So I suppose the, the question is firstly, um, uh, so Be you're very cautious, not, Ms. Feminine, about not, um, linking suicide and, and, and specific issues. I just need to uh, say that. This, well, the report that is peer reviewed by thousands of scientists around the world states that. So that's what. It directly I, states that. That, yes. Right. So the question is what, whether um, the department, your new regional health department, sorry, mental health, sorry, whether your mental health um, uh, department is now looking at providing increased training and awareness around the impacts of increased uh, natural disasters as a result of climate change, which is one of the recommendations from this IPCC report. So we have a complete suicide prevention strategy in New South Wales that we've been running now, which is we're one of the first states to ever do that. So all of those services and all of those models and all of those new programs are available to everybody. And so they're not specifically onto one particular strain. But if indeed, and look, I have heard from general practitioners as well that young people in particular will come to them and talk about the distress that climate change is causing to their mental health and the detrimental effect that it has on that. But in terms of how we treat that is we actually treat the diagnosed illness by doing that and having all of those services in place to do that. OK, we'll come back to this. Thank you. Thank you. That's a uh, oh, break. Sorry. Break, break, sorry. That's OK. <laughs> oh, he's ready to go. He's ready we'll to go. <laughs> don't wander far. We'll be back at 11.15. Uh, 11.15. Oh. OK. Sharp.
They might be answering a few health issues, Walt, that are coming up. So. Oh, okay. Then, well, then we'll switch tack. The crisis yeah. There's a little bit going on. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Chair. Uh, well, we've got. We're still down on the table, so. Ray, can anyone just check where they are, please? What a past. Like, as a member of this committee, and I, uh, if any health official needs to go because of the crisis, we should grant them that. I mean, oh, you, you, uh, yeah, we've had this discussion with the minister. If you were here on time, you'd know we had that well, discussion. I'm saying, the Mr. Chair, oh, I do apologise, Sorry, Rose, you were That's fine. Sorry, Minister. Minister, yes. I, I just like to ask you a quick question as Minister for, uh, for Business, um, for Women. Sorry, um, what is your response to comments this morning from by from the Bush founder Grace Brennan? Now it was in the uh, the Australian, and from recollection, I think you publicly congratulated her in March 2021 when she won Regional Woman of the Year for her business activity and that, and putting women at the forefront of supporting their families. Anyways, this morning she said that 97 percent of the 250 businesses on her flat platform were run by w women, but they were inhibited because, quote, Australia needs better internet, lower postage services, charges in the bush, and increased rural childcare. If it's serious about increasing the contribution of regional and rural businesses to the national economy, what steps are you taking to improve the business atmosphere for women in rural and regional areas, particularly the problems highlighted today by Grace Brennan? Yeah, I know, I know Grace really well. She's an outstanding um, rural woman and she's done an outstanding job with, she just has the most incredible story and mm -hmm. with what she's done with Buy From The Bush is just amazing. And I, I agree. I think that the more that we can, you know, have better internet capacity, the more opportunities that that brings for women running those businesses. Grace and I have both discussed about childcare issues and that hard cut off at 3 p.m. She talks about it when she comes off her property at Warren and she works in a, um, a, a co-working space with other people in Warren off her family, off her property. And then, you know, she has to get to school by three o'clock or be able to meet the bus and, and how difficult that is sometimes to run a business. But I don't think that's unique to, to rural and regional women. And what is probably more challenging for rural and regional women is, is that there's not as many services and the distances that we face are a lot greater. I mean, I personally experienced that myself. My children have walked down from Cooma North Public School and, you know, um, I have other nurses, older children look after them until we finished and knocked off. So that was something that you had to do. So look, we have got the Women's Economic Review that's going on that will be looking at those, those issues. And I really look forward to those coming forward. In terms of what am I doing as the Minister for Women, We've done, we've done quite a bit in terms of looking at women's economic opportunity. We know that if we can increase that, we increase um, a lot of benefits for women. And we will be looking at childcare in that review. But as you would know, and I'm not shirking the responsibility, but it does sit with the federal government. And we are looking at, you know, we have great examples of co-working spaces in the country. When you look at the exchange in Dubbo and the huge success that that's had, I've had multiple discussions with that. We are, are discussing that at the moment with my Council for Women's Economic Opportunity and I will hopefully have some very good news to announce very soon on that. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thanks. Right. Hello, Minister. Hello. Hello. Um, I'm just here to ask uh, a couple of questions. Um, it's coming, haven't you, to your capacity right. as Minister for Women. I mean, my colleagues are doing such a good job in the other four oh. places, but I'm here. Um, I want to start with um, women's housing and homelessness, because I'm sure that you would be across the pretty sobering statistics around the fact that women over 55 are the fastest growing group experiencing homelessness and that there has been a 30% increase increase um, in the number of women over 55 experiencing homelessness um, in the last two years alone, which is quite serious. Mm -hmm. So I guess I wanted to ask, you know, how involved are you in the work, in any work that the government is doing to try and address this? And 
to the extent that you are involved, you know, what are the initiatives um, yeah. that the government is, is promoting? Mm -hmm. And sure, and completely acknowledge your question and completely acknowledge the facts that you've, um, that you've ascertained to in that question in terms of women over 55 and the issues that that presents. So, as you know, and I'm not joking this, but as you know, um, housing sits with another minister. It does not sit with me as my portfolio for Minister for Women. What does sit with me is ensuring that women have the economic opportunity so that they're not in a situation, because we know that one of the biggest causes of women becoming homeless after age 55 is lack of financial security. So with my Council for Women's Economic Opportunity, we've been looking very, very closely at that and we've, we've put a number of strategies in place and we've had a lot of success in terms of, you know, the Women's Financial Toolkit, which just goes from strength to strength to strength so that we can make sure that we can set women up, that they're not in this precarious position as well. One of the really big successes of the last two years has been the Back to Work program that we ran that was a $10 million program. We have had some um, incredible results from that. We've had um, uh, we've had the uh, 100 and so we've had 2,227 women have bo booked appointments with their return to work coordinators but six months after receiving the grant and this is really new data that I was just only came up on about 48 hours ago but so six months after receiving the grant of the 900 and 990 women who completed the follow-up 65 percent had secured employment so those women that were weren't employed before that 65 percent 73 percent had applied and or started education and training which is a pretty phenomenal result 95 percent of those women that had access to these grants said that they'd made progress with their return to work plan 81 percent reported increased confidence regarding returning to work and 98.5 found the return to work application process helpful so what that tells me with this grant program is that what we were able to do with this as it was part of our COVID response was we were able to make it quite flexible in terms of meeting the needs of the person rather than the opposite of having just a set of criteria that you have to tick off to be able to be eligible. So one woman was telling us how one of the really big inhibitors for her getting back to work after she'd been in a domestic violence situation and then had subsequently become homeless and all of those things that you would be much more across is that her scooter tyres were bald. So she couldn't, and she couldn't afford to get new tyres to get herself to a place of employment. She was able to do that with this grant. So I think one thing that I think has been very obvious in this, and now we've got the demonstrated evidence of that, is that when we can allow that flexibility to actually tailor the needs of the woman, we can get some really great results. I mean, it's a good program, and I think, you know, it's good news for those women who have been able to participate in it. But I'm more interested in the women right now for whom accessing a grant like that seems like another world away because they are living in their car or a tent and have been on the social housing waiting list for years and years and years. And, you know, it's not that, you know, a part-time employment opportunity has dried up over COVID. It's that they, you know, have experienced a lifetime of being right at the edge of the labour market and have completely now dropped out of the housing market. So are there any programs that are being run to specifically offer housing and homelessness support mm -hmm. to older women who are right now experiencing that, you know, at risk, being at risk of homelessness. And I thank you for your comments about the return to work program because there was a lot of um, criticism from the opposition when we were first bringing out those grants. So I'm really grateful for that acknowledgement today. And as I said, in terms of those homelessness programs, they don't sit with me as Minister for Women, but I'm really happy for PR. Are you? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, Tanya. Um, if Tanya would like to just follow up on that in terms of more broadly and more programs as well, but just to reiterate that that sits with another minister and not for me, but I'm happy for Tanya to. Yeah, I do, I do accept that, although, you know, we, we do have this problem where... No, I accept you know, that we, we have the we problem, ask questions but and it's budget estimates about the specific portfolio, but I'm happy for Tanya to take that. Um, so through the Social and Affordable Housing Fund, um, which is a $1.1 billion fund, um, the government's delivering over 3,400 social and affordable houses, um, and 1,414 of these dwellings are targeted to older people um, that are 55 years and over, or 45 years and over, for um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, 
There's um, also the um, Safe and Affordable Housing Strategy 2041, which is um, the responsibility of Minister for Homes, Minister Roberts, um, and that's a 20-year strategy, um, and they have biennial action plans. Um, to date, some of their achievements, they're developing um, a housing evidence centre um, where all of the data available for New South Wales around housing and homelessness is available, um, and also the um, new housing state environmental planning policy was released released in November 2021, um, and that policy aims to more efficiently deliver affordable and diverse housing. Um, and continuing forward, up forward um, with the future action plans are looking at um, longer term reforms um, to create a diversity of housing and also more affordable housing. Yeah, I mean, there is not one specialist homeless service in New South Wales that is dedicated to supporting older women. Is that something that you would be prepared to raise, perhaps, with Minister McLaren-Jones in that instance? Is that of concern to you, that there isn't one dedicated specialist homelessness service that supports older women? In terms of talking about homelessness services, that is a question you will have to direct to the relevant minister. Of course, I'm concerned as the Minister for Women, but my job and my portfolio is to increase economic opportunity for women so we don't get to that point. But of course, I'm open to discuss those and I'll have multiple discussions all of the time about how we can address that and how we can do better. Uh, how many staff are there in women in New South Wales? Miss Smythe, probably. Um. There are, um, there are eight um, FTA in Women New South Wales. And how does that compare to last year? Um, it, it's, it's difficult to compare because... Um, women Not a New large South number, so... No, yeah. Women New South Wales was responsible for domestic family violence and um, sexual violence and women's policy. Um, there were some staff that transferred to another area of um, our strategy pro uh, policy and commissioning division um, that look after domestic violence strategy. So they transferred rather than um, the women's policy team reducing. Yeah, so how many staff were that? were in that category that you just described? That, that um, are continuing to work on domestic family violence? Yes, how many staff who were working in that portfolio area transferred out of Women New South Wales into a new, some, some new... Um, well, it's because the portfolios yeah. were split, yeah. right? So it's not that they've gone or it's changed, it's just that that's focusing on, we're focusing on women's economic opportunity and there is a specific focus on domestic and family violence and that happened when the portfolios were split after the last election. Yep. yep. I'll have to take it on notice. It's, it's a, um, a handful of positions. And so the number of women, the, the eight FTE, excuse Correct. me, that has not changed? No. So um, the, there's six um, people that actually work on women's policy and that, that hasn't changed. And there's two that work on events and communications. Um, Minister... How is progress tracking on the Premier's priority to ensure 50% of government sector senior leaders are women? I think when we look at the Department of Community and Justice where Women New South Wales has sat, we have a really great story to tell in terms of the percentage of women in that in that in that um, department. That's good, except that's yeah. actually not the Premier's priority, as I'm sure you would be aware. That is a government-wide yeah. Um, Chair, I think uh, in this instance it uh, might be helpful if uh, Ms Jackson uh, allows the Minister to finish her answer before um, she seeks points of clarification. Make sure that the Minister knew I think the that Minister I was, was very aware of the 42.7 per cent. Okay. And thank you, Minister. And how's that tracking, you know, say, what was it this time last year? Have you got that figure? Because we're aiming for 50, so are we going forwards or backwards? And actually, it was, a, it was a, the former Premier's priority, and it sits at 42.7 of senior leadership roles in the public sector are women, and that is at, 20, is at oh, 2021. If you'd like those 2020 figures, I can take that part on notice and get that back to you. That would be useful, thank you. I mean, you mentioned there it was the former Premier's priority. Has there been any indication that it's no longer a priority with the new Premier? No, I'm working on... I mean, look, I, that's a priority for me anyway to look at. And look, I was just... I've just been messaged by my people that at 2021 it was 41.1%. So we've had a 1.6% increase. I thought you said it was 42 before. 
I said... Uh, you said 42, and then you took it on notice, and then you just said 41, which seems to me to be a decrease, not an increase. So as at 2021, it was 42.7, and 2020 was 41.1. Oh, right, apologies. Which makes it a 1.6% yes, increase. I wasn't clear no, no, on those I, dates, I yeah. have to check with my maths because it's not one um, of my strengths. So, so I mean, it's, it's good that it's gone up, although that's slow progress. I mean, have you had one conversation with the new Premier about any initiatives to actually try and, you know, get that moving to 50%? Have you had talked to him about that? at all? That is something that is entrenched within the public service. That's why we have flexible work practice. That's why we look at all of those things that women say that are important to them that allow that then that opportunity. We'll continue to work towards that. Well, I think that actually, to be fair to the public service actually has a very good story to tell in terms <laughs> of that often, in terms of within our bureaucracy and having women. We've got a female secretary for health. I've got, you know, I, I think that we have a very positive story to have tell. You, have you had a conversation? <laughs> I have with conversations the with the Premier all the time okay, about women's issues. Uh, about, hey, I have this Premier's <laughs> priority that aims to 50% of government sector senior leaders are women. We're at, you know, 41, 42. It's pretty slow progress. What, what are we doing about that? Any? Well, we have we have things that we're looking at. We have many conversations, and I really look forward to uh, seeing the findings of the review as well. Ms. Oh. Abigail Thank you, Chair. Um, and oh, good hello. morning. Good morning, <laughs> Minister. I understand it's your birthday. Happy birthday. Um, oh, see, she's on top of it. Nice. You know, it's... Um, it's, 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 it it's not the best thing to do on your on your birthday, I'm sure. Um, oh, I'm I had, happy to be I had here. to spend my last birthday at a uh, Greyhound racing track and part of an inquiry, and that wasn't fun either. Oh, um, it, was, it wasn't so bad. I can't imagine that would be fun Anyway, you had all, Miss Boyd. <laughs> I will use my time a bit more uh, yeah. wisely. But thanks. So, that makes me feel better. I'm running out of time now. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, the Illawarra Women's Health Centre submitted the business case for their Women's Trauma Recovery Centre mm -hmm. um, to Women New South Wales on the 20th of July 2021. Mm -hmm. um, the Ministry of Health funded the business case for mm -hmm. that. Um, when will the government respond to the business case? Okay. So that particular one will sit with the Minister for Domestic and Family Violence in terms of that centre. I am aware of that centre and I have met with them myself and I think that they do an incredible job. I am not aware of the, um, I haven't actually seen myself the business case but it's something also as well that Dr Vagona who is the Chief Psychiatrist in South Wales has made uh, representations to me about and spoken to me about that but in terms of where that's at at the moment and that would be part of a budget process that are budget matters. So even though it was submitted to Women New South Wales, that still sits under Minister Ward now, does it? Rather than For himself. that particular thing, I will just, Miss Boyd, have to take that particular part on notice. I am aware of it. I have met with them. Dr Vagona has mentioned to me as well because he's very involved in that and sees the absolute benefit that this would provide, but I cannot preempt budget decisions. Um, it has to be allowed to go through the budget process, and that's just the honest truth. I understand that it was um, submitted directly to the Director for Women New South Wales. Um, would it be okay with you if I ask her now um, what her information is? That, I'm, I'm very happy for Ms. Smart to answer anything, but I will say to you as well that I, I'm very firm on this, that I won't be preempting budget decisions in budget estimates, but that we will look at everything that, w that we have to put forward. Obviously, there will be many considerations for the budget this Thank year. Thank you, and maybe we will would come back this afternoon um, then so oh. thank thank you <laughs> she almost got to speak um, uh, the domestic and family violence reforms delivery board sits under you though doesn't it the sorry the uh, domestic and family violence reforms delivery board no, that would sit under the Minister for Domestic and Family Violence. Okay, because I've seen a um, like an organisation chart that has you um, as the responsible minister for that. You're saying that's not the Look, case? I would have, I could perhaps have oversight over that, but if it relates directly to domestic and family violence, it will sit with Minister Ward. Okay. I, I wouldn't have uh, that responsibility because it's not in my portfolio. I will bring those questions up again this afternoon, I think. Um, turning to the Equal Pay for Equal Play um, campaign, mm -hmm. um, which I I understand, well, first of all, are you familiar with it? I, I assume you are familiar yeah. with that campaign. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
uh, I guess I should start by congratulating you on the um, the number of sporting related action points that were included in the New South Wales uh, Women's Strategy uh, Year Free Action Plan. Um, we get very excited when people refer to the strategy, Miss Boyd. So thank you very much. Very good. Um, but and also the contributions that Women in New South Wales made to the Office for Sport, her Sport, her Way Strategy, mm -hmm. um, which I understand came about largely because of Women's Strategy. Um, in terms of the New South Wales Equal Pay for Equal Play campaign, has any uh, consideration been given to the ask of that campaign for the next action plan? There would be consideration for that. We're in the process at the moment of um, of looking and and uh, you know consulting with the action plan and, and where we're at. So absolutely, that will be considered. Okay, excellent. Um, one of the key points in both the Her Sport Her Way and the New South Women's Strategies um, Year Three Action Plans is the HSHW Grants Program. Mm -hmm. um, and it states uh, in the action plan um, that it supports projects that align with outcomes like including more women and girls playing sport, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, this is directly, I guess, um, echoing the, um, the us of the Equal Pay for Equal Play campaign. Um, do you support, in principle, um, the idea of equal prize money uh, for women athletes? Yeah, look, I'm very aware of the campaign and, you know, proposing that, you know, about gender equity, including equal prize money, and that that be made a condition of the New South Wales Government's grant funding for sport organisations. And it certainly is an issue, and it certainly has deep roots in the broader culture of our sporting landscape. I want to see women participating in sport. I think it's so important, not only for physical health, but for mental health as well. I think that where we've seen in countries where they've looked at that parity, it's made a really big difference. Mm. And I think it speaks volumes about what, about what needs to happen. And in terms of myself as the Minister for Women, I absolutely support that. But I think it has to be a broader discussion that needs to come from the sporting codes themselves. But in terms of how I feel, yes, absolutely. I think it's important. And and I think it, it, it demonstrates. And I think what you're seeing happening, Miss Boyd, too, and this is perhaps just my interpretation, so I'm very happy for you to disagree with it. But as Sporting Codes start to announce that, there was another announcement just in the last 40, and I can't remember, was it football in England? Yeah. Yep. And, and they actually said that. That's actually the most powerful thing to do. And, and I, I fundamentally believe that. This are my core values and my core principles, that I think when you look to the other sectors, and in this case you look to the sporting organisation, that message has to come from them. And I think when it does come from them, it's extremely powerful. And I think that what you'll see is that that ricochet of that starting to happen. I certainly hope so. It can come from both, though, can't it? You can have oh. it coming from the sporting organisations yeah. themselves, and you can also have some you have, uh, you gentle pressure can. from government. But, but genuinely, and look, we, we probably might disagree on this, I imagine, but I think, and, I, and respectfully, I, I genuinely believe that that's been the really powerful thing. And it's, I think us speaking about it as leaders in our community is really important and placing that but it I think I think the ball started rolling so to speak sorry the pun and I look forward to that happening I think we it's love so the important pun. Um, <laughs> can you uh, please table on notice the specific criteria that the HSHW grants are assessed against sure unless someone can answer that or yeah because that would that wouldn't that be for sport but look we'll take it on notice and sport and we'll, we'll thank we'll you have a look at that would be uh, very much appreciated um, what are the most recent <coughs> figures on the public sector employee gender pay gap mm -hmm. I'll just get the exact thing um. As at May 2021, the gender pay gap in New South Wales was 14.5%, and that reflects a pay difference gap of $272 per week. And the gen yet yeah, the gender pay gap in Australia is 14.2%. So New South Wales 14.5, Australia 14.2. So that's a 1.1% increase on the previous year. Oh, I'd have to take. Worse. I don't think I have the. 
I believe that November 2020, the gender pay gap for New South Wales was 13.4%, which was the same as the national pay yeah. gap okay. at that time. Well, I'll, I'll take that. Um, that I'll take that as as read that you've said that. I don't have that right in front of me, and I'm just very cautious when I'm talking about um, you know numbers and things. So that's that's still a very concerning number, isn't it? That we still yeah, have definitely. Um, what are you doing to try and correct that? What what sort of policies are you putting in place? Mm -hmm. So before you came, I think, Miss Boyd, I was talking to Miss Jackson about all of the things that we're doing in terms. So as Minister for Women, my remit is to look at the economic opportunities for women because we know. Okay. Can you that sorry? Can we just target the pay gap though, in particular? The measures well, that are targeted yeah. at the pay but gap. But the thing is, is that the more the more women that we get into the workforce, the more women that we're allowed to have those careers and have that potentiality of employment, will in turn allow us to bring that down. In terms of, you know, in terms of those professions that women do, this has been a long-standing issue. Something that we're all working <coughs> towards. Something that we all want to see improve. Um, what does the public sector employee gender superannuation gap look like? Do you have that data? Not in front of me in terms of the superannuation gap. I don't. I can ask Ms. Smythe if you've... No. Could you take it on notice? We can notice. take that on notice, sure. Um, and, yeah, let me know if it's not data that you track, but it would be useful to know. Mm -hmm. um, last year, during estimates and in the context of Brittany Higgins coming forward, mm. um, you said, uh, quote, when I'm asked about it, I use my platform and my privilege as a member of parliament to absolutely encourage women to come forward. Um, what have you been doing over the past year as minister and as a member of cabinet to directly respond to the many public disclosures of sexual assault, sexual harassment and gendered bullying in politics? Mm. So uh, you would be aware of well, as well internally that there has been um, a review and an inquiry, uh, two of them in, in Parliament, that are running at the moment. We await the results. Um, the results. We, re we await the finding of that. So we've just, got the Goward sorry, review. Sorry, just to stop you there. With respect, yes, I understand um, the Prue Goward review was something that the, the prior Premier... And the Broderick review. Um, the Broderick review was yeah. actually something that was started by Parliament rather than the government. Um, it's fine. I, I completely retract that then, Ms. Boyd. That's I was all right. not I just, trying to take credit for the government okay. over what something. I was just naming the inquiries. That's fine. The question was, what have you been doing um, personally, individually, as Minister and Member of Cabinet, um, to directly respond to the issue? Ms. Boyd, those inquiries, as you said, are rightly taking place. I think it's really important that they take place and that, that we await those findings. In terms of my own personal responsibility, my door is always open and anyone that knows me yep. in this place knows that I am a very big supporter of women. And if there are any issues that are ever brought to me, I will continuously make sure that women are supported, that women are looked after and that appropriate behaviour occurs at all times. I am resolute on that and my experience and my track record speaks highly for that. I've encouraged all staff to participate in the Broderick report. I've ensured that my chief of staff has made sure that all of my staff have report have contributed to that. I have made sure across my ministerial colleagues and I have raised that in cabinet that everybody needs to contribute to that report. People should be able to speak freely and speak openly. I think it's very powerful that that's an independent report. I think that Elizabeth Broderick, who I've met with personally as well, is very well respected in this space. And I think that we should await the findings of that report. Or what, second? Uh, wasn't that... Mm. My turn now. Oh, sorry, uh, that's, why I, that's why I said four to... Cross bench time would be 20 minutes. Yeah. No, oh, no, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15 minutes. Uh, 15 minutes. Uh, okay. And Kate said you were doing 10 minutes worth. And when we just passed the, the 10 minutes, I went like that, four minutes. That was four minutes left, so I thought you were going to jump in. Right. No. Okay. Apologies. So 15 minutes. We're doing, in we're we're doing 15 minutes a day. No. Yeah. Mr. Yep. Chairman, well, um, Ms. 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 Tanya Smith, uh, Smythe, in your um, in your uh, your answer to my colleague Rose Jackson, you said that two of the eight staff in Women New South Wales are working on quote events and communications. Is that correct? Yes, correct. So, 25 percent of the people employed by Women New South Wales are working on events and communications. 
Minister, do you think that's an appropriate allocation of resources when there are so many press pressing issues involving women, such as gender pay gap, such as superannuation gaps, such as childcare? Minister Sikord, one of the events that we're starting, and you may not be aware that it's Women's Week next week, yeah, I am and we're aware. actually I am we aware actually of that. run okay. Well, I, I beg your pardon then, but we're actually running a huge program of events for women, and we're actually running. I think it will be actually. I can confirm that it will be the biggest women's awards that we have ever run in New South Wales before. That takes a lot of logistics and a lot of organising, and every single member of Parliament, regardless of their colour, nominates a woman for Woman of the Year awards, and they. Bring Bring them, and we and we discuss. Regardless of their colour, what do you mean? I mean, sorry, different political party. Oh, I'm That's sorry, I thought you were talking about something. Okay. Oh okay. no, Mr. Sorry. Sikord, sorry. you know that I uh, wouldn't. I was Mr. just saying that regardless oh. of your political party, oh, okay. you are nominating a woman for the Woman of, of the Year awards, and those are really important things to be able Thank to you, do. Minister. Minister. And I look forward to seeing you at the awards. Thank you, Minister. Um, a quick question now: Can you guarantee that all hospitals, MPSs, and emergency departments outside of Sydney, Wollongong, and Newcastle? have doctors on duty 24-7. Now, this goes to evidence provided to the Rural Health Inquiry, where we had hospitals in New South Wales, emergency departments, that did not have a doctor on duty. Can you guarantee that there are doctors on duty January the 1st, 2020, to March the 2nd, 2022? On duty, Mr. Saccord, could you clarify I mean, what you physically, mean by on duty? When I say duty, I mean physically in a hospital. So, no, Mr. I don't Support, mean on the telephone. as you would know, I think, because of your experience in being in opposition in health for quite a number of years, that you would know that in terms of it, that in some of our hospitals, people aren't doctors aren't on duty actually on site. Yep. They are they are working in their general practice and they are on call and they are called in. So there is still access to a doctor right. that happens. Okay, so it's very straightforward. Can you take it on notice if you're unable to answer? No, January Mr. Support, the first, it's not. It's January not that I am unable to answer. What I have said to you is that you... I know exactly what you're trying to do here. Very clearly. And I'm trying to prove well, that there are no, hospitals without doctors. Well, no, you're trying to be doctors. tricky, and that's, that's disingenuous. But we know that there are doctors that are available that do not actually sit at the hospital, but they run their private practices, and they are on call and available to the hospital. Thank you for that answer, Minister. Minister, I want to take you as in your dual capacity as rural health, but also as Minister for Mental Health. You'd be aware that the Premier's priority um, is called Towards Zero Suicides, has set a target to reduce the rate of suicides in New South Wales by 20% by 2023 as a first step towards the journey of Towards Zero Suicides. In 2017, it was 10.9 per 100,000 people. Is the rate of suicide attempt or deaths in involving young people increasing or decreasing in New South Wales? In terms of young people, Mr. Saccord, as you um, would or may or may not be aware, we now have a suicide monitoring system in New South Wales, which gives us uh, very up-to-date data on a month-to-month -month basis. If I could just preempt this by saying, Mr. Saccord, as well, that any death by suicide is an absolute tragedy. So what we have seen is we have seen um, numbers within within that happen. Your specific question for me was if I had seen an increase in young people in suicide. We actually last year saw a decrease in young people that were suiciding, which is very good news indeed. We actually saw an 11% decrease in young people suiciding. So how are we tracking on the Premier's priority to reduce suicide deaths by 20% by 2023? How are we tracking towards that? So we had, a, as I said, in young people, we had a de decrease this year and we had a decrease the year before. Yeah. But I think that in terms of uh, where we are, we are tracking in a very favourable position, Mr. Saccord, in terms of those numbers and that data. But I will say that I, I have concerns in terms of going forward and in terms of a delayed um, response in terms of the mental health stress and stress that have been faced by our communities. But I will also say that when we were at the um, start of the COVID pandemic, so almost relatively about two years ago, we had uh, specialist people come out and say that they felt that they talked about a shadow pandemic, they talked about catastrophic rates of suicide in New South Wales. 
and we actually have not seen that. And, and that, that is not because I'm the Minister for Mental Health and it's not because it's the government, it's because we have the most amazing people working on the ground in terms of prevention and Thank in terms you. of the programs Thank that you. we're Thank running. You, and also, as you referred directly in your question to me about towards zero suicides, we've been able to take on a lot of new initiatives and new models of care. So things like the safe haven and the anecdotal evidence coming out of that, and particularly with the, with the safe haven in Western Sydney, is quite phenomenal in terms of decrease in presentation to emergency departments and also in terms of people saying that that actual moment of stepping into that safe haven has actually saved their life. Now, Minister, earlier you said that the number of suicides in New South Wales was decreasing. So this is New South Wales website, New South Wales Health .nsw.gov mental health resources publications sums report November 2021 mm. says January the 1st to November 30th 2021 there were 833 confirmed suicides in New South Wales that's actually an increase from 812 the same pre period a previous the previous year I have year. to correct you there Mr Sacord your direct question to me was about young people suicide my direct answer to you was that youth suicide had decreased you did not ask me about the general number of suicide I answered your question as you asked it okay well then I want I want to rephrase or re-ask the mm -hmm. question so in fact suicides tragically have increased in New South Wales not decreased well, Mr. Sikord, Based when you... Based on your own when data you, on your website that well, I look at. I'm right very at. well aware of the numbers. When you look at this, you have to look at this in, a, in, in over a period of time and you have to look at the trajectory. When we look at 20... So, say, the last three years, if we look at 2019, 2020, 2021, and where we've had our towards zero suicide strategy, yes, from 2020 to 21, 2021, there was an increase. But if you look at that compared to 2019 those numbers are not as high as what they were in 2019 and we have had this towards zero strategy in place with unprecedented challenges in terms of people's mental health and mental fitness. Now, are we on track to meet the Premier's target to reduce the rate by 20% by the end of next year? Are we on target to do that? I think that at the moment we are we are tracking well, but I, you know, I'm very cautious of trying to predict what's going to happen. We've put many, many programs in place, but we are struggling with unprecedented times in terms of the challenges. And when I look at what's unfolding in northern New South Wales, to say that that didn't concern me for people's mental health would, would not be correct. Now, what about the um, the funding of towards zero? Now, this is budget estimates, so I'd like to know. Yay! Will <laughs> the funding for towards zero initiative be renewed when it expires this year? So, Mr. Secord, that will be part of the budget process, and uh, and I will be um, putting that. And I would advise to watch this space. Um, Minister, now I want to take you to another area that's um, involving mental mental health, but an overlap with the health system. And that's the area of seclusion mm -hmm. and restraint. Mm -hmm. Is the KPI, tar KPI target for the average duration of seclusion in New South Wales less than four hours? We would like to see no seclusion and restraint in an ideal world, but this is a situation that is used in terms of a clinical decision at the time. Yeah. And obviously the safety and wellbeing of patients and staff is absolutely paramount in this and that um, we, you know, seclusion and restraint should only be used as a last resort. Yep. Uh, the latest BHI um, report shows that the vast majority of episodes of care in acute mental health units did not have a seclusion or restraint event in the October over to December period. So those numbers do differ slightly um, with the BHI New South Wales Health because we've now incorporated Northern um, Beaches Hospital into that reporting as well. But right. the figures show a, um, uh, it'll be included in that and they show 96.6% of acute mental health episodes of care occurring in specialised acute mental health inpatient units. But we saw from the from the quarter from October to December, New South Wales Health improved across all indicators for seclusion and restraint compared to the July to suspend, September 2021 quarter. Um, Ms. Koff, in last year, you actually two years ago, two consecutive reports, you said that uh, Concord Hospital, which had the um, longest seclusion and restraint of any hospital in Sydney. 
you said it was an outlier. That was your direct quote. Um, in fact, I don't know why Concord number was so high. I'm happy to take the notice to find out because I think we need to explore it because it does look, quote, an outlier. Do you still hold that view and why almost three years later that restraints are up to 10 hours at that particular hospital? I'll ask Dr. Murray Wright because when that was raised uh, at previous budget estimates, obviously it warranted significant investigation and... Uh, You're preempting my second and third question. So Mr. Wright, if you could fall into those questions, so I'll ask, was it just an outlier, which is obviously not after the third report, and what is being done about that, and is it acceptable, and why is it occurring at Concord Hospital? Thank you, Mr. Dr. Wright. Thanks, Mr. Saccord. Um, I think um, an outlier is a kind of a technical definition. It's literally, statistically, an outlier um, in terms of its relationship to um, the other figures. So I, I don't take any, and I don't um, attach any other meaning than to the fact that when we look at when we look across the board, that performance at Concord is um, is you know, out of kilter with what's happening in other places. So that's what it means to me. Is, are we concerned about it? Yes, we are. Um, I think, as the minister said, um, we um, would like to see um, zero use of seclusion. Um, and if it's used, we would like to see it used for as little time as possible. And that's and and so the indicators are there to try and drive improvement. When we see instances of any facility which is um, struggling to meet those indicators, um, the, the process that that is being is is used in all of our health services is is that um, the, um, the there is a there is a um, an explanation sought from the district as to their understanding of what is driving it okay, because there are Dr. multiple Wright, Dr. Wright, what is driving it? What is happening at Concord? Now we have data here 24 hours and 21 minutes in Concord. What is happening to a person 24 hours in seclusion? Are they just shoved into a room? What is happening at Concord? This is the third consecutive report of this. It's not an outlier. What is happening at Concord yeah. Hospital? I'm sorry, sir. What is happening at that hospital? So I'll complete my answer. Um, and so what we ask for an explanation is the understanding from the local health district as to what is driving um, that performance. Um, it is then also followed up in the um, performance review process, which is a regular meeting between the executive leadership of the local health district and New South Wales Health. Um, and there are there are efforts to also, and, and so the, there Sir, are efforts. what are the reasons? I know Chair, you, um, okay, I, 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 would, I would just, I want to know the reasons. I understand, but Mr. Saccord, you must appreciate that this was a very complex question that you asked, and uh, Dr. Wright is providing a very detailed and very thorough response to your question. I think he needs to be allowed to complete that answer first before you ask any subsequent questions. I acknowledge questions. that, Mr. Fang. Thank okay. you. I acknowledge that. Um, it, it is. It is. There aren't simple answers to this, Mr. Saccord. Um, the you know, when you when you look at what are the what are the factors that lead to improvement in terms of seclusion and restraint, they are multifactorial, and and so I, I think to seek a single explanation of what is happening in a particular place um, is, is is going to be very. It's, it's an elusive thing to to pursue. Um, and in terms of the what are we trying to do? We are trying to understand. Um, Con Concord is a quite a complex um, mental health facility. It's a very large facility managing a, 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 a wide range of individuals with mental health problems, including having an, uh, an adult mental health inpatient, uh, sorry, a mental health intensive care unit. Um, that means that they um, are managing some of the most challenging and at, at times quite high risk individuals. And there, there is a utilisation of um, seclusion as a way to keep that person, other patients and staff safe. Um, and I ha have regular um, instances of knowing what those challenges are, and I don't think we should underestimate what an invidious situation it is for the for the for both the staff and the consumers themselves in some of those situations. All of the facilities in um, New South Wales that have mental health intensive care units um, are 
somewhat outlying in terms of the seclusion rates, and that is a function of this very challenging, very difficult situation they drive. I would add, though, and, and I'm sorry to go on, but I would add that it's not just a case of um, trying to understand what is happening, but trying to offer um, the strategies which help lead to improvements. Um, and so we have funded the Mental Health Patient Safety Program through the Clinical Excellence Commission over the last couple of years. It's specific arose out of the seclusion review in 2017 as a way to address the importance of trying to help the staff and their managers um, to Im improve practice in the multiple ways that lead to a difference with seclusion and restraint. It's a long way from over. It's still a problem. Yes, it concerns me. Yes, we're still following up on it. Um, and, um, and, and we will continue to do so until we, until we see these, these figures improve. Dr. Dr. Wright, after the break, I will return to this for your benefit. I will return to questioning in this area. Hi, Femin. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Minister, I just want to turn to uh, the situation regarding community mental health services in Griffith and the Murrumbidgee. Mm -hmm. In an interview with ABC Riverina on the 21st of February, um, you did say that there was no wait list for community health services in Griffith and the Murrumbidgee. Is that correct? What I said was that there were no wait lists at Griffith Community Health, Ms. Femin. So, are you aware of the um, extraordinary wait lists for mental health services in the area? I am, I am aware of uh, pressure for mental health services, but my comment, and it is still the case to this day, is that there is no wait list at Griffith Community Health. So, G Griffith Community Health has mental health services available for anybody who wants it, is that correct? Then? At Griffith Community Mental Health, that's correct, at, there's no waiting list. At Griffith Community Health. So I, I have a um, case study uh, here from uh, somebody who has, has agreed for their, their situation to be um, made public in, in, this, in this instance. So it's a Griffith resident, Bree Hansen, who said that she was trying to find mental health support in Griffith. She was trying to find clinical psychologists, psychiatrists. She said that there is a lack of them in Griffith. If there is one, you are paying an arm and a leg and that she currently has to see a psychiatrist from Sydney via telehealth. So the Griffith Community Mental Health Service can't can't provide Bree with what she's after in this instance? Well, that's a question that we'd have to ask Bree, and I would ask that you raise those issues with me and, and my office so that we can direct Bree and see if there's any other ways that we can help her access those services that she needs. And, and in saying that, you know, one of the things that we've seen with COVID as well is that the use of virtual and telehealth has been really effective in terms of mental health and being able to do that. And I mean, you know, I, I've helped many people that contact my office in terms of accessing services, and I'm very happy to do that. So most of them are telehealth services, are they? No, no, they um, a whole different... The, the thing with the mental health response is that what suits you may not suit me and it may not suit someone else. So it's about finding that service and finding that pathway that's appropriate for that person to be able to access. That, that's what's really important here. So there's a, there are an extraordinary number of people, though, who were transferred from Griffith Hospital to Wagga for mental health care. It is a situation in that local health district which there is a demand for mental health services that currently isn't being met. But you've just you just talked about two different things there. You're talking about a demand for mental health services and then you're talking about mental health beds. So when we look at beds and, and acuity, we absolutely need to have mental health beds. But what's really important is that we have those services on the ground that are helping people because most of the time, and particularly in the case of young people, and, and Dr. Wright can talk to this because he's the professional, is that you know what we're looking at is keeping people out of those acute admissions because often an admission to an acute mental health unit for a young person can actually be detrimental to their health outcomes. It's a very big consideration. So we try to support people as much as we can in the communities to ensure that they get the best health outcomes. So to just be talking about beds is not the answer when we're talking about mental health services. They're absolutely an important part of it. But the so really important part is making sure that those services exist in the community 
community. So and, and also too, Ms. Finn, I would say to you as well, there's almost, I think, 30 full-time equivalents that work out of Griffith Community Mental Health. So what are you doing, Minister, to try and attract more psychologists and psychiatrists into the regional areas of, um, say, the Murrumbidgee Local Health District? Yeah, yeah. Look, we have got the psychiatry workforce plan that, that we continue to work through. We are looking at, you know, in terms of that, that is, I mean, we've talked about this before, it's a nationwide shortage in terms of psychiatrists and in psychologists as well. I, I want to see more people be able to train locally. We're seeing some really great results. I met someone the other day at the Griffith Country University Centre who's training to do his psychology degree, he wants to stay in Griffith, about growing your own. Another really positive result out of the Country University Centres that's happening. Uh, we have got a workforce plan that Phil and Murray can talk towards as well if, if, you, if you'd like that. And, you know, recently I opened the safe haven in Griffith as well that is just going to be a wonderful contribution to the services on the ground there. Spoke extensively with service providers uh, as I said before, and I alluded to with this safe haven model, I, I am I'm cautiously excited about the anecdotal results that we're getting already. Um, I was talking to a, a gentleman in Western Sydney who was an Iraqi refugee who found it very difficult to talk about his mental health challenges because of the cultural issues that that said during, and we opened that early during COVID. He spoke at the opening of that centre and said that walking through those doors, talking to the peer support workers, Workers saved his life and I think by looking at these different models of care that we're doing things like safe haven things like our towards zero suicide prevention strategy are all parts of the mix that, that we're looking at to make sure that we have a myriad of services that are providing services to the community and what I would say is that anyone that is in the ability to do so or who is approached by someone who is struggling to please make sure that they get the appropriate information that they need. Okay thank you I'll, I'll continue asking questions questions on this um, later this afternoon rather than going to the um, officials now, if that's okay. I wanted to turn to cancer um, treatments in the regions. We've heard cancer treatment, I should say, access to um, publicly funded cancer treatment. We've heard a lot about this during the regional health inquiry. Um, there are a couple of, um, again, people who have contacted my office with concerns about lack of um, support. One example is a Aboriginal man who has prostate cancer living in Condobolin. There is a treatment for prostate cancer which is only available for a procedure which is only available for private patients. He's, he's been told that the prostate cancer operation he will have to have in the public system will leave him incontinent and impotent for the rest of his life and he'll have to wear a nappy. To get it through the private system means he won't be, um, he won't be incontinent and impotent but that's going to cost about $36,000 which he doesn't have, he's not privately insured. Is this acceptable in regional New South Wales that we have people having to accept an operation, a man that will have to accept an operation if he wants to fight his cancer in the public system that will leave him incompetent, sorry, incontinent and impotent? Um, impotent? Ms Furman, I, I really would need to see the details of that particular case. I'm, I'm very aware as a cancer nurse in my previous life what the potential side effects and complications are of, of a surgery that is often very severe. Um, I, I have a, a very, very strong knowledge of prostate cancer and those consequences. My, my father himself had it. But I will say to you that I cannot address that issue raised here today in budget estimates about a clinical pathway and clinical decision and to suggest that someone is being offered substandard care is something that I really would urge you very strongly to bring forward to me. I have written to the Minister, uh, Minister Hazard, about this right, in well, if you could uh, please January. If today um, get that, I, I would appreciate to say that. I will ask Dr Lyons as well to comment on that on that particular case. I'm happy, particular happy to make some general comments 
comments, I mean, I can't comment on the specifics that you've raised because I'm not aware of the clinical details, but um, to suggest that the services or procedures that are offered in the public sector for cancer care are second rate, I would reject completely. And we have world-class cancer care, and in fact, the outcomes for our cancer patients across the board have been improving in, and are uh, com comparable with international uh, standards for outcomes. The issues around the treatment for prostate cancer are very challenging in that those complications you refer to are complications that can occur, f occur from any type of surgery on the prostate. So to guarantee that they wouldn't occur, I think, uh, is, uh, is somewhat a, a mystery to me as to why somebody would be told that they could be guaranteed they won't have those outcomes and then assured that they would have those outcomes if they were treated in the public sector. It seems very strange to be uh, told uh, those things as part of a clinical consultation. All right, well, I'll follow that up and, and come back this afternoon if I need to. So just sticking with cancer services. So are you aware, Minister, that cancer patients in the Murrumbidgee again are left with $480 of out-of-pocket expenses for a course of radiation from the private providers, which is Riverina Cancer Care Centre in Wagga? Look, I am aware of those issues, Ms. Feminine, and actually um, Dr. McGurr raised with them with me only last week. Was last week the sitting week or the week before? Last he, week. Was. He raised, sorry, raised it with me on the Thursday of the, of the sitting week, and I endeavoured to tell him that I would investigate that. I, I will say, um, as my days of Director of Cancer Services in Southern New South Wales, I worked very closely with the Director at Murrumbidgee, and I do remember that there were issues around this and the, and the private provider and what's been organised and 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 dealt there but I have given Dr Joe my Dr Joe McGurr my word that I would investigate that I'm not sure if um, Dr Lyons wants to comment does that further. include the request by the cancer care centre the Riverina cancer care centre for the subsidy from the government I think they mm. have sought a $650,000 subsidy to ensure that there's a new radiation cancer facility at Griffith that it will be able to provide bulk build treatment yeah and I, I am aware of that issue too but to be just completely honest with you I haven't um, been able to investigate that as thoroughly so I, I would prefer not to comment on that but I would be I will definitely be looking into that I definitely um, the, the center also is federally funded and so there will be issues but it is on my list to follow up with the federal minister and I intend to do so I, I have a real passion and commitment to cancer services it's where I spent the bulk of my career and I am very much someone who lives by the public health system and that, that everyone should have access to that but in, well, in that vein, surely the Murrumbidgee Local Health District should be providing radiation cancer services directly to like in their public hospitals. Yes, but that was an agreement that was started with the Riverina Cancer Centre that was well before my time that I will have to look into. But, but, but the real issue here is that those services are there in that area. That's what we want to see. In terms of out-of-pocket... $480 cost to people. In, in terms of out-of-pocket expenses, that's something that I will have to look for, look to and, and compare right across the state. So I don't want to comment on that now to you because I don't have the accurate information myself and that would be wrong of me. So I will be looking into that and investigating that. Okay, I do understand that the government has has been uh, considering this, that a decision was made in mid-January as to whether they were going to provide that $650,000 subsidy to, to... So my understanding is that New South Wales Health and the district are reviewing the proposal. Okay, all right, thank you. I just wanted to... Uh, let's just stick with the uh, and Bidgey till my time's up. If we could mm. just go to Leeton Hospital. Mm. Um, at the New South Wales Rural Health Inquiry, it was revealed that the government spent $3 million upgrading a 66-bed Leeton Hospital operating theatre. Um, so why... We also heard that the operating theatre hasn't been used for the past five years. Why is that? Uh, in terms of Leeton Hospital in the last five years, Dr Lyons, would you like to answer that? I haven't got the specifics around Leeton Hospital's operating theatre in front of me, but if a theatre is not being used in a facility where one was built, it'll be because there aren't the clinicians who can provide those sorts of services available to deliver those services locally. So in August, the Murrumbidgee LHD announced it had called off the search for a uh, chief medical officer in Leeton Hospital. Do you know why the search has been called off? I don't have any details about that. I'm sorry. Could you get back to me, maybe? For we can take, find we can out take maybe that question on notice. Take on notice. Yeah. So the... 
I also understand that the phrase Leeton District Hospital has been deleted from the Murrumbidgee Local Health Service website. It's now called Leeton Health Service. Is this a deliberate um, strategy to, to downgrade the Leeton Public Hospital to a, to a health service? Not at all. I mean, where those uh, that terminology is used is because it's usually used to encompass that there are more than just the hospital services provided in those towns, that there are community services and other services available to the community. So it's about the fact that it's a broader service than just a district hospital. It wouldn't but be a downgrade at all. Also happening at the same time as the as the search has been called off for a chief medical officer in Leeton Hospital. Well, let us find the, the details the has, of that. Has and perhaps it's been extensively advertised. We don't know, so we won't That's comment and we'll take that on notice. Leeton community, though, that they, the, 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 the government's given up on them in finding a oh, chief that, medical that's officer just, for that's just not, not, That is just not Chair. correct. That's I'm just trying to, you know, Take a point of order on that. I think, I, I think uh, we've had a, a request for a point of order to be taken, so I can... Uh, thank you, Chair. Look, um, you know, I, I note the, um, the respectful uh, mm -hmm. conduct of the, the inquiry uh, into budget estimates to to this point, but I think the phrasing of that question was possibly uh, not helpful to uh, the members I'll that rephrase. are here, okay. but also to the members of the leading community. So I just think that we could actually be a bit more... I'll rephrase. Uh, thank you, Ms. Will, will the Minister guarantee to the Leighton community that, the, that New South Wales Health will renew its push to find a Chief Medical Officer for Leighton Hospital? What, what my guarantee is to every single community in rural and regional New South Wales, Ms Fairman, is that I want to see the best services provided locally as safely and as best to the ability to ensure that we get really good health outcomes. As you know from seeing on the inquiry for an extensive period of time, there have been issues with the medical workforce going out to rural and regional New South Wales. It is my job, and I look forward to the suggestions from the inquiry, to make sure that we can encourage doctors and we can see that increase in rural and regional New South Wales. That is my absolute commitment to every single community in rural and regional New South Wales. Thank you. Um, Minister Taylor, Minister Taylor, since the election, the election of Dr. Michael Holland, community champion in Bega, have you been briefed on the plans for the Urabadella Hospital? I haven't had extensive briefs, but Mr. Minister Hazard did announce that the Eurobadella Hospital mm -hmm. would go ahead during that uh, in recent in recent times. I understand he was down there and he did that. Um, have you sought any briefings? Or you, you earlier today made a great point about being the Minister for Regional Health. Mm -hmm. So, have you sought any briefings or updates on the status of Mr. Of Minister Hazard's promise on being on um, Eurobadella Hospital? Look, I'm in discussions all the time about uh, we have a very big health infrastructure build going on in, in rural and regional New South Wales, as you'd be aware, unprecedented amount of, of building in terms of infrastructure, in terms of those services. And where does, I, I'm very, I, and where does I, it fit into that? Sorry, can I And just where does finish? it fit into that? No, no, no. I'm asking no, I know, very but specific. I'd like to finish my question. No, but I'd like, a, I'd like an answer yeah. on this hospital. I don't want broad speaking yeah. statements. I'm going to raise I want an answer now, on please. this hospital. Uh, a specific question, but the point of order, so sorry, yeah, sorry, so. Ms. Fang, Mr. Fang. Chair, um, for the benefit of Hansard, I think in particular we need to have one speaker at a time. I think that uh, talking over the minister when she's answering a question is unhelpful for, for Hansard, but also for those people that are viewing today. So I just ask that um, while the minister is speaking and she's addressing the question, that uh, she be permitted to finish before the board record asks for any clarification, which of course he's entitled to do. Proceed, Minister. Thank you. So thank you very much, Mr Chair. I appreciate that. Uh, so as we've said, the government will commence the construction of the new $260 million Eurobadala Health Service during this term of government, and the new Eurobadala Regional Hospital is anticipated to be commissioned in 2025. Has the purchase of the new hospital site been finalised? In terms of the new hospital site? As the uh, site my understanding is it's working through the process at the moment, Mr. Sacord, so it hasn't been finalised at this point. Right, it hasn't been finalised. Thank you for the clarity. Um, Minister, mm -hmm. can you give a commitment, and if you're unable to do this, maybe the health officials can, that when the hospital does open, it'll be fully open, fully at level four? Not some parts but everything from day one will be level four. Now, that was a commitment from Minister Hazard. If, would you like to comment on that, Dr. Lyons? 
If that was the commitment from Minister Hazard, that's the commitment from Minister Hazard. I mean, so I don't think there's more to, for us to add to that. Level four. Commitment to level four. So no weasel words. It will be a lot. Hanging down there. Sort of, sort of. Oh, would you like to answer the question, oh, Minister Mallard? Thank you. Okay. Oh, I'd like to take you to Shoalhaven Hospital. Shoalhaven Hospital subacute mental health ward only reopened in February after it was closed for COVID repurposing. What happened to those individuals who needed to be treated in a subacute ward? As you'd be aware, Mr. Sicord, it was a subacute ward yep. that was shut to be repurposed for our response to COVID. Yep. Those patients would have been looked after, diverted, either looked after in the community or looked after in other facilities to ensure that their best health outcomes were reached. This is this is what happens when you need to repurpose and you need to respond to COVID. And what an incredible job our our health staff have done when they did that. A lot of I think a few patients went to Shell Harbour. And, and it all was managed very well. Minister, why is Shoalhaven Hospital the worst performing emergency department in the local health district? In fact, one of the most under pressure emergency departments outside of Sydney, Wollongong and Newcastle. In terms of What's Shoal happening down there? Why is that the case? Shoalhaven's a, a, a very busy hospital. We've got very busy hospitals uh, across many of our regional communities, Mr. Saccord. So uh, I, I'm not sure where you're alluding to in terms of the pressure and where you're getting that advice from. Well, from the BHI, the, the Bureau of Health Information. Oops. It says it's the worst performing emergency department in the Illawarra Shoalhaven LHD in terms of treatment starting on time. Also, the transferring of patients from paramedics to the emergency department. In fact, it takes up to 30 minutes in some cases to transfer a patient from the ambulance to the emergency department. What's going What's going on at Shoalhaven Hospital? So, so what will be happening at Shoalhaven is uh, with any hospital that's uh, struggling with its performance, it'll be about the activity that's coming through the emergency department, the well, acuity. It's the patient's of the, fault. No, no, it's not at all. The acuity of the, okay. acuity of the patients uh, and the, the ability of the hospital to ensure that they have the staff available to meet those needs around the clock and uh, to have the ability to ensure that they can be uh, provided definitive treatment, whether that's in the Shoalhaven Hospital or whether they require transfer to another hospital. So we do from time to time have challenges with workforce, uh, particularly for those hospitals that are on the periphery uh, and uh, geographically, the, the Shoalhaven would fit into that category. I know that the, uh, the chief, executive, uh, chief executive of the Illawarra Shoalhaven Local Health District is working tirelessly to ensure that the workforce is available. Uh, and those issues are ultimately addressed, as you can see across the state, um, over time, the emergency department performance in New South Wales has been one of the best performances in the country and we've met many of the challenges that we've seen in terms of that ever increasing workload of patients coming through. Just prior to COVID uh, we were seeing increases in emergency department activity of six and eight percent and we've raised this issue with the Commonwealth because what we're seeing is these changes occurring right across all of our hospitals and what it indicates to us is that the people who are coming to our emergency departments aren't able to access care anywhere else. And so we are the safety net, we are the place that's always open, we are the place that provides care and we do everything we can to ensure that people who turn up to our services are treated with the appropriate uh, waiting times and access uh, depending on their clinical conditions and they receive the optimal outcomes from that care. Um, and also no, too, Mr. Saccord, we the government has committed to the $434 million redevelopment of Shoalhaven District Memorial Hospital. And in November 2020, we announced that the project would be fast-tracked, bringing the total funding of the redevelopment to $438 million. So another you. thing where we're delivering. Thank you. Mr. Chair, one last quick question. Dr. Lyons, in your answer, you said that um, Shoalhaven Hospital was, quote, on the periphery. Periphery of what? So when you start to look at the geography of the metropolitan area, uh, as you're going out increasingly away from the centre of Sydney, you start to get uh, more difficulty recruiting staff into those environments. And that's what we've seen right across the state, as you've heard in the rural and regional inquiry. The further you get away from a larger metropolitan setting or from the coast, you find it difficult. Now Shoalhaven is on the coast, but it is at the southern end of the district and further away from the centres where the, the greater population is. So you find it hard 
harder to recruit uh, certain types of staff into those environments. It's been compounded by the fact, as we've heard from our chief executives, that many of those services uh, rely on the fact we recruit uh, doctors from overseas as part of the uh, training for emergency positions, and those positions haven't been able to be filled because of the closure of international borders. And the other issue has been that the fact that locums who often fill in for short-term periods in those hospitals have been less uh, available or less uh, amount of times as well because there have been less of those available because of uh, uh, state borders being shut uh, and also the issue around New Zealand and the flow of, of people between the two countries. Thanks, uh, Minister. Minister, on notice, will you be able to provide the committee a, a list of exactly which local health districts you have responsibility for? Well, certainly that would be the nine rural and regional local health districts, Mr Chair. Well, but I'm happy on, to write on, those On out. notice, I'll get you to, to provide the, the full list of those. In regards to those nine, um, are, are there any that actually have a, a situation whereby they pick up what might be seen starts perhaps in a metropolitan area and then moves into what mm. we generally understand as a regional area? Yeah, absolutely, and that's why we're working through all of so, that. So which ones would they be? Well, you'd look, at the, you'd look at some which borders on the Blue Mountains as well and then into the Southern Highlands as well. So with respect to those two then, um, so you'll give me the full nine. So if we take those two as a subset of the nine, who's going to have responsibility for those local health districts in terms of oversight as, as ministerial responsibility? Mr. Mr Chair, I am the Minister for Regional Health in New South Wales. As sits within this government at the moment, there are clusters. And in this cluster now, instead of one minister, there sits two. As I have said, I think, three times on the record today, there are senior lead ministers in that cluster. The lead, if I may finish, the lead minister is Minister Hazard. Thank you. I have worked very closely with Minister Hazard over the last three years in mental health. And question, we have done that very effectively, and we will continue to do that. So minister Hazard, responsibility for those two. No, Mr Chair, the, you, you, you know, with respect, please okay. don't put words into my mouth. I am answering in the clearest way possible. And what I have said to you is that we, are, we have not finalised the distribution of that, but that, that the way we sit in this health cluster, and regardless if we did, I would seek advice from Minister Hazard on numerous occasions, as I always have, and as I will continue to do so, because the best interests of patient care is where we are all going from, not about who has responsibility and who wants to do what. This is about the people of New South Wales. Well, well, Minister, could I just say, on the issue of who has responsibility and who says what, that, they are two significant issues that there is a lot of interest in, in terms of this new appointment of you as a minister for, for, for regional health. Mm. So don't underestimate the significance of those two questions in, as we look forward, the respective responsibilities between you and Minister Hazard. Yeah, exactly the same as it has with mental health, which I have well, sat on this Budget Estimates Committee for the last three years. Well, uh, am I to take from what you've said that in terms of looking at your responsibility in this area, um, that, that we are to use the analogy of the way in which you have dealt with mental health as a way in which you will deal with regional health. Is that what you're saying? I don't know how much clearer I can make this, Mr Chair, but I'll say it again, that we are working through in terms of the processes through the internal uh, thing with the Ministry in terms of how that's going to look with the regional health pillar with, with that internal structure. But what I would say is that you or any of your colleagues have issues to do with anything in regional and rural health, that you come and you raise them with me and my office and that we will deal with those accordingly. Which brings me to this question that uh, very shortly we have Minister Hazard, uh, his budget estimates uh, coming up next week. Um, is it the case that on questions to do with matters uh, in the nine uh, LHDs that you say you have responsibility for, that, that in fact we, we ought not or should not direct questions to Minister Hazard? <laughs> I, would, I would never presume to suggest which questions you could defer to Mr. Minister Hazard, and I'm sure that he would take all of them um, and answer them in the appropriate manner, and I think that's a, really a matter for you, what you choose to do well, there. Well, uh, if I've got a, a constituent issue in a regional area as raised with me, um, are you saying, uh, in from your evidence you've given, that under the new uh, arrangement, that, that in fact I, I need to direct that question to yourself 
uh, as opposed to Minister Hazard? What I would say to you, Mr Donnelly, is I would very much welcome any inquiry that you have about any constituent that sits within regional rural New okay. South Wales to my office. If, if in the fact or the event that that issue was raised with Minister Hazard's office, Minister Hazard's office will share that with my office and we will make sure that we get an appropriate response to the person, not worrying about wh whose office or who's in charge. Right. Our officers speak multiple times, multiple days. I speak to Minister Hazard multiple times a day. I'm sure. On the issue of the appointments to the boards, the local health districts, uh, our understanding clearly is that with respect to the signing off of those appointments to those boards, including the nine that you have responsibility for, the signing off is done by Minister Hazard and will be done by Minister Hazard into the future, not yourself. Do you have a different understanding? Well, actually, Minister Hazard and I have discussed that and we'll sign that off jointly. So, with respect to the nine LHDs mm. uh, that, uh, that you have responsibility for, the appointments to the LHD boards will be joint appointments. In other words, you and Minister Hazard will... I use a vernacular, sign the paperwork. Is that what you're saying? So what will happen that we've discussed recently, and there was a case recently, as I said, I've had the portfolio for 11 weeks, is that often those things in any capacity are, are jointly signed off and, and jointly discussed, but those recommendations come up through the ministry and they'll be signed off. Well, how could they be jointly signed off there if there was only Because there's one? two spots for two signatures on the brief. No, 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 no. If up until now there was just one minister... That's minister right. Desert. And now there's two. <laughs> So are you saying potentially there is, there is the option with respect to... Oh, just to be clear, so with the nine LHDs, as we proceed forward from today, or from your appointment, that there'll be dual signatures on those appointments? Is that what you're saying? OK. Can I just uh, go to the question uh, of the uh, development of the forthcoming uh, state budget, and specific, specifically the health budget? Mm -hmm. um, uh, what input are you having uh, over the development of the health budget for 2022-23? Having a significant input. What is that? Well, I'm not going to discuss budget bids here and budget No, no, I'm not asking you to, but... but uh, I'll be putting proposals forward as is the appropriate way for any minister to put those forward. Right, so you'll be through putting... Through the appropriate budget processes and cabinet to, to processes. To Minister Hazard. I will be putting forward budget bids, as I have in mental health, as I did in regional youth, as I do in women, and as I now will in regional health. And Minister Hazard and I will discuss those, I hope. I hope to seek his advice, his contribution with his wealth of experience, his wealth of knowledge to put that forward. Uh, but in terms of the process, uh, if no, I can okay. maybe just explain it to you to no, elaborate, no, you've, you've each minister that. is no, 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 responsible to put it. forward their budget bids. You'll be submitting it to Mr. Hazard. I understand what you've said. No, I'm not... I don't think you understand, respectfully. Well, what what respect happens when you're a minister in the government you are responsible for putting forward your budget bids Correct. according to your portfolio. I am the Minister for Regional Health. For the junior minister. I will be putting forward... Yeah, sorry. Oh, I, I, you know, chair, you know, if, I'm, if I'm that's what you board. want to play... No, no, seriously, if you want to try and demean me and my role I'm as the Minister for Regional Health in that capacity as the chair of this committee, I'm going to let that go. But I would, I'm trying I would to suggest minister, that you think about you know, what you're minister, saying. You have provided very little information to this committee this morning and we, our time's about to expire relatively soon. You've had the whole morning to explain to the committee what essentially is the role that you have as a regional health minister. You've had multiple questions directed to you to help us understand what that role is. And you've come up with diddly squat. All we know that you are, have been appointed as the regional health minister. There are nine LHCs that you have some responsibility for, but we don't know precisely what they are. The only thing you've told us in regards to those LHDs is that with respect to future appointments to the board, uh, you'll be a co-signatory. That's all we have found out from you this morning about what your role is going to be in regards to the Regional Health Minister. Mr Donnelly, I would dispute that, and perhaps it's the way that you choose to listen and interpret that, but I would, I would just point out to you 
that I am the fourth most senior minister in this government in New South Wales. I am the most senior woman in this government in New South Wales. Got nothing to do so with to gender, try and patronise me gender. in that way is it's, unacceptable. No, Minister, you don't play the gender card. It's got nothing to do with gender. Chair, oh. Chair. I've indicated to you, Chair. you've had the morning, you've had the morning to explain what essentially your role is and you've utterly failed. That's what I'm I saying. would ask you to withdraw that comment about me playing the gender card, Mr Chair. I would you're ask one, you Minister, to withdraw. You're the one Are you choosing it. not to withdraw that? Uh, Minister, you raised it. No, you did. No, Minister, you, you put it on the table. said no, no, no. I was playing the gender card. Because you put it on the table, Minister. You said you're the most senior female. You put that on the table. And you said I was playing the gender card. Word. I was simply stating the facts. No, Minister, you put that on the table deliberately. Chair, I'm going to have to raise a point of order sure. about you, and I think that that's difficult, obviously, in the circumstances. No, please proceed. I want to ask a question. No, I was going to call a point of order as well and support the no. minister's request that the, 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 the accusation of playing the gender card um, be withdrawn. Chair. Uh, well, um, yes or no? It's the will of the committee. Because uh, just the saying she's the most senior woman in this uh, government is not playing the gender card with respect, Chair. No, uh, to the point of order, I sat here quietly, didn't intervene, didn't, interge didn't interject, listened carefully, and I tend to agree with the Chair that she was, she was, play she was doing exactly as the Chair suggested. Well, uh, oh. seeing as I've Thanks called that, 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 I've, that. <laughs> I've called the point of order and... Um, I think some of the commentary that was made um, of late was unhelpful, and I think that um, on reflection, Chair, you may view back uh, this footage or read back the Hansard, and you may regret some of the the, the commentary. Um, and so I think that the Minister's giving you an opportunity now to uh, address that um, in this forum, and I think you might be... Um, it might be helpful to you to, to be able to... Um, address it as the minister has requested. If, if the minister took offence, uh, I'll withdraw it. But I simply say the minister put it on the table. Wow. Chair, I think... Um, I, the, the, I, chair, the chair withdrew. No, Let's no, 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 no. I, the I, chair withdrew. No, that was the point of what the chair conditionally withdrew. Just withdraw it and let's move on. You're not the deputy president. Uh, so. I, I, I'm very clear in my response. No, no, I understand. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'll just yeah, let no, I raise that's it. That's fine. The minister deliberately put it into the into the, her response, and I responded to it. It's got nothing to do with gender. Chair, some of the other commentary that was made that I, I think was probably, you may reflect and find, sure. but was uh, commentary about... Um, the way that the minister had addressed her role, and I and I would raise the point that it's it's not the minister's job to explain her role. It, the questions come from you and the crossbench, and so she addresses the questions that you put to her. I, I think if you look back at the hand side, you will see that every single one of those questions has been addressed. If there is not clarity in the minds of the opposition and the crossbench as to her role. It would be down to the questions that you asked, not the answers the minister gave. So to then blame the minister for those answers, it, I, I thought was actually incorrect as well, but that was something that I was going to raise as well. Sure. Uh, well, the position is uh, that with respect to this morning, there's been multiple questions to you, Minister, in regards to trying to understand your role, your new role, important role. So we have a clear understanding. Thank you for saying that it's an important role. Unequivocally. No, there's no question about that. Uh, that's what we are trying to do, to understand with some precision that role so we don't find ourselves in a situation whereby matters are being taken off to the health minister when in fact they should be being directed to you. That's what people have been actually actually asking me time and time again in the lead up to this hearing today. Can we get some absolute clarity about what the, the new role is? Now, Minister, that's not me saying that. That's many, many people asking the question. We're trying to get some clarity around what the role is. So we don't actually have this inability to be able to direct people stakeholders, whoever you might like to describe, community groups, to which minister? Now, all I'm trying to say is if your response is that there are nine LHDs that essentially are your bailiwick, well, that's what we take back to people and say. These are the nine LHDs that if you've got matters to do with health questions, health issues, they all go back to Minister Taylor. 
if that's what the position is. If Mr that's Chair, I have said numerous times during this inquiry, and Hansard will provide very clear evidence of that, that if you have an inquiry about rural and regional health matters, that you bring them to the regional health minister. I have said that numerous times today. Mm. How you choose to interpret that and then bring that back to this committee is a matter for you, but that will all be reflected not me. on Hansard it's today. It's not me at all. It's what people. I think all of are the comments asking. made today will be clearly reflected on Hansard, yes. and I look very forward to reviewing those. Uh, that's very good. And next week, when we have Minister Hazard, uh, we'll be putting to him the very clear demarcation that you've established today, and that is there are nine LHDs that you have responsibility for. And if we have matters to do with questions of health with respect to those, they are matters that we don't direct to him, but we have directed to you. I said to you very clearly, Mr Chair, that even if you did direct those questions, that our officers would communicate on that because that's what we do in government. Yes. And a lot of people will say to you as well that isn't it great that now we have two ministers in that cluster instead of just one. I look forward to continuing to work with Mr Hazard and I invite you to ask Mr Hazard any of those questions and I'm sure he will provide you with appropriate answers. Well, but going me, forward, no point in we work questions. very no, no, no. closely no. together no. and Mr. any no. questions that you have on regional rural health, you can direct to me. Well, that's the point. We just want that clarity. Well, that I can't say it any well, more times than what I, I have, can Mr only, Chair. I, I'll pass over when time's nearly expired, but you need to understand this is a very critical question that's being asked by a lot of people. To and have I have clarity answered around. it, Mr Chair. I have answered it. So it's the nine LHDs. We understand. I have answered your question numerous times. I understand. The nine LHDs. That's I the think position. this is the headline you want. Okay, uh, Thank you, uh, Minister. I just had some questions about paramedics now, after all that, which, um, <laughs> all right. Uh, uh, how long do I have? Yep, you have 15 minutes. Oh, okay. Interesting. Okay. Mm. I wanted to ask about patient transport services and the fact that um, I'm hearing um, from the Australian Par Paramedics Association who mm -hmm. are saying that a lot of their uh, members in regional New South Wales are transferring patients because there's not enough pa um, patient transport services, if you like, um, or pa patient transport officers. Mm -hmm. They're filling in the gap. I understand patient transport services don't run for 24 hours. They typically operate from 6am to 10pm or, or mid night. Um, we know that there's such a severe shortage of paramedics in um, regional areas. Have you got before you any kind of um, uh, brief on the lack of funding, firstly, for pa patient transport services? Mm -hmm. Do so you two aware different of that? things there. They are two different things. And paramedics. So yeah. can I go to paramedics first? OK. I, or do you want me to go? Doesn't matter as long as they... they OK. Yeah, you can I'll, see I'll their get, link. I'll get... You can um, see the link. Patient transport to, services Yes, I can. First. And I yes. think you're exactly right. And I think that <laughs> the difference with patient transport, obviously, is if people don't need that paramedic on board and that ambulance stuff, to be able to transport patients if they have a low acuity and it's safe to do so, we'll use patient transport services instead of an ambulance. In terms of paramedics, I recently um, went to the graduation and where we've seen, oh, I can't remember the exact numbers and I can't find the, um, the, where we had all of those new graduates, many of which are going into rural and regional communities. So I'm really excited about that. It was terrific to speak to them, terrific to hear about how they wanted to do that. And actually, a lot of them had done their final component, which is their practical component at the end of their four-year paramedicine degree actually in the region. So that was really fantastic. But in terms of um, patient transport and paramedic um, ambulance transport, Dr Lyons, would that come to you to... In terms of paramedic numbers, I, I might defer to Mr Minns. Uh, that would be the first... And then I can come back and talk about patient transport services. So... Uh, in a general sense, the government announced um, three years ago that they were going to enhance the paramedic workforce with 700 additional paramedics and 50 control centre staff. Uh, so in 2018-19, uh, 213 paramedics uh, were on boarded and 13 medical emergency call takers. And Is this for the whole state, sorry, Mr Mintz? Yeah, yeah. For the whole state. Thank you, yeah. But in that first tranche, that first year, um, 
there were additions in re regional settings, Belmont, Etalong, Evans Head, Toronto, Wagga Wagga, Bulleye, Dapto, uh, Bay and Basin and Berry. Um, in 2019-20, uh, 209 paramedics were brought on and a further 12 call takers. Yeah, yes, thank you. Maybe um, I'll get you to provide the rest on notice if, if that's okay, because okay, that, right. that is very useful. Um, one of the, the, the things I'm getting at with, with this question is um, studies have found, or I have a study in front of me into um, the Northern LHD that has found that investing more in tr patient transport services comes at a, um, that's uh, less cost to New South Wales Health than into more paramedics. You're aware of that as well. If the if New South Wales Health or the, the government invested more in patient transport services instead of taking up paramedics' time, that would actually be at a better cost to the budget than um, at less cost to the budget than increasing. Not saying not to increase paramedics, mm. but patient transport services are also need to to have more investment. Yeah. Uh, look, you're exactly right in terms of patient transport services, and that's why the investment is there, and that's why the decision is there. Because when you're taking ambulances, the decision is there. Sorry, well, years ago when we oh. started patient transport services, in terms of when we used to always transfer via ambulance, because you're taking those ambulances off the road, those trained paramedics in situations where that person doesn't need that level of care in terms of transport. Yes. So you're absolutely right. Does it make sense? Yes. Is it something we're very focused on? Absolutely. Well, it is. So just to, to uh, expand a little bit on patient transport, I mean, it's been in, uh, a significant investment in our system over many, many years and has increasingly been invested in. But what we look, look, there's a distinction between, as you know, the, the emergency response for paramedics and the need for them to be 24-7, and the work we do with our patient transport services, which is usually scheduled and organised, and is mostly focused around transporting patients between hospital services where they're already receiving care. So that usually is an organised approach and is organised between the receiving hospital and the hospital is sending the patient. So those arrangements usually occur during working hours or extended hours. They're not things that usually would run 24-7 or necessarily uh, overnight where there would be less requirement for those sorts of patient movements. So these things are monitored very closely. The investment that is made in patient transport services has continued to increase. That's because the activity of moving patients for definitive treatment to higher levels of care has increased over time. So we're very conscious about monitoring that and we don't want to use the ambulance service for things that it shouldn't be used for. We want to make sure that the, uh, that the response from the ambulances is available for local communities and they're not off doing a patient transport to a distant town. Chair, can I just raise a point, if that's okay? Um, I note that the time is now 12.45 and uh, the government was to reserve 15 minutes at the end. Now, I understand uh, Ms Fairman's only partway through her time. Um, I will foreshadow that the government will not ask their, their time and I think that um, perhaps given um, the, the debate that was happening earlier, that Ms Fairman's time could be allowed to be finished before we actually call an end to the hearing, if that's, if that's okay? I think it'd be Appreciate it. Th okay. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, Appreciate that. Okay, so I've got um, to continue the questions around um, paramedics. There's also, um, I understand that regional paramedics to train as extended care paramedics, mm -hmm. obviously very, very valuable uh, paramedics in the regions, have to be trained in Sydney. There's nowhere for paramedics to be trained as extended care paramedics outside of Sydney. Is that right? Well, do you know? I don't know the answer to them, I'm sorry. I have information before me. I'll just tell you what I have, which is that they are only trained at the Nepean Clinical School and Nepean Hospital. Um, that is an unacceptable situation, surely. You can imagine how difficult that is for so many regional paramedics to then choose if they wanted to become extended care paramedics. Again, we need more of them. They need to somehow 
make their way to Sydney to do that training. That's a huge barrier, Minister. Look, I, I am not completely sure. I take your word for it that that training isn't available and I appreciate and I do understand about the barrier about accessing that sort of education when you can't access it locally. What I will say, however, is that when you need that, that expert um, training and if it is in one place and that's where the majority of that training is going to take place and the majority of the exposure and the ability to get that paramedic up to that level, as you said, of that advanced life support and, and that, then, you know, obviously I want to see that training done in the regions if I can, but if we're going to get the best outcomes to bringing people into a metropolitan area to train them, then what we have to make sure is that they're able to do that, that their families are looked after, that we're able to fill those, you know, shifts and make sure that we make it as easy for them to be able to do that as possible. But I, I take your point on board. I think that to be able to train as many people locally as we can, and that's why it was wonderful to see when we saw those um, it was I got, it was 153 new graduate paramedics and out of that 63 were going to the regions and what they actually did was they allowed them to do that tra that practical component in the regions which was really wonderful and which is more of what I want to see but I completely take your point on board may I take that part of the question on notice in yes. terms of, so, of that training so in other words um, or take it on notice or, or, or commit to having a look at whether it is just Nabea absolutely Hospital. have a look at it and uh, what I will commit I'll come to is getting back to you on that okay. as well. Okay, thank you, Minister. I probably just have one more question on paramedics and we can, we can um, break for, for lunch, actually. So um, this is in relation to intensive care paramedics now. So I, I've heard again from Australian Paramedics Association that there is um, the New South Wales Health prefers to limit intensive, pa intensive care paramedics to one intensive care paramedic, um, one intensive care paramedic per station. Is that correct? Is that, um, is that policy? And I'm not too sure who to direct that to. Mr Mintz. I think it's a question that we'd need to put to New South Wales Ambulance, but the, they have a pattern for, or, or a methodology for how they work out where they think um, intensive care paramedics should be located. And if you look at the current status at December 2021, there were 326 um, ICPs in regional New South Wales and 385 in, in the metropolitan area of Sydney. And in this year's budget, um, and over the, the, the forward estimates, there's a um, objective, a funded objective to convert a further 246 paramedics um, to new intensive care paramedic positions and 203 of those, based on the methodology, are earmarked for regional areas. Okay. Thank you. That's very useful. I've got a, a bunch more on this, but I can put some of those in on notice and ask this afternoon. So I'm happy to leave it there. Chair, Chair before we break, Please. can I just respond to those questions? There's a bit of clarification around Leeton, which I can provide you now because I've got yeah, a response. So the, the name change for Leeton uh, Health Service occurred in 2016, so it's not a recent change. It's been known as Leeton Health Service since 2016. Uh, in relation to the uh, stopping the advertisement for the career medical officer, that advertisement has been withdrawn because it's been running for two years with no result. And the decision has been made by the district to upgrade that position to a rural generalist position, which is actually a better position than a career medical officer. Good. So it's actually an enhancement yeah. and a commitment to a better service to the Leeton community. Okay. It's just in relation to Mr Saccord's comments about Eurobadella site and its sale. Mm. It hasn't been finalised yet, but just to be clear about the process, there have been ongoing negotiations with the, uh, the person who owns that land. They haven't been able to reach agreement. There's now been notice provided to uh, the owner that uh, uh, on notice that they, the resumption of the land will occur under the uh, land acquisition just terms legislation. Mm. Uh, and if that's not resolved uh, prior to about mid-April, then the land will be resumed under that uh, legislation. So it will be resolved shortly. And just to ensure that people aren't thinking that that's delaying the project, it is not creating a delay to the project. Mm. Uh, early works are envisaged on that site by later this calendar year. So I just wanted to make sure those things were clarified. Thank you, Dr. Lyons. Thank you. Just um, one just one thank more you. about the location of training. Um, I've just been advised by this Chief Executive of New South Wales Ambulance that that um, four-year funding that I mentioned that is to convert 246 paramedics to ICPs 
uh, will provide an opportunity to undertake some training in regional hospitals as well as Metro. Okay, great. Minister, uh, upon reflection, uh, in terms of the exchange that I had with you one-on-one -on -one earlier, uh, if there's any confusion about what I was doing, I wasn't uh, reflecting on you personally, so I do apologise if that was the way in which it came across. Thank you for your apology, Mr Chair. And if I may just um, add two final things, Mr Chair, with your indulgence. Yep. I just, in the order of transparency, did want to say and thank the committee I raised with you yesterday to excuse the three health members from the committee this afternoon because of the unfolding situation yep. that we have within New South Wales. Your response to me was that you wanted some of them to remain, so two out of the three will remain, so Ms Coff will be leaving. But please, if the, if the committee could please take into consideration this is not politics, this is not a game, this is actually a genuine request because of the pressure that they're under. Uh, Dr Lyons actually shredded two tyres on the way up here on the roads yesterday with, with the way it was. But the other thing that I would like to quickly say, and mm. I'm sure you will share my sentiments, Mr Chair, is the enormous gratitude that all of us as public servants of this state have to Elizabeth Coff for her incredible leadership as the Secretary of Health. This will be her last budget estimates. Her final day uh, will be tomorrow. She has been an absolute standout in terms of her leadership, in terms of her uh, personal workings with me, my office and myself have just an enormous respect and I think the people of New South Wales, the government of New South Wales owe her an incredibly great debt. Here, yeah. here. Uh, well, can I yeah. add to that? Uh, you, 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 in fact, have done it in a very timely fashion because, in fact, both of you won't be available this afternoon uh, and that's been, been agreed to. Um, but... Uh, Ms. Coff, we, we, we really do appreciate uh, the contribution you've made to uh, the body politic here in New South Wales, uh, not as an elected representative, but rather a key person at the most senior level with the, with the government in terms of a, a department which is very, very significant, effectively a third of the state budget, a third of what the government does in New South Wales. Um, I found you to be a highly professional individual. I, I don't know how many uh, budget estimates you've a been. Uh, too, many. Um, too, many. too many. Too many. Perhaps won't be something that you'll regret not having appeared <laughs> before. But can I say I've always found you a, a straight shooter, if I could put it that way. Uh, highly professional. Uh, if there's been matters that need to be, <coughs> excuse me, clarified, you've been very efficient in the way you've done that either on the day or for the follow-up with respect to answers to supplementary questions or questions on notice. So we wish you all, I'm not just the committee, but, but uh, I'm sure all members of the House, uh, uh, our very best wishes for, I presume, is a retirement or at least a semi-retirement. Perhaps what? a busy person uh, like you probably no. won't just retire like that. No, no. Um, I'm, I'm sure you'll have other roles. I don't imagine a person like you would just sit around. Uh, and uh, uh, as I said, uh, on behalf of uh, everyone here, thank you very much for the contribution you made to, to help health uh, at the highest level in the state. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. History will much record the work you Thank did you. to keep us safe. Thank you. Thank you. Here, here. Okay, we'll break for lunch and be back at two. Two. Thank you.
Um, back this afternoon. Appreciate that there's a lot on your plate, but um, there's, there's a number of matters we'd like to traverse with you this afternoon. Now, there are other members uh, returning to the table in some sort of rotational basis. Joining us this afternoon is General uh, Lou Amato. Um, but I think we can get underway with the uh, with those who are present. Okay. So uh, we'll commence then uh, with the opposition. Uh, Honourable Watts, the court. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so can I, can I just perhaps um, get this clarified at the beginning, without reflections on on the very eminent people at the table and the different roles you've got, uh, Dr. Lyons, are you effectively uh, the the lead this afternoon? If I could use that phrase, should we sort of be directing it to you in the first instance and? Or, or should we direct it to the relevant uh, person? I'm fine with that if the committee's uh, happy with that, Chair, and I can help them by assisting with whoever we refer okay. those questions to. So, um, so if, if, if it's obvious a question is to a particular individual, that can go that to person, but if there's a bit of ambiguity, perhaps <coughs> you can um, uh, take that role. So thank you very much. That would be facilitative, I think. Uh, I'll walk second. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I want to take you back to this morning about the demarcation or allocation of responsibilities between the Minister for Health and the Minister for um, regional, um, regional Health. So, uh, so an area of responsibility like the Centre for Aboriginal Health, would that remain under, under Minister Hazard or would it transfer to um, Minister Taylor? Uh, Dr Lyons? So thanks, Mr. Sacord. So as uh, Minister Taylor indicated this morning, uh, the conversations between her office and Minister Hazard's office is ongoing around the arrangements that are in place to support her in her role as Minister for Regional Health and Mental Health. Um, we've indicated uh, right from the outset that all of the resources of the Ministry of Health are available to both ministers in, re in respect to the roles that they take in their portfolios. So that uh, if there are any aspects that relate to Aboriginal health, of course, the Centre for Aboriginal Health would be able to respond to any questions uh, or support Minister Taylor in relation to the issues that she might have there as well. The way that the department is going to be structured to support uh, the ministers and their roles is yet to be determined. So uh, I, at the moment, what we're saying is that we are there to support both ministers and will respond to any questions or, or support that we can provide either of them or their offices. So well, when it comes to the allocation, now I remember from my time being a chief of staff and director of communications over a 50, 15 year period, there would be the allocation of DLOs and PLOs. I'm not sure what they're called anymore. I think department liaison officers and that. So would there be a doubling, would there be a doubling of advisors between Minister Taylor and Minister Hazard? So would they both get DLOs to carry out health work? I think uh, Minister Taylor has been the Minister for Mental Health uh, previously. Yep. Uh, from the point of view of the support that the Ministry provides, I don't think there's been any change to, to the support that the officers is receiving from the Ministry. Would that be right, Phil? Uh, <laughs> we might take it on notice, to, to be absolutely clear. But, uh, you know, we have um, provided support previously uh, to Minister Taylor's office because she was the Minister for Mental Health, so the arrangements uh, will continue. Okay, but um, I do accept that Mr. Minns has taken it on notice. But what happens currently? I mean, in fact, do they have, is there a health DLO in Minister Taylor's office as well as a health DLO? And I assume one or two in each office. At the, currently, like, I mean, that's not something you'd need to take on notice that you could probably tell me right now. Well, they do, they do have ministerial office staff, but um, I'm not completely familiar with how, you know, that responsibility is um, allocated within the office. So it's a question that I would need to put to the Minister's Chief of Staff. Okay. When it comes to policies like um, getting overseas doctors and overseas trained nurses and that, would that, would that occur? Who, who would have responsibility on materials like that that are, that are in rural health but involve interjurisdictional activity? So from the Ministry's perspective, we'd be providing advice when requested to the minister or all ministers and um, after that it's really a matter for the two ministers. You know, do other states and territories have um, ministers for rural health or regional health? Do you know this? Dr. Lyons? I don't know off the top of my head, Mr. Sacord, so we could uh, ascertain that for you. I, I haven't taken a close interest in uh, the arrangements that are in other states with, uh, with their ministerial portfolios. 
So when it comes to setting up um, ministerial councils, so I know there's a, there's an Austral Asian, Australia and New Zealand, all the state and territory health ministers come together for various issues. And I know from, from recollection that New Zealand gets tossed into that occasionally when there's things that happen. So would Minister Taylor accompany Minister Hazard to those? So the Australian Health Minister's Advisory Council no longer exists. I think that's the uh, organisation, that, yep. the, meet, the meeting that you were talking about. So there were governance changes uh, in the uh, COAG arrangements uh, some 12 or 18 months ago, and those arrangements no longer exist. Uh, there are, is in its place uh, a meeting of the uh, health chief executives and also a meeting of the health ministers. Um, usually the health ministers meeting has, uh, and ha as has previously been the case because Minister Taylor has been the Minister for Mental Health, uh, the Minister for Mental Health did not attend all of the meetings of the health ministers, but did attend a number of meetings where there were particular issues that were relevant to mental health. Now, how that relates to the role of the Minister for Regional Health will need to be worked through with the ministers and then uh, I'm sure the appropriate representation from New South Wales will occur. Uh, Mr. Minns, just for, for clarity, do you still handle workforce issues? Yes, I do. Yes. Um, so when it comes to how many people work in the Department of Health in ministerial liaison, executive management that relates to the minister? I think I need a bit more clarity on, on the well, question. I, I'm not completely familiar with the structure because I've moved on to police, but I've kept in passing interest in, in health. But there used to be an executive branch in various departments that are responsible for ministerial correspondence, supporting the minister in that. So what is the size of the um, New South Wales Health Ministerial Support Unit, if it's called that? And if it's not called that, can you tell me what it's called? So we have a branch called Executive and Ministerial Services. Yep. Okay. Um, that's what I mean. Someone will send me a text with the exact number of staff that are in it, but I think it's in the 40s. 40s. So can you give me the, uh, if you need to take it on notice, I understand that. Can you give me the number before the appointment, uh, one month before the appointment of Minister Taylor, and what it will be on, how many people will be there on March the 3rd as of close of business today? Yes, I can do that, Mr. Sakord, but I'm not aware of any um, increase. Okay, but can you check just in case that it's occurred? And I will, give yes. A, now, I'd like to go to the uh, chief psychiatrist, back to um, seclusion and restraint. So, can you actually explain, what's the definition of a restraint in, uh, event? Um, so, a, a restraint is a, um, any kind of um, action um, which impedes the movement of um, the consumer. So it can be physical, mechanical and chemical, is that correct? Yes, it can. So, so physical can be holding down a person, yes. staff holding down. Mechanical can be what, handcuffs, rest physical restraints? Um, we don't use handcuffs, but... Um, straight yeah. jacket? Would you um, be called no, straight we don't, jacket? No, we don't use straight jackets, but, you, but there, there are... Um, you can um, have... Straps? Yeah. Straps. Okay. And the last one can be chemical. So... Um, well, just a, um, a clarification. Yeah. Um, so the... In terms of what gets classified as restraint, um, um, sedation is when medication is used to manage um, people who have severe behavioural disturbance, and that does not get... Um, um, that is, for a, a range of reasons, not classified as restraint because the, um, the process which sedation involves um, is using medication which also has therapeutic purposes and it's actually impossible um, to differentiate the degree to which, in, in some instances, that, that action is a therapeutic action to treat the underlying condition versus a sedation to manage behaviour. So we try to separate out that component of treatment so that we can um, have, if you like, a, a very clear focus on what is undeniably a form of restraint. And when, when, you begin, when you begin the timing of duration of restraint, um, it says the average duration of physical restraint was five minutes. Yes. So how does that differ from what's occurring at Concord where it says that the duration 
um, was longer than four hours and 11 halts. Okay, I'm quoting here. It says, the duration, the average duration was longer than four hours in 11 New South Wales hospitals. They include Concord, 24 hours and 21 minutes, Cumberland, 22 hours, 44 minutes, Hornsby, 18 hours, 54 minutes, Nepean, 18 hours, 38 minutes, Liverpool, 17 hours, 27 minutes, Coffs Harbour, which is the country hospital, um, 9 hours and 35 minutes, and Prince of Wales Hospitals, 8 hours, 6 minutes, Royal Prince Alfred, 7 hours, 41 minutes, Lismore, second country hospital, 6 hours and 55 minutes, Blacktown, 5 hours, 5 minutes, and Bankstown, Lidcombe, 5 hours and 3 minutes. Um, Again, uh, this morning I asked a number of questions, but I didn't feel that we actually got to the end of it. So why would all of those hospitals range between 24 hours to five hours restraining someone? So does that mean that someone is in straps, as, you, as your, your word, for up to 24 hours at Concord? What, what would be the situation where wouldn't there be like medical, wouldn't you give someone an injection to relieve the anxiety or the aggression if that's... So why would why would someone be strapped up for 24 hours? Wouldn't that be wouldn't that be inhumane? And doesn't that sort of violate international benchmarks in that? So just as a clarification, yes. Mr. Sikord, I didn't say they would be in straps for oh. that for that period of okay. time. A restraint can be as simple as um, placing a hand on someone's shoulder to um, to, to manage their behaviour all the way through to um, the application in, in in really severe cases of um, restraints um, such as mechanical restraints. Um, the actual um, rate the the rate of the utilisation of mechanical restraints as opposed to physical restraints. So physical restraints is the laying of hands in order to manage, and that's generally considered the least intrusive um, version um, so, kind so of restraint. So, just so I have clarity, so you're talking about putting a hand on someone's shoulder it constitutes restraint in yourself? It can. It can, because it's a, it, you're basically, and, 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 and so... But um, I don't think someone's holding someone's shoulder for 24 hours and 21 minutes. I can't tell you precisely what they were doing, Mr. Sikor, but I think the, the image of someone being um, strapped um, for a prolonged period of time is not one that I would necessarily um, agree with either. Yeah. I, think, I think there's a range of things that happen which, which constitute restraints. I need to be clear that the use of restraints is, is something that you know, I would like to see disappear. Um, and, um, and, and I think in those prolonged instances, um, as I mentioned this morning, when we, when we try and understand what's what's behind some of the um, high levels of seclusion. The same applies in restraints. We, we want to understand why um, a particular service seems to either be using it more often mm -hmm. um, or has it in more, more prolonged um, um, application of restraint. And until we have that conversation, um, anything that I would say about it would be, would be speculative and, and likely to be um, 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 missing the point. I, 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 can I just say, though, that um, in my experience, both with seclusion and restraint, um, that the staff are as distressed about having to resort to these things as are the consumers. It's not something that anybody feels that they want to prolong for one minute longer than they have to. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some quite challenging and and challenging over prolonged periods um, situations that our staff face in, in those environments. But, uh, but it is, you know, the, those durations, absolutely. You know, if, if, if someone is in any kind of restraint, has their physical movements impeded for a prolonged period, that's not something that, that I um, feel good about, and I cer we certainly want to reduce that as much as possible. We have people in hospital to try and help them to recover, and those kind of instances set that recovery back. Um, sometimes it's for that person's own safety, but we need to be absolutely clear that all other possibilities have been exhausted um, and, that the, and that the unit that they're being managed on has every opportunity to engage with strategies to um, reduce that, that kind of um, um, intervention. Now, the, this is the third estimates that I've been aware of the opposition asking questions about seclusion and restraint. This is the, I know that 
colleague Anthony Diadam a number of years ago asked some questions, and this is my second round of budget estimates to ask about seclusion. So there's clearly something happening at Concord Hospital for it for the last three years to have numbers beyond 24 hours of people being physically or mechanically restrained. Have you done or instigated or has the department done any reviews into what is happening at Concord? Um, I know that the outgoing health secretary referred to it several years ago as an outlier, and BHI provided independent data to, that is what I'm basing that on. Uh, have you done any reviews or investigations into what is happening at Concord? The short answer is yes. Um, um, the, the longer answer is, is that, as I mentioned this morning, yeah. it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a part of the routine performance review process between the ministry and, and the district, and it, and it has been on the agenda um, for quite some time. Right. Um, I, I think that um, if I can... I think that there, um, there are some aspects which are long-standing, and there are some aspects which are um, fairly unique to the current circumstances. One of, one of those issues is around the impact of the pandemic. Now, the pandemic didn't occur three years ago, sir. I think I, I'm referring to the um, um, the. July to September quarter last year, which is the last figures that we have. Um, and you, you, you will, of course, be aware that um, all of our acute inpatient units, all of the staff are in PPE. Um, yep. for, the, for the duration. Um, PPE actually impedes the, um, the therapeutic engagement between clinical staff and patients. And it's been an observation, it's been an observation around a number of the different districts, not just Concord, um, that they have all experienced um, increasing levels of complexity and challenge. This, this is a real issue, Mr. Saccord. It's not, it's not a manufactured no, no, um, I, explanation. I understand. And I guess, so, I guess so that's, to... that's one part of it. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm trying to get to the point, which I was trying to, is that, and you alluded to it, unfortunately, did we have a situation during COVID that people who were in extreme acute situations, physically, chemically, and mechanically restrained for much longer periods of time under psychiatric care due to COVID. Did we have that happening? And I think the answer that you alluded to is that yes, we did. No, I don't think that's correct, Mr. Sakur. That's not what I'm saying. Oh. Um, what I'm saying is that there are a whole range of things which have occurred because of the pandemic, um, and that and that the um, and that the a number of our um, units reported that they were um, confronted with. Um, um, a range of more challenging situations, which did lead to an increase in the application in, in the use of seclusion and restraint. I think the the um, the management at Concord have not sat idly in relation to this. They've engaged with the Mental Health Patient Safety Program. There is a working group which is establishing what is called a, um, a, a looking at a, um, a model of care which has been introduced in some other facilities interstate called a behaviour of concerns um, response, um, which is aiming to identify early individuals who might end up with um, either restraint or seclusion and trying to implement that within their, in, in, in a couple of their units um, as a way of trying to bring down what they also would agree is an unacceptably high rate of seclusion and restraint. The, the comments about the role of the pandemic and how it's affected the interaction between staff and patients is offered as, a, as, a, as an explanation of why it is even more challenging over these, over these last 12 months or so. Um, it hasn't stopped them from, um, from trying to um, improve their performance. They've also taken on um, the, um, the, um, the 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 um, the six core strategies, which uh, is a which is a which is a program that's designed to um, reduce um, um, the use of seclusion and restraint um, in many facilities as well. So 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 they are trying to address it, um, and you know we're we're trying um, in various ways to assist them to address that. Thank you. Now, well, Jason, Mr. Sakor, can I just reassure you because um, the BHR report for October to December 2021, which will be released shortly, 
highlights that both the rates or the numbers of seclusion have gone down, the numbers of restraints have gone down across the system, and Concord Hospital is no longer an outlier on statistics. So this is the next set of data we'll show. That's right. So I, I think. I apologise, so, Ms. Fred. So, so looking looking at these data at a three, you know, in a three monthly batch. Um, will draw attention to certain things and, and may look a, a certain way and then the performance needs to be reviewed over time as well. Thank you, Dr Lyons. Sorry, Ms. Fearman. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Dr Wright, I know we, we have um, talked about this in the past, but I um, just wanted to ask you about uh, the use of um, psilocybin uh, as well as MDMA and other currently illicit drugs in treatment for um, mental health, um, uh, for various mental health uh, issues from anxiety to depression to PTSD and, and others. Are you aware now of research being um, undertaken or potentially going to be undertaken in Australia and in New South Wales and Sydney on, on this? Um, my understanding is, is certainly that there's a, there's a group in, in Victoria who um, embarked on some study and, and I think there's been a group associated with Macquarie um, University who might be doing it in New South Wales but I, can't, I don't know any details around that. Yes, I think um, it's becoming, it, it, it's uh, getting more pick up within the medical research yes. um, space in in this country indeed. Uh, um, globally, it has gone ahead in leaps and bounds. Um, the Australian government's Medical Research Future Fund has just uh, given a total of almost $15 million to seven clinical trials which are testing the use of these um, kind of breakthrough combination therapies and I understand from the information I have that it includes two trials in Sydney for psilocybin and MDMA. Have you personally as the chief psychiatrist um, been briefed on the potential of uh, this treatment yet? Um, yeah, I, I am aware of the potential for the treatment. I'm, um, I'm also very aware of the international interest um, and what, what I would consider um, are some very promising indications um, for, for their use um, in particular um, um, diagnoses. I think I think the issue which um, everyone is also waiting for is, is around the safety, um, and, and 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 I think that that's why the, you know this, the, there's a there's a degree of caution. Um, the, 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 the potential positive effects of these drugs, particularly in um, psilocybin guided um, psychotherapy for conditions like PTSD, there's some there's some strong evidence from um, um, from uh, um, the US in, in relation to this, um, I, I, but it is around. It is around. Is, it, is there? Are there any harms that um, we're not yet aware of that um, that, a, that a properly constructed study might might bring us bring to our attention? Are you aware of any uh, studies internationally from this psychedelic assisted therapy that has indicated that there has been any risks or harms as no, well? No, no. As I said, it's promising. It's promising because also um, the what it's ideally replacing because it is so effective in, ter in terms of the research and studies have shown how effective it is at treating really long-term clinical depression. Some people have been clinically depressed for, for a couple of decades that they try some of this, they try this treatment and it is astounding mm -hmm. in terms of after two assisted treatments, their um, kind of cured in some ways. This is, and I can, and I think I've given uh, your minister some of this information because isn't it true in terms of the risks? It's actually replacing the huge risks in terms of opioid addiction and other addiction that, um, and other, sorry, um, prescription drug addiction that um, people with some of these issues are unfortunately in the grips of. Well, well, I think the it's, it, it is around some of the secondary morbidities that people experience because because of the risk of self-medication through inappropriate use of things like benzodiazepines, opiates, alcohol, and other drugs, and so as a result of their trauma and their their as, as a result of the fact that they're still symptomatic, yes. um, and and the, 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 the treatments that that have been made available don't always help them. So, no, I'm. I'm encouraged, um, but I'm also I'm also beholden to the, the the scientific method, and that is that there does need to be a carefully 
considered and controlled trial, which convinces everybody um, that not only is there benefit, um, but that there are no significant risks. We have certainly had in medicine enough experience of introduction of treatments which have clearly had benefit but over time have exposed very significant risks um, and um, we really don't want to go down that pathway again. Yes, uh, when you say go down that pathway again, can you explain what you mean by that, which, oh, which, um, which had significant risks? Barbiturates is a, is, a, is a pretty useful one. That was everyone's favourite medication in the 50s and early 60s, um, and, um, and you know, they're no longer in use because they're dangerous. Um, I think that um, benzodiazepines, when they were first introduced, were, were thought to be um, without harms, and now all of us know that they do have harms. Um, and it's particularly addictive potential tolerance. When the, when the long-acting opiates were introduced, Introduced in the late 90s, they were the the, the marketing of the long-acting opiates was that because they're long-acting, there's a lower addictive potential. Not true, um, and that's where we ended up with the opiate crisis. So, it, so it, it's quite easy to understand why people, particularly people who have chronic and disabling conditions, are focused on the potential benefits of any treatment, and so am I. But there is, we've got to make sure that it doesn't have risk. One of the big differences here, though, which is to, to the two examples you, you've just given, isn't it, is the fact that these are used in a therapeutic uh, environment with professionals, people who are trained in providing that therapy. Mm. We're not talking about drugs that are prescribed via a chemist and people go home and they're, they're on them every day of the week for however many months or years. We're talking about several treatments with a, with a psychiatrist or, or somebody who is trained and the research has shown the extraordinary benefits after a couple of treatments. That's the big difference, isn't it, between the barbiturates and the benzos that you've talked about in terms of addiction and risks? Well, the, the, they've all got differences between them, but I, I need to be clear that I'm not I'm not um, hostile to the idea a role for these um, treatments in psychiatry. What I am very cautious about, particularly in this role, is an ind a premature endorsement of something which hasn't been thoroughly tested um, and that, that it doesn't just have benefits but has potential risks. So, uh, you know, mm. I, 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 I am um, just as much as anybody looking forward to having better treatments available to those to those individuals who, who really do suffer from these chronic conditions. So you'll be looking closely at the results of though the recently MRWF funded um, well, trials. Not only that, I'm, I'm, I'm very tuned into the international literature as well. So, yes. so it's, a, it's, it's not. It's, it's, it, uh, I think it's an accumulation of evidence, which then, um, which, which then, you know, gradually will um, persuade us that this is something which really, yeah. really has merit and low risk. That's actually very positive, um, uh, Dr. Wright, I have to say. So uh, thank you for that exchange. Um, if uh, I just wanted to go to the issue of midwives again, um, now that we've got a bit more time, I think just without the minister here, um, what are the concrete steps that are being taken by the department to get more midwives into regional New South Wales, more trained midwives, just in terms of what that plan is? So midwives um, can enter training two ways. There's graduate midwives doing a specialist midwife degree. Uh, we are not seeing um, the levels of people graduating at, at the level we would like. Right? So it's about encouraging. Um, What's the salary for midwives? I'd need to okay. look up their starting right, salary. Okay. Yeah, I will be able to do that. But, Thank you, yeah. Um, the, so the, the other way that we get them and the way we used to traditionally get them was through uh, what we call a mid-start program. So there are scholarships that we make available for a registered nurse already in our system to undertake uh, the training to become a midwife. And those scholarships are, you know, encouraged and they're directed towards rural and regional and they have an effect. And we, the point that we make to the districts is that they probably have to look at that, that conversion model as their long-term strategy for regrowing their midwifery workforce rather than um, hope that the graduate program of the universities is going to meet their future needs. So um, 
it's essentially those scholarships, and I, if you give me a moment, I can look up the, their value and how they. Is there operate. does the does the government have um, a target within a plan to um, increase the numbers of midwives in regional areas? Uh, yeah, Take broadly speaking, yeah. So um, in the in the commitment made by the government in 2019 to an additional um, health workforce, you know, I think it was 8,300. In that total, there was um, a number that were nurses and there was a number that were midwives. Okay. So, yeah, if it could be um, taken on notice, the uh, numbers of um, the that plan in terms of the, the targets, if you like, over the next... I'm assuming it's in the forward estimates in terms of how many and then maybe how many have been recruited during the last two years. That would be useful too. Okay. Thank you. Um, on a similar vein as well, um, but this is in relation to, I know we've talked about this in the Rural Health Inquiry, but this is in relation to um, rural generalists. So what the, the plan is, obviously that's come up massively. You're very well aware of the, um, the situation there. What are the kind of goals around getting more rural generalists into our regional areas? Um, basically to increase them. <laughs> yes, I know. That's <laughs> and, and to make, um, make the idea of rural generalism um, across the different disciplines attractive and, um, and again... So uh, increase them, is there a... Is there a is, do you have a target? Uh, I'd need to consult my notes if there's a precise target. If, if I can uh, talk about it, we heard some of the evidence during the inquiry about yes. some of the work the districts are doing to address the barriers to rural generalist training. And the example was given around the Murrumbidgee model, about looking at that single employer model, which is, you know, a problem because at the moment the doctors come out of uh, university, they get their first pre-vocational pre years as employees of New South Wales Health. If they're entering into general practice training, they've had to go out and then be employed in general practice while they undertake that training. And then there's so there's a multiple shifts in employment models. And by having a single employer model, it's about that continuity, about access to benefits that exist from us being a big employer and us setting up a pathway that enables people to get their training whilst they're in the employment of New South Wales Health. And those models are being explored at the moment. We're very keen to expand them and look at how much they can benefit these uh, pipelines of getting young doctors through training in rural environments and working in those rural environments as rural generalists. And then it comes to the model is about, well, what do we do with the Commonwealth around the employment arrangements of general practitioners? And at the moment, they're predominantly in private practice and access, accessing the MBS. And we've heard evidence about the, you know, that's not necessarily working in, in all rural environments. So do we need to come up with some different models of how we actually remunerate doctors in those environments and how we ensure that they're available to those smaller communities? So there is a lot of thinking, a lot of work. We've got to take it a lot further, as you heard. Those SACS papers that we commissioned and the final SACS paper, which made those four recommendations, one of the key recommendations was around what we need to do to strengthen up primary care uh, and have it uh, community-based and overcome the issues between the state and the Commonwealth at the moment around uh, not only the vocational training of those doctors and nurses and others, but also their remuneration arrangements, and those are things we would be keen to explore further. Thank you, Dr Lyon. Um, <clears throat> if I could um, uh, just return to the issue of the new... Oh, I'm sorry, Mr Minns, I apologise. Yeah, Mr. Um, just... Uh, on the Rural Generalists um, program and, and measures that we're pursuing there. So we fund the Rural Doctors Network uh, annually for 1.6 million and they run programs to attract doctors to rural areas. That includes the New South Wales Rural Medical Officer Cadetship Program and that provides up to 15 scholarships each year for medical students interested in a career in rural New South Wales. Um, the Rural Doctors Network gets very involved with local communities and general practices to seek to find and, and attract GPs to positions in rural areas. And under the Rural Generalist Training Program, uh, we provide 50 training positions uh, each year with the aim of producing doctors who are GPs with advanced skills um, able to deliver services to rural communities. 
And in addition to that, um, in 2020, 145 interns were recruited as part of the Rural Preferential Recruitment Program, and that supports junior doctors working their first two years in a rural location. Um, that number was was 75 back in 2012, so we've almost doubled that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just returning to the issue of the, uh, the new structure um, arising from the creation of the new position of uh, Regional uh, Health Minister. Um, I'm, I'm looking at um, a document which is um, the New South Wales Health Organisational Chart, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, it's been updated to the extent that it's dated the 7th of December 2021. So at the very top, it's got ministers plural. So it obviously accommodates the fact that there are, there are two ministers. <coughs> um, <coughs> Excuse me. You go to the page. Um, we've got the uh, local health districts, and uh, uh, as we were discussing earlier today, when the minister was present, uh, there, there are a nine that um, uh, she has responsibility for, as I best understand her evidence. Um, uh, at, at two of those nine are ones, and they're specifically uh, the. Uh, Blue Mountains, sorry, the, the PM Blue Mountains uh, local health district, and South Western Sydney local health district, which, which bleed into uh, rural areas. But there is there is some metro uh, uh, component or, or, or consolidated um, uh, uh, population component. <coughs> um, in terms of corresponding uh, on issues, this is. Um, Members of Parliament from from either house uh, over constituent matters. Um, I'm wondering whether you can take it on notice. Now, I mean this as a quite a serious question. That at least until the new structure is is shaken down, so we can clearly understand it, that that correspondence on issues be uh, cc'd uh, to the other minister. In other words, that if, a, if it is a matter that clearly is from one of those regional areas, and there's no question that it's uh, for, for um, uh, Minister Taylor, that nevertheless we should cc Minister Hazard in, or, or vice versa, that there could be some occasion where we need to cc uh, Minister Taylor in. The only reason I raise that is because until things get set up and shaken down, uh, some things you, you know will need to be dealt with and process as, as we sort of proceed into the future. And uh, you know, I know the minister said that you know there'll be meeting between the two and the sharing of correspondence and what have you. But but we all know how large the health system is in New South Wales, and we we know that sometimes if something does get missed, it can have awful consequences, quite inadvertently, sometimes tragic. So to ensure that there is the communication and that we don't have it fall between the, uh, the stool legs, if I, if I could put it that way. Um, could you take on notice about whether or not uh, uh, we could hear back from the minister about whether or not there should be a CCing in, not reflecting on the minister or either minister, but just to ensure that uh, the, the questions and the issues are being you know, got through to where they need to be? Yes, Chair, we'll take that on notice. Um, with respect to the, uh, the local health districts, um, and specifically, it's, it's under the list here. We've got, um, uh, and it's not strictly a local health district, but nevertheless, oh, it falls me. under the category of local health districts and specialty networks, the uh, Justice Health and Forensic Mental Health Network. Um, uh, uh, apropos the Minister's uh, evidence earlier today, are we out to take that if there is a, a, a jail uh, outside, sorry, put it another way, withdraw that, that if there is a jail that is within one of the local health districts that uh, she has responsibility for, uh, we should be communicating to her uh, over the matter, uh, or in other words, a justice health matter, or that that ought be a matter to raise with the health minister, or whether we should CC each other in into it. Um, I don't know whether you've got anything to say in regard. I think we'll take that on notice as well, thanks, Chair. Okay. Uh, now, with respect to the uh, Sydney Children's uh, Hospital Network, uh, and we, we understand that that network of hospitals uh, fall within the greater Sydney metropolitan area, does, does it, though, have any outreach um, as a network formally uh, into the regions which would pick up 
the responsibility now or part thereof that the, uh, the, the uh, regional health minister has? Uh, just to, uh, to make a specific comment about that, I d uh, they do provide outreach into the rural uh, districts, yes. uh, but they are they are positions and services that outreach from the Randwick and Westmead campuses. I thought so. so they're yes. part so of they come back to mm. yeah. So th there are a range of different services that are providing statewide services, yes. and my general comment would be that they should continue to operate as statewide services. They've been set up for that purpose. So yep. things like. Um, the ambulance service is a statewide service. We've got a pathology service, which is a statewide service. We have uh, Justice and Forensic Mental Health the Network, as you indicated, which has a statewide role. The Sydney Children's Hospital Network has a statewide role. Those services which have a statewide remit yep. will, will continue to have a statewide remit. And, and, uh, and, and so we'll take on notice the arrangements that the minister's offices will come to around how they would like those matters dealt with. Yeah, it's just oh. to be facilitated. Yep. Yeah, yeah, on that point, so... If you're an isolated patient, would you come under Minister Taylor or would you come under Minister Hazard? Getting treatment in Sydney, and in fact, I remember from personal experience encountering um, when my daughter had surgery years, almost 30 years ago, that there were people from the country, from Tamworth and things like that, who were in Sydney, and they were clearly country patients, but they were in Sydney receiving services. So these are, I think, the matters that the Minister indicated are being worked with through between the two offices, and uh, I think we take it on notice until those uh, decisions are completed and uh, everyone's clear. And it's, thank you for that. Uh, appreciate that. And I do understand that this is a complex area in terms of... Um, but I wonder if you could take on uh, notice uh, a, a question which specifically uh, seeks whether or not there is... Um, a reasonably clear timetable set down for which we will be able to have an understanding of, of what these new arrangements are. Um, uh, can I move on to the, uh, just briefly, the, the question of the, the, the third review of the, the plan that ended in 2021 uh, uh, that um, no, no doubt I'm not asking you to comment on it, although I'm sure you've got some familiarity with its preparation, that it's going to be, uh, as a review, uh, fully informed uh, by all the evidence that's come forth from the inquiry into uh, health services and health outcomes in regional, rural and remote New South Wales? So le let me uh, clarify that the third progress report is yes. on progress of the plan that was the 10-year plan till yes. 2021. Yes. So it's been uh, taken with a view that the plan that was put in place in um, 2011 for the 10 years to 2021 has completed, and this is the third progress report on what has been achieved during that period of time. So it reflects the previous plan and the achievements in that time frame. Um, we are very conscious that during the course of that plan, the inquiry commenced, and we started to hear evidence about the inquiry. What we felt was most important is that in the new plan, which we are now about to develop for the next 10 years, that that plan incorporates all of the evidence we heard and in particular, any recommendations that might come out from the committee in relation to the evidence and, and uh, recommendations the committee feels uh, would be appropriate to respond. And that we incorporate uh, how health will respond to the inquiry issues and recommendations in a way that then is uh, brought into the plan to ensure that we are delivering on the things which the community has fed through the committee as being issues that they think believe that, that they believe need to be addressed. Now, I, I understand that, uh, but uh, the point is that all this evidence, which is uh, being collected through um, um, submissions, oral evidence, supplementary questions, and questions on notice, uh, uh, brought together and synthesised into a report yet to be produced, collected over a 12-month period. Uh, that all fell, all that evidence fell uh, during uh, what was the existence of a plan uh, that uh, completed uh, in 2021. So my question goes to when I say informing the review that, that now all that information is on the table about what we now have found out through, through all that evidence, that that's going to inform the thinking around the review. Well, uh, sorry, Chair, I, uh, maybe I wasn't clear, but that's absolutely what we're proposing to do. It's not about the review of the progress to the previous plan. It's about saying those need to absolutely inform yep. what we're going to do in future to ensure that we're responding to the issues that were raised yep. and that we have got actions in place to address any recommendations as well that might come out of the inquiry process. So that's the purpose of the establishment of the new plan. It will be brand new. It will involve all of that as inputs 
as well as a lot of consultation we'll do with our uh, com communities across, uh, the rural communities across the state. Because one of the other things that came out quite clearly, and you heard that as we did, that a lot of communities don't feel like they have enough involvement or say in what happens in their local health services. So how do we start to address some of those issues as well is going to be a really key component. Yes, perhaps I'm, I'm failing to be clear, and it's my fault I do apologise, but clearly what sits on the table now as part of looking at the review of the plan that completed in 2021 is a whole lot of information that otherwise you didn't have. And what I'm saying is that I appreciate that it's a review looking back of the 10-year plan, but I'm asking that whether or not what one is looking at in terms of the achievement of that 10-year uh, plan is going to have eyes into and inform its consideration about the judgment of the, of, of the plan that completed in 2021. Uh, well, we have already completed the review of the progress, so that's already ready to be published. Right. It's just going through the final approval processes now, and in the absence of having that documentation finalised, uh, okay. Uh, okay. I, well, well, it, it, the timing's just not quite right, Chair. OK. Um, um, uh, on the issue of... Uh, I've got one minute, so I probably won't get through this completely, but we'll return to it. On the question of uh, nursing homes, uh, uh, in New South Wales, um, and specifically the interface between the New South Wales public health system and uh, nursing homes. Uh, take it as read that we understand that uh, nursing homes is essentially a Commonwealth remit in terms of of it, uh, in terms of funding, support, etc. Um, the interface between uh, uh, residents in nursing homes, if I could put it that way and the New South Wales health system would essentially be this, would it not? Uh, it would be to the extent that a resident of a nursing home uh, was required to be transferred by ambulance to a hospital to have a matter attended to or addressed. That that's where essentially the resident of the nursing home essentially at that point enters in through the emergency department that's the interface, that's where it really takes place. But prior to that, prior, prior to uh, the call that's made, the, the triple zero, and the arrival of the ambulance, effectively they're within the domain and the responsibility of, of the Commonwealth, that is the, the nursing home and its operations and all hangs off that. But if they were an ambulance called uh, and they were picked up by the ambulance, that's when effectively there is some discussion around the relationship between the residents of a nursing home and New South Wales Health. Is that is that a fair summary? Um, in, 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 say in general terms, I'm not. Uh, yeah, in general terms, it is. But I, I have to say, uh, increasingly, New South Wales Health has been involved in a range of um, services that would inreach into nursing homes to provide care for residents in situ to ensure that they are able to access the care that they need without having to resort to a transfer to an emergency department, if that was at all possible. So we've had a number of models that have been in place in many places now for many years that have provided that in-reach model into aged care, reflective of the fact that residents weren't otherwise able to access it. And these were issues that we raised in the Royal Commission into Aged Care. Uh, the concern that we had that because residents weren't able to access the care they need either from general practitioners or specialists uh, in the community settings that they were by default being transferred to hospital emergency departments to access that care and that that wasn't an acceptable arrangement. So we ad advocated very strongly that there needs to be a significant enhancement of the medical care mm. that's available and accessible to residents in aged care. Uh, and we're very uh, we're very keen to continue to support that. During the course of the pandemic, we've done a whole lot. Of course. Which is beyond that because of the public health responsibilities, yeah. mm. including providing infection prevention and control advice uh, to ensure that residents uh, were able to be cared for in a way that minimised the chances of them uh, having COVID, you know, obtaining or... or uh, uh, okay, yeah, 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 having uh, COVID and having that spread through those facilities. So I think um, there are many things that we do to support residential aged care. We see those residents as our responsibility because they are members of the local health district community and they have a, a right to access uh, care as any other member of our community. And we're very conscious of the need to support them. Thank you. I'll return to that later. Um, Kate Fairman. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to go back to... Um, 
I was asking previously about cancer treatments. Um, the, in, in the the in the government submission to the to the um, supplementary submission, I should say, to the um, regional health inquiry, it mentions that um, there is a um, the Cancer Institute is working on a pilot project around providing accommodation and travel assistance for people in remote and regional areas to participate in cancer clinical trials. That's a pilot, I understand, and it's looking at reducing the financial burden for travel and accommodation. And I, I suppose the first question is why is a pilot necessary? Um, because up until now, the IPTAS, uh, Isolated Patients Travel and Accommodation Assistance Scheme, um, has not covered patients who might be a part of a clinical research trial because it wasn't considered to be a service that was necessarily being provided by the public sector. So the, if there were just limits around uh, what was being provided in terms of the supports and subsidies under that program. Now, um, that was a pilot that the Cancer Institute uh, was instituting and there has been strong advocacy for uh, IPTAS to be extended to, co to cover uh, cancer patients who are actually participating in clinical trials and that is being closely looked at at the moment. Uh, so it's just a, around the boundaries of the program. I mean, IPTAS, I think, has more than doubled over the last 10 years. There's been significant enhancement of that program to support travel and accommodation for people to access uh, services from rural. Um, but there always are limits to whatever the, the policy and the program covers at any point in time. So they're continually looked at and reviewed. And I know there's a lot of advocacy around uh, access for patients who are undergoing clinical trials for cancer. Yeah, OK, so that's clinical trials and also just the... the um the general uh, huge cost to cancer patients to access radiotherapy services, of course, because there's a lack of radiotherapy services. So they are, they are covered. They files. are covered under the IPTAS arrangements now to actually access uh, support. When you say now, to what's that change? When's that it's, change? It's already been in place. So, that, so to access. Uh, support for access to radiotherapy services. I think if it's over 100 kilometres from where the person lives, they can access support under a test now. OK, so this is despite um, groups like the... Um, by the Cancer Can Assist, who, um, you know, a fantastic organisation. This is despite them spending a significant part of their kind of fundraising to assist... Um, Travel, travel and accommodation costs for people. So this is... So I, I, the IPTAS scheme is a subsidy scheme. It doesn't cover the full costs. Yes, so I'm, a, that, I'm aware that uh, there are other groups that would say, you know, they would look to fundraise to support the full costs, but it is, it is a subsidy scheme. OK. Um, I'm probably up for questions, oh, to be okay. honest, with uh, uh, Emma. OK, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Dr Lyons and... Uh, um, Mr. Minns, maybe you, in fact, would like to take this on notice. But I would, um, in the minister's inaugural interview, talking as the first ever regional health minister commits to addressing rural hospital work shortfall, in the interview January the 2nd, 2022, she, um, she talked about one of the things that she wanted to address was, quote, pregnant woman being given water crew, waterproof mats in case they gave birth while driving hundreds of kilometres to the nearest maternity wards. Um, what work in that area has been advanced and how many waterproof mats have been provided to women in New South Wales who in fact may give birth on the highway on the way to a hospital? If you could take that a notice, I'd like to know for the calendar year 2019, 2020, 2021, and from now, from January the 1st to March the 3rd. I'd like to have that material on notice. Did you could take that? So we'll take that on notice, but I just might indicate at this point in time, uh, Mr. Sikord, it, it may be that we don't have documentation around that. Well, I think, so, you, so I, I think you're a pretty big organisation. I'm pretty sure you'll be able to locate that. We will, we will uh, do our best, Mr. Sikord. Okay. Now, I want to take you to COVID and mental health. Um, now, the minister during COVID, in particular the Omnibus, Omicron outbreak said there was an enormous growth in the terms of cases and admitted patients. And were any mental health beds given up to accommodate COVID patients in New South Wales? Uh, Dr. Wright or Dr. Lyons? I'll start. Um, yes. When we're responding to a crisis and there is a need for... Okay, but I'm uh, asking for a, a, a figure too. Um, yeah. Okay, do your preamble and then I'll... So, so when we're responding to a crisis, the system looks at what it needs to change in terms of service delivery to ensure it can respond to the crisis. 
and there were a whole lot of changes that were made right across our system to make sure we could respond. Um, we, ch we stopped uh, providing uh, some surgery for a period of time to make sure clinicians were available to do other things. We stopped providing outpatient services and started to uh, change some of that to virtual care. We made service configurations within our wards to convert a lot of specialist wards. Yeah, I, I think you used the phrase, and I quote, repurposed. Yeah, well, uh, well, yeah. Yeah, so, so uh, I'm just giving you the example there. So yeah. there were many specialist wards within acute hospitals, wards like those that look after respiratory patients, gastroenterology patients, cardiac patients, neurology patients, all of those types of specialties which include mental health, which were reconfigured to be wards to accommodate COVID patients. So that occurred, uh, that occurred across the board mm -hmm. and there were some mental health services that were reconfigured as part of that. So I think it needs to be yep. viewed in that context. Now, Shoalhaven Subacute Mental Health Unit on the Illawarra Shoalhaven was one of those ones that were, quote, by the minister repurposed for COVID beds. Um, is it now back to pre-COVID levels or what's happening at the um, Shoalhaven Subacute Mental Health Unit? Is it back, back to business? Um, I, th I think we'd have to take on notice what the status of that, that unit is today. Okay, so that would, yeah, I would like to know what capacity it's back in a percentage and the number of beds that are back for mental, subacute mental health. Um, now, You'd be aware that in prison there were a number of um, lockdowns. Prisoners were kept in cells because of COVID outbreaks and transmission involving the, the prison system. Now, um, what occurred in the mental uh, involving mental health patients? Is there data on the number of patients that contracted COVID while um, patients of the New South Wales health system? And if you, yes, Dr. Dr. Wright. I, I may give you some background, Mr. Okay. Sikord, which might help. Um, it, I, I can't give you a number today, but the, but back, can you the background notice is, then if yeah, you... but I think it's important to understand that the, um, the configurations of our wards, um, even those wards which were continuously dedicated to mental health patients, were yep. changing sometimes on a daily basis, depending yep. on um, the issues around staff availability. Remember, we had a number of staff who were in isolation at times, and also around the, um, the determination to um, be able to manage um, patients who um, required an admission, but were also either clearly COVID positive um, or um, um, potentially COVID positive. And we categorised um, across the system people as either being um, red, amber or green, with green being definitely not COVID positive. Yep. The, um, and, and so those changes were happening on a daily basis, particularly in a couple of the, the districts with very high community prevalence. So community prevalence translates to um, the, the challenges both in terms of um, staff infections and also patient infections. And so those, um, and, and when a patient is identified as being COVID positive, there's also a, a kind of a, a, a staged response because the decision needs to be made whether the um, environment, the mental health unit, is the appropriate environment to continue to manage that person um, or whether their respiratory status is compromised to the degree that they then, um, in spite of the fact they need to continue with mental health treatment, get moved to a respiratory ward. So there's a lot of shifting parts um, um, to that process. I, I'm not certain that we have a number of, uh, for the, across the state of patients in our mental health inpatient units who tested positive for, um, for COVID, um, but we can see what, what figures we can provide. If you can provide those figures, if you could also provide them breakdown by local health district and by hospital, if you can do that. Thank you. Um, Dr. Rain, I'd like to return to some, some earlier questions I, I asked about restraints. Um, does, does, does restraint occur involving children? Yes. Oh, it does. It does. Would you be aware that um, Sydney Children's Hospital has um, an average rate of 20 minutes for restraint for children? Yes. What would be a situation why you would, where you would need to restrain a child? Um, the, the 
issues around um, the um, children um, and adolescents in who require inpatient care, the vast majority of treatment for mental health conditions in children and young people takes place in the community. Um, um, we, we far and away prefer to treat people, not just in the community, but in their family setting. Mm. Um, and so it's actually a very small number of um, people, um, children, young people who end up in um, um, specialist child and adolescent inpatient units. Um, and there, in, in these um, settings, um, there is often um, a very significant number um, of those individuals um, are there because, not necessarily because of the, um, the mental health condition, but sometimes a part of that, um, there are very, very significant behavioural challenges. Um, and sometimes different forms of restraint um, are more appropriate than introduction of medication. Okay, so what, what kind of restraint would occur in the in the home? So this would be. I'm not talking about in the home. I'm talking about in the hospital setting. Oh, you. Okay, so I understand from the data before me here that there were 44 physical restraint events at Sydney Children's Hospital. Uh, I, is there? Can I? Sorry, yeah. I've just um, been brought to my attention. That would also include a physical treatment such as um, insertion of nasogastric tube uh, for treat management of a, of a physical health condition. Um, you could understand that in some age groups, um, the you, it, it's you're, you're not going to get the immediate cooperation of the right. person, and and so that is actually technically restraint. You've got a okay. distressed young okay, child. I do understand. So a child that would rip out. Rip not out. so much rip it out, but to cooperate. For the, the, and and there, are, there are other forms of treatments like I would imagine. a catheter or putting yeah. something. Yeah, I, I can understand that. So it occurred 44 times at Sydney Children's Hospital. Do you, in fact, keep data and evaluate, like when you decide to restrain a child, are there restrictions, and not restrictions, but is there an accountability mechanism in place? Mr. Secord, the reason we collect the data yeah. and the reason we report the data is because that's part of the accountability process. Yeah. And so um, the, the, converse, the, the answer I gave earlier today about that that is tabled as part of the, um, um, in this case, the specialty health networks um, um, performance review process so that we can get, again, so that we can get behind those figures and understand what what um, what what are the situations um, that contribute to that, and is it is it something which is unique to a paediatric setting, which is explainable and appropriate, or is there a problem that it's that it's um, uh, that it's revealing? Um, Dr. Dr. Lyons, so what is the situation involving staffing at Goulburn Base Hospital involving the resourcing of the maternity ward? Are paramedics still assisting with maternity services at Goulburn Hospital? So I haven't got the specific detail of the current uh, staffing of the of the hospital, Mr. Sigurd. So I'll take that on notice. Would you be aware of of, of the situation? It was um, reported in the Goulburn Post. It was raised with the government by by nurses. They are concerned that paramedics were helping them deliver babies. So I'll take the uh, question on notice, Mr. Sigurd. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I also want to take you to um, Tumut Hospital. Uh, several years ago, I think it was two years ago, the coroner found that um, that there was implicit bias uh, was a factor in the death of a pregnant Aboriginal for, uh, First Nation woman, and her mother says that race remains an issue at the hospital. Now, this is involving involving the tragic death of Na Naomi Williams, a Rwandan woman who was 27. Um, what systems and changes have been introduced in that hospital since? So I'm aware of the circumstances yep. of, that, of that tragic case, and uh, and I would say that uh, the district, uh, and I know full well from having talked directly to the chief executive of the local health district about this matter, about how seriously mm -hmm. uh, they've taken the matters that were raised during that inquest and the recommendations that were made. Uh, in response to it, they're very committed to making the changes at Tumut Hospital to make sure that those issues that were raised uh, during that uh, coronial inquest and the, and the actions that need to be taken by the district ensure that 
the chances of uh, anything like that happening again are, are uh, minimised and, and if uh, not eliminated, that's the plan. So I appreciate the challenges that there are and I know that they're very committed to uh, undertaking and, and continuing to introduce the changes that are required and I know they're very committed to doing that. No number of recommendations were made to the LHD. Can you uh, take on notice the number of recommendations and how many have been implemented? Does TUMID have one doctor on site 24 hours, 24 seven? And is there an emergency doctor on site 24 seven? And does the hospital have an anesthetist? Can you take all of those questions on notice? I think that's on notice. Thank you. Um, Thank Chair. you, Dr. Lyons. Um, returning to the... Uh, uh, matter we discussed uh, before we passed over to Kate Fairman about nursing homes. Um, sorry? I think, that was, I think you were using crossbench time. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I thought my time had finished, yes. Sorry, sorry don't, when you say before passed to me, sorry, sorry, I didn't think I'd interrupt the whole procedure. I said throw to Emma first. because I. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry, Mr Chair. Sorry. So Mr. Chair. I'm confused. Emma's just come in. You, you surrendered your time to Walt. Is that what happened? Yes. Well, did you? Can I keep going? Can we keep going? No, no, no. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, you're still <coughs> no, This is the opposition you, time, chair. and then it will come yeah, back yeah. to me. And that's fine. Just point at me when I can do it. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, that might not be for a while. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just returning to the matter of nursing homes um, uh, and, and the important discussion we're having about the interface. Um, and I appreciate the evidence, uh, Dr. Lyons, about the, um, uh, uh, my words, not yours, increasing outreach and activity uh, from New South Wales Health uh, into nursing homes to provide care support uh, for those in need in, in those establishments. Um, uh, simply say, if you haven't read it, uh, and, and that's fine, I'll change my questioning um, slightly, but have you read the um, report um, that was done by the Legislative Council into the provision of public health amendment registered nurses in nursing homes bill 2010? I haven't known. 2020? I haven't known. Okay. Um, in summary, it was a, an examination about the issue about nursing homes mm. and the provision of nurses, or, or not as the case may be, uh, and the implications of, of a proposed piece of legislation which would effectively mandate uh, at least a, a nurse uh, in a nursing home 24 7, 365. I'm aware of that. Uh, yes. But, yeah. So that's the, the, the context of the policy debate. Um, uh, in, uh, in that inquiry, in the report, and perhaps um, at another time you can have a, have a better look at the report, it's quite informative, um, there's a number of instances of evidence um, uh, that came forth from uh, submissions uh, and, and also those that gave oral evidence at the hearing, I think it was hearing or hearings plural, it was over one or two days, um, about what were um, uh, situations or circumstances of, of individuals approaching the end of their life um, in most difficult circumstances whereby because there was, in other words, they're literally dying, in other, in other words, in the very foreseeable future, um, matters of hours or days at most, uh, whereby uh, there wasn't present a, a nurse in the nursing home uh, overnight or perhaps at times on weekends, the effect of which was not able to enable the provision to those, uh, uh, those persons um, of, of palliative relief, uh, be it the pain relief or the relief for for stress and, and associated matters, um, uh, which I think is a whole policy debate. We, we need to look about how we can improve the lot of those people in nursing homes at the end of life. But to the, to the point, though, that you raised, are you able to comment that, in fact, with this outreach work that New South Wales Health uh, has been increasingly doing uh, in, into our nursing homes, that some of it actually has involved uh, this work of, of providing uh, palliation and palliative care or palliative end-of-life care for, for those who are very much at the end of life? Absolutely, and, and uh, our palliative care services do provide support into residential <coughs> aged care facilities, and I'm also aware the Commonwealth have made uh, an, an additional investment into uh, the residential aged care sector to support uh, end-of-life and palliative care in residential aged care facilities. But uh, your point around the nursing care and the availability of staff uh, is one that was uh, aired quite extensively at the Royal Commission. Appreciate and that. there are a number of recommendations that the Commonwealth have uh, taken on which will include increasing uh, the level of uh, clinical input into uh, the staffing of residential aged care facilities. And we're, and we're waiting to see what their response is around how much time that will be and what impact that has on registered nurses being available and being available particularly 24 seven. 
uh, because that is, as you say, a foundational piece around some of the other services and uh, the clinical services that can be provided to residents. And our, our submission to the Commonwealth was that, that these residents are you know, very elderly, have multiple clinical conditions. Uh, they're at a point in their life where they need ongoing uh, support for their healthcare. And uh, so yeah, it's important that we enhance uh, the availability of, of clinical staff with the capability to provide that support to those residents and have that available 24-7. You would agree, um, being a, a medical professional, that it's not ideal to, to have a person who is literally about to die in the hours, maybe days ahead, to be have to be transferred by an ambulance to a ward in a hospital via an emergency uh, department, uh, if, if in fact there was a, a way in which that palliation and end of life care could be done at the, at, the, at the residence. Absolutely. I mean, our whole philosophy around the palliative care services we're responsible for have that at the heart of what they do, whether that person is in their own home or is in a residential aged care facility, if, uh, if they choose to have their end of life care in the place where they live, then we should do everything we can to support that. Um, in case I've, I've missed it, I, I only sort of see that there is the, the option of sort of the provision of that care uh, in in their, their place of residence, which for many of them would be probably a preference and an ideal. That's probably a, a general sentiment that many of them would have, as opposed to being transferred to to uh, a ward in a hospital via an emergency department. Um, but uh, there is little option, though, if there is not a, 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 a registered nurse or a person with qualification to administer the the pharmaceuticals to give the pain relief or the distress relief. There's little, there's little other choice though, but to really dial triple zero and contact the ambulance, is there? As, as, a, as a general statement. As a general statement, although I know our services have done a lot uh, to, to ensure that they've got, uh, and you know, the, the COVID, uh, while it's been a challenge for us, we've certainly increased substantially the interaction between our local health services and the residential aged care facilities within the footprint of their districts. Uh, so to the point where they have a greater understanding of what's available in the residential aged care facility, that the relationships are improved, the communication channels have been enhanced, the uh, looking at solutions to problems uh, you know, is being found to ensure that uh, we can do whatever we can to support the residents to uh, be cared for in their homes and in their aged care places as long, long as they possibly can. So it has been, I think, a, a benefit of the need to, to build a stronger and closer relationship with our residential aged care colleagues. But there's no doubt the interface between aged care and health is and continues to be a challenge and one that we are strongly advocating for uh, improvements and are hopeful that the recommendations out of the Royal Commission will assist us in that regard. Uh, just returning to uh, a piece of evidence from the Minister this morning. Uh, uh, and I may have got the terminology uh, wrong, uh, so please correct me, but I thought uh, I heard the Minister uh, indicate that uh, she was uh, re-establishing um, the, the Ministerial Advisory Committee. Um, is that what the correct uh, terminology of the of the body that she's resuscitating? If I recall the evidence she gave, she said uh, she would be establishing a task force. Task force. I think she called it a task force and was talking okay. about some potential membership she was thinking of, but she hasn't yet finalised it. Okay, so um, a, a task force. Um, I just note from um, the, the document that uh, it, it's now obviously some years old, but nevertheless you know, irrelevant because it obviously uh, it was the, uh, the plan we talked about, the New South Wales Rural Health Plan towards 2021. Um, Minister Skinner talks about the establishment, and this obviously is back in 2014, um, and I'm just quoting from her the forward to the, the, the document. Uh, I, I established uh, the Ministerial Advisory Committee for Rural Health in February 2013. So that's on page one of, of, of the document. So the, the Ministerial Advisory Committee for Rural Health, which was established in February 2013, does that still does, does that body still exist? That advisory. No, it it, uh, it transitioned into what Minister Hazard established, which was a bilateral um, re rural and regional or regional health committee, which um, he was keen to ensure that we didn't just have state representatives on the committee, that we also had our Commonwealth representatives on there because it is a shared responsibility. So that bilateral group has been, uh, or had been meeting, uh, I think six monthly before, the, before COVID, and I think 
that because of the COVID uh, impact. I don't yes. think we've had a meeting in, since that time, but it was looking at uh, what we could do between the Commonwealth and the state to a start to address some of these issues uh, across those boundaries, those interfaces that are really important to address. And th that 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 body, have you got the name? Or on notice, could you take the name? I'll get you the exact That's name. That's fine. But it was the and bilateral and regional yes, health. And it's, it's still on foot and it's still yes. functioning. Yes. So with respect to what uh, Minister Saylor referred to this morning, the, the task force, the name of which is yet to be determined, I, I gather, that that, that will be uh, announced and will become something that sits separate from this body you've just referred to and will, will operate with this own remit. That's what your general understanding is? Well, I, that will be up to the minister and of ministers to, to agree on what that, that body will be established to do and how it will operate and whether or not it's in addition to or replaces what was before, but that will be an issue for the ministers to decide. Okay. Um, um, Dr. Dr. Lyons, I want to take you to um, Foster Public Hospital. In April 2021, the member from Isle Lake, Stephen Brom, had promised to deliver a public hospital for there. Uh, he claimed that it reached a milestone on April 23rd um, with an announcement of an independent consultant. I note that the government appointed a consultant last year to make recommendations for the various location options for the hospital. Have you um, now decided on a location? I'll have to take that on notice, Mr. Sigurd. I haven't got that detail. As part of that, um, how many sites were shortlisted for the new hospital? Will the community be consulted prior to the preferred site being selected? And what is the expected commencement date for construction of that hospital? And what is the expected completion date of that hospital? If Thank you could take, take all those on notice. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to turn you to um, Minister for, uh, sorry, um, Ms. Um, Smythe, there were a number of questions earlier from my colleague Rose Jackson. Um, also, there was some questions about the eight staff members in um, Women's New South Wales, and two of them, as the minister said, worked on Women's Week, which I understand is next week, March 7th to March 13th. How much of their activity of these two staff members spend on that week's activity for? Um, uh, yes. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Sukord. So that's right, there are two roles in the communications yep. team. So 25% um, of all the staff, yes. Uh, uh, well, and in addition to communications and events work, they also uh, prepare and develop um, communication campaigns, for example, in relation to consent, uh, coercive control. Uh, you would be familiar maybe with some of them, make no doubt is one of them, speak out both very successful campaigns. Uh, and they also do other activities such as promoting gender equality, uh, promoting grants programs, things like that. It's all very crucial work to the work of women in New South Wales. Okay, I'll be really quick. You can take this on notice if you wish. On the other six staff members, can you please provide on notice what they actually do there, primarily primary areas of work responsibility? Thank you. Deputy Chair Amherst. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I have some more questions for uh, Ms Smythe. Um, submissions for the newly announced um, Women's Economic Opportunities Review closed this week. Um, can you just um, let us know what the next steps will be in this process? I can answer that. I can answer that one. Okay, thanks. Uh, so this review is being led by Treasury New South Wales, by our colleagues in Treasury, but we're supporting the review. So some of the detailed steps are best um, answered by them. Um, you're right though, the submissions have closed, so they'll be analysed by our colleagues in Treasury. Uh, the panel chaired by Sam Moston is meeting regularly and um, the recommendations they make will feed into the budget process and into advice for Minister Taylor and the Treasurer. Thank you. Um, do you know what the goals of that review are in regards to what parts will fall in under Minister Taylor? There are terms of reference for that review, um, which I can provide some more information subject to Treasury colleagues. Uh, and I think we'd have to take on notice exactly what, uh, I mean, the Treasurer and Minister Taylor both lead that review to the extent that there's different parts that go to different ministers, I, I'm not sure that that's... That's right. Uh, I just mean more generally I think the recommendations go to both ministers. That's fine. I mean, if she's sort of partly involved in it, like, what, what, are, the, what are the goals that we're looking at? Are we looking at the barriers that are preventing women from entering and remaining in the workplace, or is it much broader than that? It's broader. I'll just pass to my colleague, Ms. Mike. 
Um, so the review overall is considering how to improve women's economic security through increased economic participation over the next five to ten years. So the rev uh, reviews identifying barriers to work, um, women's participation in work and proposing reform opportunities to address some of the structural and, and non-structural barriers um, for women to um, enter, re-enter and stay in the workforce. Um, and, and when is the timeline planned for that review to be finalised? Um, so it will uh, align with the budget um, timetable, so it will be 4.30 June. Um, and will a final report be produced and made public on that? Um, I'm not quite sure what will be made available, but I can talk a little bit, um, if you're interested, around some of the work that's happened um, in talking to women about that process. So mm -hmm. there's, there's quite a lot of work. Um, so as you're probably aware, there's an expert panel. Um, in addition to the expert panel, there's some work going on um, just doing some review of, of what women are talking about in social media um, around women's opportunities and, and, and the issues facing women. There's also quite significant um, focus groups um, for a whole range of different women. So there'll be um, like focusing specifically on young women, women in regional areas, Aboriginal women, women with disability, um, culturally and linguistically diverse women, older women, carers, LGBTIQ plus women. So there's a whole range of um, focus groups. Um, there's also some work that we're doing specifically with some key organisations, so it's mainly peak organisations, but there's, um, there's I think there's um, quite a number. So there's probably somewhere around 50 organisations that have been sent out some um, some specific focus questions for them to answer about what they already know um, from the cohorts that they work with every day and the information that they've gath gathered. Um, and there's also quite a bit of work about pulling together existing research that's been done over many years um, regarding these issues. Um, there's also, obviously, it's open for public submission, so anybody can make a, a submission at the moment. And then there's some really targeted consultation with um, particular groups such as regional um, women, Aboriginal women, and um, culturally and linguistically um, diverse women in, in targeted qualitative consultations. Uh, thank you. Um, is, the, is the High New South Wales gender pay gap also going to be included within that review? Yes. Thank you. Um, is there other work outside of this review that's being done in New South Wales in regards to the gender pay gap? Not that I'm aware of, not in terms of women's New South Wales work. Um, how will women's economic opportunities review tie in with the New South Wales women's strategy? Is there a way that they will sort of intersect? Yes, absolutely. So there's a current review of the women's strategy being undertaken that will be complete um, by May. Uh, and as you might know, there are three pillars in the current strategy. The first pillar of, of the strategy is about improving women's economic opportunities. Uh, so we expect that the review undertaken by Sam Mostyn's panel and reporting to the Treasurer and the Minister for Women will um, effectively be the main input to that pillar. Uh, we've also begun cons on the other two pillars, um, one which looks at women's health and the other one which looks at women's social participation. Uh, we've begun consultations with women's groups. Uh, as I said, there's a current review of the current strategy, so that will be another input. And we're developing a, a more detailed consultation plan for uh, those other two pillars, which uh, we expect the strategy as a whole will be developed by September. Great, fantastic. Um, and you said that uh, the current um, uh, strategy will complete in May. Um, will there be a strategy uh, for 2023 onwards? Is, it, is that being developed now? Yes, yeah, so I, I said that the review of the current the strategy review, will right. be completed by May, and then we expect a new strategy to be developed by the end of September. Okay, Femin. Thanks, Chair. Um, I wanted to, I think this is a question for you, Ms. Lowry. Um, I just wanted to turn to whether there the, whether the Commission um, has, is undertaking or whether you know of any research being undertaken into why the regional suicide rate is double that of Greater Sydney. Um, no, the Commission um, is not undertaking research, but I could um, refer that to the Ministry as the Ministry um, is leading the work on towards zero suicides. 
Okay, Dr. Wright, do you know of any where the work's being done on that? More in Lewis online and more in Leeds, oh, good. Let's the bring towards zero strategies. Yeah. Lewis, welcome. Hey. Hi. Hi. Excellent. In terms of suicides and, and the rates being higher, I mean, we, we are aware of the factors. Obviously, many factors impact on suicide rates, and particularly in the regional areas around when we look at things like unemployment, alcohol and drug use, domestic violence, um, low, not being geographically dislocated, etc. So naturally, straight away, there's some really high risk factors there in terms of suicide rates. Um, so uh, we are working, we have um, uh, evaluation for the Towards Zero Suicide Strategy, Taylor Fry, um, are working with us to look at what some of those factors may be in terms of um, particular issues for regional rates and what we might need to do in those areas. In terms of our Towards Zero Strategies more broadly, we do focus on our priority populations and where we know there are higher suicide rates. So all of our strategies bring into the regional areas. And in fact, in some of the regional areas, things like our safe havens, our spot teams um, in rich is, has been duplicated compared to the metro areas because we know of many of the issues. So I guess in, in short, the answer is yes, absolutely. We looking, are looking into it. We are conducting research and we will have a focus on it because we need to look at all of those areas where we have higher rates, such as regional areas and such as uh, middle-aged males. Yes, okay, so the, the, the research that you're saying is being undertaken, so is that wholly um, within department research or are you partnering with any research bodies, how is that work being done? So we're partnering, so we have a con the consultants are called Taylor Fry, the consultants that we have contracted to do the work. Uh, and on, on it, with the actual consultants, we have an expert panel who are suicide um, experts across Australia, America, um, and they are inputting into the work that, that's been done, and certainly the evidence around issues in regional areas, so yes. Okay, that's good to know. And I, t I take it, therefore, one of the issues that that is coming up is the increased kind of frequency and severity of, of natural disasters that regional people are facing. Is that is that is that being looked into as its own separate driver? In terms of it being a factor, absolutely, and yeah. um, and. Um uh, Ms. Lowry may be able to uh, answer to this bit as well because we're just looking at a refresh of the New South Wales Suicide Prevention Framework, which was 2018 to 2023, and the Commission are undertaking a refresh of that work to take into account our current strategies, current um, activities, and to make sure that things that have happened since that strategy was developed, such as the pandemic, and natural disasters, that we are um, looking into that area and developing the strategies. Ms. Lara, did you want to comment on that as well? Um, yes, so it's a refresh of the strategy. It's due to the Minister on the 30th of June. Um, we also have um, a um, expert panel and um, guiding that work, and we are doing it in conjunction with the Ministry, obviously, um, as the leadership of um, the Towards Zero Suicides. We're currently also about to um, embark upon a um, focus period of community consultation, and I think that's really important to get those voices about people who have been through those experiences. And I think um, Dr. Wright has um, mentioned earlier that, you know, there is a particular air ail to this wellbeing and, and mental health impacts. I mean, we need to be aware of that, but also to understand that general level of distress and what that um, can look like um, for future um, implications for suicide and vulnerability. Yes, um, you heard my previous question about the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's report this week, the sixth assessment report, which for the first time has a significant uh, component dealing with mental health and the research around increased frequency and severity of um, natural disasters as a result of climate change and what this means for mental health. Um, will you uh, commit to uh, at least looking at that and incorporating um, some of that research or, research or ensuring that the panel that is looking at the new framework is aware of that? Absolutely. And I think um, as one in the answer that you also given um, earlier today, that is one of the issues 
is that in our youth um, consultations, they have raised around the um, the anxiety and the concerns that they have about um, climate change and their own futures. So absolutely, that's part of our, um, our, our broad remit. And I think that is the thing to really understand with suicide prevention. It's as much about um, vulnerability to your social determinants as well as your vulnerability to distress and psychological trauma. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to turn to mental health workers in schools um, and just ask what the progress is on, I understand it was a government promise back in 2019 to place two dedicated mental health workers in every school. Where is that up to in terms of um, meeting that target? Is that you, Dr. Lyons, or...? No, so uh, we are responsible for uh, wellbeing health in-reach nurses, but to, in relation to the other components, I think that... Mental health education. workers in schools, it's not... OK. Uh, it's education, so okay. I think that would need to be directed to a Department of Education. OK, all right. I'm just OK. Because we're at 3.30 for a break, or...? Oh, okay. Um, um, Mr. Chair, may I have a question? Just on the time. Got one second. Um, <laughs> oh, well, I, I got questions. I, I know, he's got questions. Um, you so, too much. So, so, listen. I didn't stammer. <laughs> Let's just pause. We've got a, a break of 15 minutes. Stretch your legs, have a, have a drink, or whatever the case may be. Drink. And back at, uh, yeah, or just to your coffee. Uh, I got you. Uh, uh, nothing stronger. Nothing uh, strong. Back at uh, 345. 345. <laughs> <Whiskey>. Thank you. <laughs>
So on. Um, Good things. The good news is, uh, 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 from dispatches I've received, it's probably not likely we're going to go to uh, 5.15. Um, so there'll be at least another round, maybe round and a half each. We'll just see where we are. So, um, But nevertheless, uh, thanks for uh, joining us. Uh, uh, have a go, board. Um, who we'll, we'll know to have some questions um, when we get to crossbench. So we'll just go for as long as it takes, but we, we might, with a bit of luck, uh, pull up a bit earlier. So we'll commence with the Honourable Walsh Secord. Thank you, Mr Chair. And um, my colleague, the Honourable Rose Jackson, has had family commitments, so I'll be taking over a number of the questions in the area of women's New South Wales. Um, Ms Smythe, can you tell me how many groups or organisations applied for investing in women funding program between March 31st and April 30th, 2020? Um, so for investing in women 2021, there were 177 applications received. Okay, and um, how many of those were successful and approved of the 177? Um, 17, and they've just been published online oh. this morning. Ah, this morning. Oh, okay, that's why. Okay, thank you. And how was the program assessed? What was the criteria? I mean, sorry, was there a panel who made the, uh, who, who undertook the assessments? Um, yeah, I can provide some more detail because I just want to be clear on it, but um, generally there's a, a first panel that will do sort of an eligibility cross-reference just to ones yep. that actually have met the criteria, and then there'll be a second um, panel that will look at the quality and does it meet the, um, the priorities of the women's strategy, mm -hmm. and then there'll be a more senior panel that will look at those um, and then develop a short list. Thank you. Now, can I take you to the expert panel chaired by um, Chief Executive Women President Sam Mostyn? Um, uh, now, is there a, is there a budget allocation provided to this to this panel? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, that will be a matter for Treasury colleagues because they are the agency supporting the panel. Okay, so you're not supporting the panel? We're working with Treasury to support the panel, but Treasury have the Secretariat. They, they um, run the Secretariat to support the panel. Okay, would you be able to take on notice to obtain what the budget allocation, I, I think you'd be able to do that. Take what is the yes. budget allocation? Yep. And of that budget allocation, how much of it actually goes, what percentage of it in total goes to supporting and funding and paying panelists on that, on that group? So I want to get an we indication of what notice. percentage is actually going on payments to panelists. Yep. Right. Can I also take you to um, the Women's Trauma Recovery Centre project in the Illawarra? Now, I understand, um, Ms. Smythe, that you've had some correspondence about that, email communication, but I also understand that the, the funding was contingent on the completion of a business case, which I think was completed or is completed. Um, yes, so this morning um, when Minister Taylor was talking yep. about that, so it is related to domestic family sexual violence. So it was, um, when it was provided to me as Director of Women New South Wales, it was when I had responsibility for domestic family violence. Yep. Um, so yes, um, they were funded, um, provided funding to develop a business case. Um, it, it wasn't um, that funding was contingent on that being provided, so there wasn't a guarantee that once the business case was provided that, that the program would be funded. And it will be considered amongst um, a range of, of um, priorities for um, the upcoming budget regarding um, Minister Ward's portfolio. Now, what about the discussion that the funding, uh, funding will be as part of a $90 million allocation? It'll, it'll be part of that. So I think that's in relation to the National Partnership Agreement, which mm -hmm. is domestic family violence and sexual violence funding, um, a contribution of both the Commonwealth and New South Wales, and that's the funding I'm referring to where decisions will be made um, regarding how that's allocated. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, I think I'll turn back to, to health. Now, the, um, how many school-based nurses have gone into New South Wales schools? You're talking about the well, uh, the 
the, the school nurses program. Well being health enriched nurses. The school, yeah, well I know it as the school nurses program, but maybe there's an official title for yeah. it. So uh, there are, um, are 100 of those nurses that have been announced as the election commitment to be in place uh, over the next uh, few years. There is an initial tranche of 50 that were allocated uh, for uh, recruitment, and of those, my understanding is 43 are in post. In place, okay. Uh, uh, and then there's been an initial, tr uh, a further tranche of 50 additional positions that have been announced in December out to the districts. And they're in the process of being recruited to at the moment. Well, you could, uh, if you could take that on notice, the 43 that are in place and the allocation of the 50 that are... I can, uh, where they've been allocated to? Yes, certainly yeah. happy to take that on that. Um, Mr Chair. Thank you. Um, so just continuing on. Um, and just returning to this issue once again about the new restructure. Um, Presently, uh, in the current circumstances, uh, so before the announcement, so going back to, I should say, before early December last year, um, with respect to a CEO of a local health district, um, <coughs> who did she or he report to as their first report, their, their report up the line? Uh, they report to the secretary, Chair. Uh, that they report to the secretary directly. And, and also to their board chair. Uh, indeed, indeed, to their, their board chair. Now, uh, uh, that was relatively straightforward um, uh, in, in the situation where there was a, a single minister. Looking ahead, or looking now and ahead, with, with now uh, two, two ministers, um, are you able to confirm that as part of the discussions that are going on about the new structure, uh, that uh, one of the considerations is going to be that the, uh, the CEOs of the hospitals that fall within the nine uh, mentioned by the Minister this morning, two of which are these hybrid type one LHDs, I'll use the word hybrid in my words, that they'll be uh, uh, still reporting uh, to um, the Secretary um, uh, and not via the Minister, as would be the case without there being a new Minister? In other words, in regards to that matter of direct report, it will still be with the minister, irrespective of, of where the hospital is around the state. Um, Chair, I don't think that the things that are being contemplated um, play into that space at all. Uh, so chief execs report to the board, um, the, the chair um, and the secretary are the two people who are critical in the frame for chief executives. Yeah. And I don't see that changing under any and, arrangement. And, the, and with respect to the, the, the matter of, because I use the phrase, direct involvement with respect to the, the board, my, my, my phrase, um, obviously we had evidence from the Minister today that with respect to those uh, hospitals, um, uh, oh, sorry, th those LHDs that she has responsibility for, that there is now, as she explained to me, as I understand, a, a, a dual remit over the signing off of appointees to the board. That's, that's your understanding as we proceed forward? Um, if that's what the minister's advised, then that's, that would be my understanding. Uh, that's, uh, that's OK. Um, uh, Dr Wright, um, uh, on the matter of suicide, uh, the tragedy, the utter tragedy of suicide, um, and we, we've, we've covered that in questions earlier today, and you've been very helpful with, um, with information in that regard. Uh, are you able to explain to us that, with respect to suicide, uh, and this is a technical question, I suppose, that there are different types of suicide or categories of suicide that we recognise um, fr from, a, from a, an official medical point of view, or is, is suicide effectively recorded as a as a single matter. Um. Mr Chair, you're, you're right in that um, it's quite uh, misleading to generalise about um, what suicide constitutes. This is obviously a really sensitive issue for us to traverse, um, but in um, in the, in the mental health area, we would, we would consider that every single instance of the tragedy of suicide has its own complex and unique 
story. Um, and in many, many instances, um, there are significant but diverse mental health issues, um, but there are a number of other factors that come into play. Um, and this is why you know, I think that in New South Wales over the last um, 15 years, I think there's been a very, there's been a clear appreciation of the fact that it's not simply a matter for mental health services and not, not simply a matter for health services. Certainly we have um, to shoulder a very significant burden in trying to, um, um, in trying to manage and address the health and, and mental health issues, um, but there are a number of social issues which also contribute um, and so, for instance, um, um, issues around um, housing instability, around poverty, around um, addiction, um, around um, violence in the community and in the home, these are all factors um, that, that contribute. It was one of the reasons that there was considerable concern at the start of the pandemic about how it would impact on mental health, and I think that the financial supports that were put in place during the, during the course of the pandemic, I think, were a very, very significant um, contributor to the, the fact that, there, that we didn't see a, um, a large increase in, um, in, in suicides during that time. So, um, so, so I think that it's, um, and there's such a thing as a psychological post-mortem, and, 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 and I think that the, that's actually what happens when in, during a coronial inquest following a, um, a suicide, is that they try to understand what are the various different factors which have contributed, not just for that particular individual and their family, um, and but, but also so that we can learn as a system as and and, and as whole of community um, how we can uh, prevent such things happening again. But I say that, and forgive me for not knowing this, I probably should. That with respect to all suicides, using the phrase or the word suicide, are they all all suicides subject to a coronial inquest? Um, all suicides, I believe, are reported to the coroner. Re reported to the coroner, yes. So, um, with respect to, and this is obviously for the purposes of the collection of the data and the interrogation of that data to see how trends are, are moving or not, as the case may be, what is the definition that's actually, you may ask, what's the, and if you don't know, we take a notice, the actual definition of what suicide is? Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not being clever about that. I mean, there's a dictionary definition, but for the purposes of data collection, is there a particular definition that's used for the purposes of... Because obviously there's a, an official record kept uh, by the state, the Office of Birth, Deaths and, and Marriages, so there's a, a death record. Uh, is that informed, that death record informed by a definition that comes from somewhere? I may throw to uh, Maureen Lewis as the, but, but, but um, it, it is an important point. We would identify someone as a suspected suicide, and it's a matter for the coroner mm -hmm. to, de to determine um, what the cause of death is in those instances. But I, I might um, ask whether um, Ms. Lewis can add. Thank you, Ms. Lewis, if that. you can assist. Thank, thank you. Yeah. So, in terms of um, uh, the first point uh, when a, a suicide has been classified as a suicide, that's done by uh, New South Wales Police. Uh, and there's a form called a P7098 form, uh, which police would have in, in their possession in terms of attending a suicide. Um, and that is then reported through to uh, the coroner's court, who, uh, and that's a, about a suspected suicide. Uh, and I guess when it gets to the coroner court, as uh, Dr Wright said, that's when it's confirmed over a period of time whether or not it was a suicide or not. And, and the suspected suicides, the data that we have to date shows us that approximately 95% of those six suspected suicides are actually correct and that they are suicides. And then later on, some data, the reason the numbers change slightly is once the coronial process happens, um, what can happen is that it's came to the coroner's, uh, uh, I guess, attention or the coronial court process that during the course of someone's death that they found uh, additional information to uh, be able to then classify the death as a suicide. So further to that, I'm just conscious my time's about to expire, that if an attending police officer attends uh, a, an incident um, and has doubt about whether or not what's being observed and looked at is a suicide or, or not, the, the, there would not be a default position of assuming it's a suicide. I presume that if there's doubt, 
uh, it would need to be recorded on another form. Would that uh, be the case? It's the same form. So that, I mean, I'm obviously talking on behalf of the police, but we've had a lot to do with it when we developed the suicide monitoring system. Mm. Um, so on the form, there are a number of um, entry points for data or uh, anecdotal notes. Um, so that, that's the case. If it's suspected and, and there is doubt, then we'll put that on the actual form and the okay. information that goes to the coroner. And that's when further investigation will happen at the coroner's court. Thank you very much. I've only got 11 seconds, so swing to Debbie Chair. Thank you. What's that? Look in the game orders, but that was a while back. Um, I've just got one more question uh, uh, for Ms Smythe or um, Ms Zant. Um, one of the targets of the Women's Strategy Three-Year Action Plan was to undertake an analysis of the impacts of miscarriage and IVF on women's workforce participation um, by December 2020. Um, can you give us an update on this analysis and, and, and maybe a bit of understanding of the results if, if it's gone that far? Um, it, it, the analysis wasn't undertaken by Women New South Wales. It was an, an agency contributing. So um, we will take that on notice. Um, but there obviously were um, some outcomes from that in terms of um, the leave that's available um, to New South Wales public servants following a miscarriage. So that's five days of paid special leave. Um, and then, and the same for preterm birth. There's leave available for a preterm birth, um, so paid special leave um, prior to 37 weeks, and then from 37 weeks, um, paid parental leave will kick in. Thank you. You have something to add? Yep. I just want to go back to um, uh, uh, the couple of questions you asked in relation to the Women's Economic Opportunity Review, mm -hmm. just to confirm that the terms of reference are online. I think I said I'd provide them on notice. Um, oh, okay, that's fine. They're yep. online. And also just to confirm that the findings will be made public. Great. Um, you also asked a question earlier, Ms Hurst, about um, the gender pay gap and whether there was other work going on in New South Wales outside of the Women's Economic Opportunity Review. Mm -hmm. So certainly um, staff at Women New South Wales are working closely with Treasury and the Public Service Commissioner in order to develop policy proposals on the gender pay gap for that review and for the panel's consideration. In addition to that, um, I was just reminded in the break that we have done some considerable work with the Commonwealth Women's Gender Equality Agency, who obviously monitor the pay gap. Uh, they've just done a review which was completed at the end of last year that's still with the Commonwealth, but we had significant policy input into that process as well. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, I've got some further questions. Um, uh, Dr Lyons might be the, the best person to answer them, but um, I'm happy for anyone to answer them if, um, if you're not the... if, if somebody else has um, extra information. Um, at the last budget estimates hearing, um, it was announced that the government was currently recruiting for the 25 child and adolescent mental health response teams, um, also known as safeguards. Um, how many of these teams are now fully operational? I might see if uh, Ms Lewis can give us an update on that. All right. Yeah, thank you. So there are two teams who are operational now out of the first um, tranche of 11, and that's Central Coast and um, South Eastern Sydney. Sorry, South Western Sydney, my apologies. South Western Sydney. Um, and is there going to be... Um, or do we know when the others will be operational? Uh, you said, I think, two of the 11. Is there a timeline to get the rest of those up and running? Yes, all, all the teams um, will be operational on the information we have to hand by uh, May or June of this year. Great. That's in terms of the, trial, the first tranche of the 11, yes. Thank you. Um, and the full 25? The full 25, it's over at... Uh, a four-year period, so it's over a full estimate. In the first two years, we have um, 10 or 11, because we've actually put an additional team on. Uh, and then following that, there's incremental, uh, I guess, incremental increases in those team numbers, depending on the data, the information we have to hand about where the services are needed and how we can roll them out more quickly. Thank you. Um, and is there a planned evaluation for the program um, at any stage? Absolutely so. Um, we're, we're currently working with one of the universities on setting, um, I guess, the time for the evaluation. We also have an evaluation working group as part of the safeguards 
uh, implementation steering groups who are working on evaluation also. And clearly, you know, we'll, we'll need to prove, obviously, in terms of the evaluation that these teams are working and also what we may need to do to refine the models as we progress with all the other teams. Thank you. Um, this morning, the minister said um, that the the status of the mother and baby mental health units planned at Westmead and RPA um, that, that they'll be open very very soon. Um, I just wanted to clarify if we know the timeline um, of the opening of those units. Sure. So for the RPA unit, we're expecting an opening um, in May this year, and for the the unit at Westmead, we're expecting it to be opened in November of this year. Thank you. Um, and are there plans to open uh, mother and baby mental health units in other regional um, LHDs, um, as far as you're aware? Um, I'm not aware of any plans at the moment, but like in everything else we do, you know, we evaluate constantly in terms of uh, where our services are needed more broadly, and people from regional areas can access those two mother and baby units. Um, but absolutely, you know, we constantly look at where our services should be delivered, and for those areas where we can't deliver services, then there are models to either enrich, provide um, services in community settings, or uh, when there is a need to actually look at should we be building one in some of the regional areas. Thank you. Um, last October, it was announced that the government would train uh, 275,000 people in rural areas in mental health, first aid and suicide prevention. Um, can we get an update um, on this project and how many people have been trained so far? Sure. So I think we're talking about the, um, the 270,000 people in the initiative, that's $14 million over two years um, under the recovery package for Living Works. Um, so to date, 76 people have been trained. The, pro the program is just starting uh, to kind of ramp up. There's been multiple meetings with all the care agencies across independent schools, Catholic schools, also looking um, at psychologists, police, public schools, um, Aboriginal leaders, police, our wind nurses. So at the moment, it's been early stages in terms of looking at the types of agencies that we need to train up, uh, and also looking at how we will stage that in terms of priorities. But the training has begun. Did you say, sorry, just to clarify, did you say 76 people? Yes, 76 has just commenced the actual training because there's been a lot of preparatory work in terms of prioritising who we need to train first. That's right, thank you. Um, and at the last budget estimates, um, the Safe Havens program to reduce suicide rate rates, um, which was a pilot in pilot phase um, in 20 towns across regional New South Wales was, was discussed. Um, can I ask where this program's at um, and when it's expected to exit that pilot phase? Sure, so we have, there are 15 safe havens that are opened across 12 LHDs and one specialty health network, so 15 out of the 20. Um, in terms of the pilot phase, so towards zero, as you may be aware, was a three-year funding package that in um, June this year, that, that funding, uh, I guess, ceases to happen. And I think the minister made mention this morning, we are aware of that funding, uh, I guess, expiring during that time uh, and we're working on through normal budget process what we will take forward into the future so sorry just what i've only got one last sure. question um so will do you, so at the moment that program won't be continued uh, uh, no i'm not saying that i'm just saying the funding for the current program finishes in june uh, we have undergone rigorous evaluation of the program it's showing very positive outcomes as the minister talked about this morning so Clearly, from our perspective, it, uh, you know, it's something that we would like to continue into the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, wait. Oh. Thank you very much, um, and hello again. Um, if I could just pick up again on those, um, the discussion on the Illawarra um, uh, Women's Health Centre and the Trauma Centre proposal. Um, Ms. Smythe, it is Smythe, isn't it? Yes, good. Um, I understood from the Minister's uh, response this morning, um, she referred to it being part of consideration for the budget budget process for 2022 to 23. But my understanding is that the response to that business case was supposed to happen by the end of 2021. Is that correct? 
Um, I, I don't recollect that we committed, that anybody committed to a date for a response. So there was a date where the, the um, business case was, was due. So, so when the funding was provided, um, there was a, a time span for them to provide that business case. So they provided the business case on the 7th of July, 2021. Um, my understanding is that seven and a half months after that submission, they've received no feedback whatsoever. Is that correct? Um, we, we have done an analysis of that, but no, we haven't um, responded in terms of sharing um, thoughts about whether that proposal is something that will be considered um, and because it is part of that budget process and all of the um, broader priorities for domestic, sexual and um, family violence. Under the receipt, um, sorry, under the arrangements where the business case was funded um, from the Ministry of Health, um, that arrangement obliged um, a coordination of, you know, basically New South Wales government was supposed to co coordinate cross-agency input on the proposal for consideration by the Domestic and Family Violence Reforms Delivery Board. Has that bit happened? So again, it will go with a range of um, of proposals and and, and project um, submissions um, to the board um, for consideration um, for for future funding. Is it normal to not respond to someone who's put in to an, an organisation that's put in a business case to just? Uh, I mean, be silent. We, we, we've responded in terms of it's been received, but we haven't responded in terms of providing any advice about whether it, w it will be funded. No, but you also haven't responded to say it is still being decided upon or there's been no response at all. Well, we have communicated, but we haven't given anything definitive about the next steps, no. Um, in... <sighs> In relation to, I think you said before that your your role um, uh, is now Director of Women in New South Wales. Um, previously, you were working under Domestic and Family Violence Minister, is that correct? So, um, I am responsible for sexual violence, um, women, seniors and carers. Mm -hmm. Previously, I was also responsible for domestic family violence. Got it. That's very useful. So in, I guess, two questions. The first one is, is any of this delay a cause of change in roles or a change in, you know, having a new minister? Did that disrupt the processing of this business case? I, I think it remains that, that it, it, the funding that it, if it is funded, it, the funding that will be part of the National Partnership Agreement mm -hmm. and the decisions made on the allocation of that haven't occurred okay. um, for, for that tranche. Um, in relation to that National Partnership Agreement money, I understand that the $20 million that was announced last is it October or November, um, the entire amount went to um, domestic and family violence, frontline services, um, but as you know, the partnership agreement does cover sexual violence services as well. Um, are you able to shed light on why none of that went to the sexual violence frontline responders? <laughs> Uh, so they were the decisions made last year in relation to payment one of the National Partnership Agreement. There's three further payments that um, will come from the Commonwealth. We're currently considering payment two and um, we expect to fund some sexual violence related initiatives in that payment. In the second round. Okay, that's very useful. So it was not a deliberate um, exclusion. It was just the first lot was going there. Okay. They were just the priorities that were agreed on at the time. That's very, very helpful to understand. Thank you. I also have a couple of uh, relatively minor final questions. Um, I understand that Women New South Wales is moving or has moved from the Stronger Communities Cluster to the Premier and Cabinet Cluster. Um, what does that mean in a practical sense? Has it already happened? So that move will take place from 1 April and Women New South Wales will be moving into the economics branch of DPC. Yeah, okay. So very encouraging, making it very clear that the priority for Women New South Wales is to focus on women's economic opportunities and empowerment of women. Okay, that's interesting. Um, 
but it will make no sort of other so that's great in terms of the I guess the focus side of things but what does it mean in terms of reporting responsibilities will that just still stay with the way it is now yes right okay um, and how many full-time staff are working at Women New South Wales so there are eight full-time equivalent eight. staff Yep, I, I thought I heard you say that earlier. I just wanted to check. Yep. Okay, so eight of them. Um, that's all the questions I have. Thank you very much. Thank Chair. you. Um, I've just got a few questions. Um, not too many. Um, there's a report. Um, I just want to cite here. It's New South Wales Health Agency for Clinical Innovation uh, Fact of Death Report. Uh, this is citing a, 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 a 2013, um, uh, uh, the 2013 report. Is that is that an annual report or biannual or that, that, this is the actual name of it? It's the New South Wales Health Agency for Clinical Innovation Fact of Death Report. Is that a, a report that's still produced? Um, or if you chair, could... chair, is there any other context on that report that you have other than just fact of death in the title? No, that's all I've got in this. Um, yeah. I haven't done a Google search. I didn't have the chance yeah. before yeah. coming today. But it's not an annual report. I think it was done as a one-off and was related to, I think, uh, some analysis around uh, uh, what was occurring in relation to uh, end of life and, and deaths and decisions around uh, what was happening in relation to, to deaths. Yes. So it was a, it was a one-off, uh, if I can recall. But I'm, I'm dredging yeah, the past. I, no, no, as it I, goes I, back. I think your memory is, yeah. is, 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 I'm sure, very good on this because. Um, uh, I think it does uh, pick up some discussion around the matter of, of palliative care, mm, mm. which is something we've discussed uh, discussed mm. earlier today. Um, I mean, post post this then, post 2013, and this particular report, would you be aware of, and if not, take on notice, that uh, any report uh, may have been undertaken and prepared and, and, and been uh, published uh, dealing with the availability of palliative care in New South Wales? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that on notice. Uh, I'm not aware of anything further, but I know that no. uh, that, that report was used to develop uh, some strategies that the palliative care network were working on uh, mm. ar around uh, the sorts of models of care that should be provided to make sure we're providing optimal uh, yes. care for people at the uh, at the end of life. Yeah, uh, I have to say the, the report then um, said, or, or, or within the report itself, said um, that only 50% of people who are living in New South Wales with a life-limiting diagnosis are able to access palliative care support that they need, and then goes on to say uh, that with respect to those living uh, in regional, rural and remote New South Wales, that the number is significantly less. Than I think, uh, Chair, since that report, which is 2013, uh, pleasingly there have been significant investments by this government into enhancing palliative care services, and I think there's been about three tranches. Oh, ab absolutely. Uh, yeah. uh, Happy to acknowledge that. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Minister Skinner uh, initiated it, and that's been followed by Minister Hazard. But um, n nevertheless, I I'm looking to see how one can make some assessment, if one can, about where we are in terms of the progress of the, the making of the uh, and the provision of the availability of palliative care uh, for end of life care. Um, uh, can I just quickly return to that third review document that's uh, currently being mm. proofed and checked mm. uh, and no doubt will be released. Um, is there any approximate time for, for its release? Um, I would expect, uh, Chair, it's, being, uh, it's been signed off by the Ministry and it's just working through uh, consultation with both ministers' offices final uh, to get going onto the website, so I don't think it'll be far off. OK, thank you for that. Um, uh, just returning to the, uh, the matter of mental health again, if I could just uh, uh, briefly. Um, the Productivity Commission uh, released a report in a mental health approximately 12 months ago um, and uh, inter alia uh, looked at the matter of the uh, need to expand the provision of psychosocial uh, support um, to uh, people um, who, who may be currently, uh, presently, uh, not able to access uh, uh, mental uh, health support in, in the traditional sense that we understand it. So this is a discussion around the psychosocial support, which, uh, which is, um, sort of putting it in general terms, non-therapeutic non um, intervention per se. 
I'm just wondering, Dr. Wright, on this issue of, of non-therapeutic intervention, uh, are you able to avail us with some insights about um, uh, what's happening with respect to, to that here in New South Wales and any developments that either have happened or perhaps are, are in the pipeline? I, I might make some um, introductory comments and once again um, then call on um, Ms Lewis because Thank there, you. There's, some, there's some very specific initiatives around the, um, the, the suicide reduction strategies. Thank look, you. Look, I think... Um, Rather than the word non-therapeutic, I would use the word non-clinical because oh. because I think um, it's very therapeutic. Um, if yes, to, to provide yeah. supports yeah. other than clinical supports is absolutely essential. Um, and in fact, what has happened up until relatively recently is that our highly trained specialist clinical staff have been drawn into providing some of that non-clinical support to the detriment of their ability to deliver clinical support. So we're delighted with the um, what seems like a fairly um, logical observation that um, picking up on the earlier conversation about some of the factors which might contribute to deteriorations in health and increased risk of suicide, they're often very, very practical matters. Helping someone navigate um, you know, um, requirements for housing, education issues, um, disability allowances, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and these are things which are sometimes difficult at the best of times, but if you're struggling with a mental health problem, they can become impossible. Um, and so the, and when someone is in a crisis, um, their ability to, to navigate things that we, the rest of us might find troublesome but doable um, becomes much more difficult. So that non-clinical support um, is really important. Um, and it's important in all sorts of different mental health conditions. It's particularly important to people who present in crisis. And Thank I think you, that it's been helpful. picked up um, specifically around the suicide reduction. And I, and I may ask um, Ms Lewis to elaborate on that. Thanks, Ms Lewis. Um, so just more broadly in terms of what New South Wales are doing in this space, um, in mid-2020, um, we've spent over $3.3 million in projects that have been funded to help people with psychosocial disability across New South Wales to help connect with the supports they need. And, and that's on top of what's going on from the Commonwealth level with the NDIS. Uh, as of 30th of September in 2021, there are 149,702 active NDIS participants in New South Wales, and 10% of them, which is approximately um, 15,000, uh, have a psychosocial disability. As Dr. Wright uh, you know, mentioned, it's so important to people's mental health in terms of getting those psychosocial supports. Um, just things like having company, not being isolated, um, enjoying normal activities that other people get to enjoy. Um, and, you know, all of those things are, are, you know, really important to people's mental health. Um, so there, there are a number of things New South Wales is doing in this, uh, in this space um, across, across both metro and regional areas. Thank you. So, Dr Wright, am I to take that... Um, that not, not specifically looking at New South Wales here, but as a, as a statement that there is uh, an enhanced and growing recognition of the importance of the state um, providing some focus on this non-clinical support as a way of, of mitigating and pushing back against, you know, the, the mental health, I use the word plague, I suppose, advisory, but the, the mental health problems that are experienced by, by many, many people within this state or any state. I think that what it represents is a more sophisticated understanding of the, the fact that um, that good care constitutes things other than just um, clinical treatment. Yes. Um, yeah. And and that um, um, care based on a collaboration between clinicians, between carers, between the broader community, and in in the instances such as outlined by Ms. Lewis, um, professional um, psychosocial support to help. Um, I, I guess to provide that more comprehensive care for the, for the most vulnerable people in the community. And my last question um, to you, Dr Lyons, um, telehealth, and um, this is not meant to be a statement, but um, it might end up being a bit of a statement, but I welcome any thoughts about it, that as we travel the, the state uh, with our inquiry and, and, and talking to um, uh, uh, some nurses, um, 
uh, as I did uh, on the matter of, of telehealth. Uh, uh, there was an expression of concern by, by some, I don't sort of overstate, understate, making this as an observation, that there were circumstances where they were placed in with respect to the telehealth uh, that was being uh, delivered to the patient uh, before them, that the, the nature of the uh, assessment that was being done was such that um, they felt anyway that there was additional onus on them to be in effect, to use the phrase, to, to make the call or, or make an assessment uh, and communicate that back to the, the clinician, whoever that might be, whoever that person may be, in terms of dealing with the matter before them. In other words, to, to, to sort of use this base example, which I have to say was used on more than one occasion, matters to do with feeling the, the person's skin and just the complexion and those sorts of things. I mean, I'm not a doctor myself, but the, the things that one would do if one was there as, as automatic, uh, which is no doubt just intuitive for a, for a medical practitioner, that they felt that they were, in a sense, being placed in having to make a bit of a call on some of these issues. And, and to take it a step further, some of them said that what they had the most difficulty with was to then be signing off on um, a, a, a report uh, or, a, or, or a, a status on what the person's condition was and felt that at the end of the day, they aren't doctors. The doctor is delivering the, obviously the telehealth, but, but they felt that there was perhaps a, a difficulty for them in being placed in a position of, of perhaps making some assessment or, or making some judgment that, quite frankly, they said they weren't qualified to do so. So I'm just wondering, how, the, the tension obviously of telehealth is that no one disputes its efficacy and value with respect to, to delivering and, and assisting in the provision of health services um, in, in some respects and perhaps in a number of respects. But uh, obviously there is a, a cost imperative which makes that very attractive a, as a delivery of a service. How does how how does one push back against that strong imperative, which is a, a, a cost benefit imperative, um, and not find situations whereby you've got people like nurses or others, not not, not qualified doctors or clinicians, there on the spot making judgments and decisions over the person's circumstance? So, so thanks uh, for the question, Chair. Uh, first comment I'd make is that we've always said that we do not see telehealth or virtual care as being a substitute for face-to-face -face yep. care. So wherever possible, we will do everything we can to have clinicians on the ground delivering that care face-to-face. -face. Um, in the circumstances where that's not possible, the purpose of the telehealth and the virtual care is actually to provide the support to the clinicians who are on the ground. <coughs> So, so if you take that case that you've talked about where people have felt they've been asked to do things that they didn't feel comfortable with, imagine their circumstance if there wasn't somebody on the virtual care who was actually able to provide them guidance, advice, support and assistance about what to do with the patient that they're, they're confronted with. The purpose is actually to provide that support to the staff who are there and provide that expert advice about what actions they can take, what they can do, but nobody should be asked to do things beyond their capability. So the the purpose we, we need to have, and we do this already, we invest very much in giving our nurses in emergency departments in rural environments advanced skills. Uh, they've got an uh, opportunity to do further training. In fact, I don't think most of them uh, are able to be appointed into clinical roles and EDs without doing what's called FLEC training, which is first line emergency care. Uh, and they are given additional skills and capability to be able to deal with the things that they'll be confronted with in those roles. But if there's more that we need to do to give the staff the support to make sure that they are feeling comfortable with what they're doing in those contexts. Recognising, again, as I said, our, f our first and foremost is to get f our people on the ground and, and it not being a substitute. This is about providing support, backup advice and ensuring people have got access to, to people who can give them guidance about what they might do in those circumstances. Well, I understand that. I do understand the augmentation. And it's, and it's not driven by cost. I think that's the other thing. I, I think we need to make it very clear that telehealth is not being introduced to, to cost to cost cut to sub make savings it's being done to provide access to advice support guidance and clinical specialty advice that would not otherwise be available in those contexts using technology I, I appreciate that statement in principle um, uh, I don't necessarily agree with it totally but I understand the point you're making but with respect to the augmentation argument I do understand what you've just said uh, doctor but uh, uh, 
from what follows from what you said is this, is it that the case that if, if a nurse finds uh, himself or herself in circumstances where they believe they're being made, to, uh, or be, sorry, rather withdraw that, that they're being asked to make some judgment or some call on a matter uh, because they're essentially there with the patient and the clinician is remotely providing the service in. It's really up for them to make that, that call that they, in fact, are not able to in fact, deliver on that request, that, that call that's being made of them. Absolutely. As, as it is in any team situation mm, sure. where somebody feels that somebody's asking them to do yeah. something which is beyond their experience, their capability or their competence. Yeah, so it's, yeah. so we, wouldn't want, we wouldn't expect anything different in that situation. No, that, that's clarified that. No, thank you. So, Chair, well, I've got the... Can I just clarify Please, a couple of uh, questions we took okay. on notice? We can close them off, hopefully, because we've got some further advice. So the thank issue you. around the paramedic providing maternity care at Goulburn, yes. it never happened, according to the Chief executive, it was being discussed that a staff member who had dual qualifications as a nurse and a paramedic might go on the roster to support nursing care at a time when we had a lot of staff furloughed with COVID, but it never actually occurred. So it would not have been in their capacity as a paramedic, it would have been the fact that they were a registered nurse, that they would have been thought about to fill a shift at Goulburn, but it didn't actually happen because it wasn't required. So just to clarify that point and make sure we put that to rest. Um, in relation to the tragic death of uh, the young woman at Tumut, yep. there were yep. nine recommendations from the coronial inquest. The advice from the chief executive is all of those recommendations have been implemented and furthermore the family of, uh, of the young woman are comfortable that, that they believe those recommendations have been in implemented to their satisfaction and they're also being implemented across all of the district hospitals down in Murrumbidgee. And the final one was the question around the Bilateral Regional Health Forum. It was called the Bilateral Regional Health Forum. That was co-chaired by uh, Minister Hazard and the Federal, the Commonwealth Minister for Regional Health. Okay. Uh, and that uh, was the meeting that was being uh, undertaken in, replace, in replacement of the Ministerial Advisory Council. Thank you very much. So uh, I thought we'd do... Uh, no, no, absolutely. Out. This, this, is, um, well, we had this is the time to do it. It uh, makes a lot of sense to do so. So uh, I'm not sure if the... Uh, uh, yes, please. Sorry, Mr. Sorry. Uh, Maureen Lewis, sorry, Please. can I just also make a, a point of clarification on the question I was asked around the 275,000 train package on suicide prevention. What I, what I forgot to say was that it's phase two of our um, suicide prevention training. We've already across New South Wales trained 5,930 people in suicide prevention uh, training skills. Uh, and this particular phase is more about having that focus on our education um, setting and in our community settings. And, um, and it's kind of like a targeted approach in those spaces because we know of the, the number of issues we've had in that area in terms of suicide. Um, and, and also we are expecting the numbers uh, to rise expediently over the next few months because once the training can train multiple numbers of people at the same time. So I just wanted to make that point of clarification. I'm grateful for that. Thank you very much. That'll be on the record, so thank you very much. Uh, do the government members have any questions that they would like to round out uh, today's oh, proceedings? Well, we're quite happy. Thank you. Honourable gentlemen, so uh, thank fine. you for um, you all being here today. So on that note, can I, uh, on behalf of the committee, thank you all very much for uh, doing the hard yards across the whole course <laughs> of the day. It's been a long day. Thank you. I know we've, we've put up a bit short, but I don't think there's too many complaints about that. It's been a, a full day and a productive day, and uh, there will be questions on notice that have been taken, uh, or have been, and uh, the committee secretariat. So once again, thank you all very much for coming. Uh, and thank uh, New South Wales Health for the, the great work they've done looking after us through COVID and now dealing with, uh, uh, obviously, the immediacy of the issue of the, the, uh, the great emergency we have around uh, rain and water and related matters. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.